call the chamber. Wonderful. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today is uh, our council public hearing and Mayor so he will be joining soon. He has asked me to start the meeting uh, at the moment and then he'll join at the appropriate time. Uh, I'll start with the land acknowledgements. And so at this time, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. So I'm going to start with a roll call. And uh, this will be my good test again. So let's do a, a fun test and see if I can do everyone in order here, starting with Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. You're off to a good start. <laughs> yeah, one for one. Uh, I would be next, but I'm here. Uh, Councillor Principe. Hello. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Hi there. Hi there. And now Councillor Paquette, if I am correct. Good afternoon. A oh, wonderful greeting. Thank you. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, as mentioned, Mayor Sohi will join us uh, in a bit. Uh, next would be Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. And now it's Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Hello. <laughs> okay, I'm going to fall apart soon enough here. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Hey. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Rice, I believe, is next. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Easy Councilor... Chamber. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. I think we did it. I think we got everyone. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much, everyone. We'll next uh, have a motion to adopt the agenda and go to Councillor Hamilton for that. I'll move uh, that we adopt the uh, July 5th City Council Public Hearing Meeting Agenda with the following changes. The addition of 3.23 bylaw 20218 to close a portion of 184th Street, uh, Southwest Keswick, and the replacement report attachments on 3.1 bylaw 20133 uh, to close a portion of 184th Street, Southwest Keswick. Um, the Urban Planning and Economy Report, Attachments 1, 2, and 3. And item 3.4, Bylaw 20131, to amend the Windermere Area Structure Plan, Attachment 2. Second. second. Oh. Thank you. I think I heard Councillor Paquette first for the second. Uh, so unless there's any questions, I don't believe so. I will call the votes. Please, votes. I'm a yes, Councillor Salvador. I'm a yes as well, Jans. I'm yes. I am also a yes, Madam Clerk. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that is carried. Uh, next up, protocol items. I don't think there were any. So that leads us to the explanation of the public hearing process. So instead of trying to do that by memory, I will just read out the actual sheet because that's probably a far smarter idea. So for the public hearing process, the clerk will call out the bylaws to be dealt with. I will call out the names of the people registered to speak to each bylaw. Next, council members will select the bylaws that they wish to discuss and vote on any bylaws that have not been selected for discussion. Council will then with each of the bylaws that were selected for discussion and debate. Well, then the council will then deal with each of the bylaws that were selected for discussion and debate. For each item, administration will first provide an overview of the bylaw. Members of the public who have registered to speak will then be invited to make their presentations. Those in favor will speak first in panels, followed by those opposed in panels. Each person will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk will run the official timer in council chamber. The timer lights on the podiums will be green for the first four minutes, turn yellow when there is one minute remaining, and flash red when the five minutes are up. 
And if you are participating virtually, you may wish to use a timer of your own. And, and just to be very clear, we're pretty firm on that time, five minutes. So we won't be rude, but we are going to hold you to those five minutes. Uh, so make sure you're timing yourself for keeping an eye on those lights um, so we can get through everyone who is registered. When everyone in your panel has had a chance to present, members of council may ask questions of you or the other panel members. For this reason, you may wish to remain in the meeting until all questions have been asked of your panel. After comments from the public, council may ask questions of city administration. After all questions of administration have concluded, I will ask if they if council I will ask council if they wish to ask any further questions of those who presented in response to new information that may have arisen during the public hearing. Thereafter, council may close the public hearing and debate the bylaw. If you are participating virtually, please remember to mute your microphone when you are not speaking. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, please reach out to the office of the city clerk using the contact information provided in your confirmation of registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. Uh, if you are there in person, the clerk will guide you to your seat when it's your turn to speak. And as Edmonton transitions from provincial mask mandates and city temporary mask bylaw, we ask visitors to council chambers to be kind and respectful to each other. You can wear a mask to protect yourself and those around you, and please respect people's personal decisions around wearing masks. In the event of an emergency, please follow the clerk's directions to evacuate. City staff will direct you to your muster point. And so now I think we'll start, Madam Clerk, uh, can you please call the bylaws? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Items 3.1 and 3.23 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.1, bylaw 20133 to close a portion of 184 Street Southwest, Keswick? And item 3.23, bylaw 201, sorry, 20218 to close a portion of 184 Street Southwest, Keswick? Yes, I have uh, Dustin Kliss, uh, who's registered remotely, and, and are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dustin, I just want to confirm, are you to make a presentation or to answer questions only? Uh, just a speaking point and to answer questions only. So you do have a presentation to do? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, great. I just wanted to confirm we, the other three speakers to answer questions only. So I'll go to uh, Elise Shillington. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Chris Nicholas. Good afternoon, Mr. Knack. Good afternoon. And Joe, Joe Marchese. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And you're all remote and you're all for questions only. Excellent. Uh, next item. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.2, bylaw 20165, to close a portion of Meridian Street Northwest, north of 34 Avenue Northwest, Maple? Thank you. Yes, I have uh, again Elise Shillington to answer questions only. Ooh. Just confirm yes, I'm here. still here. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, and then John Chan to answer questions only. Yep, I'm here. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the next item. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.3, bylaw 20017, to close portions of 30 Avenue Southwest, east of Plum Link Southwest, the Orchards at Ellerslie? Uh, yes, I have, again, uh, Elise Shillington uh, to answer questions only. She's still here. You don't even have to unmute. I trust it. Uh, and uh, I think Peter Sukalis is in person now. Is that correct? I can't see you this time, so I'm just going to try. I see a few nodding heads from my colleagues, so I'm assuming you're there. And Peter, uh, you'll have to remind, like, I mean, you've been coming for nine years, and I cannot remember if we pronounce your name right any of the times. So when you come up, if you if anyone asks questions, we'll have to clarify. But I thought it's Sukalis, but I've heard it a million different ways. And in opposition, I have uh, Raul Sharma, who is remote, I believe. Raul, are you there? Raul? I don't see the name on the list. Have we heard anything from the clerk's office? I don't see them either just give me one moment while i search a different view 
No, don't see them yet. Okay, we can uh, check in in a bit. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the next item in the meantime. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Items 3.4, 3.5, and 3.6 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.4? Bylaw 20131 to amend the Windermere Area Structure Plan, item 3.5. Bylaw 20095 to amend the Keswick Neighborhood Structure Plan, and item 3.6, Charter Bylaw 20124 to rezone land for the development of low and medium density housing Keswick. Yes, and let's pull up the speakers list. I think we have some people transition in person. So first was Katrina Rowe to answer the questions only. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, Jody Watchko is here to answer questions only, and I think in person. They're Jody, here. You're, yeah, you're here, perfect. I'm gonna trust to, somebody will tell me if they're here in person and, uh, and Jenna Hutton uh, to answer questions only from IBI group. They are also here. Thank you. And I see no one in opposition. Let's go to the next item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Items 3.7 and 3.8 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.7 bylaw 20140 amendment to the Charlesworth Neighborhood Structure Plan and item 3.8 charter bylaw 20141 to allow for a wider variety of commercial uses Charlesworth. Yes, uh, in favor, I have Marcelo Figuera from Green Space Alliance. Marcelo, you are here, I think. Uh, good afternoon, Council Mac. Yes, I'm here. Thank uh, you. Remotely. Yeah, you're here for presentation. And in opposition, I have uh, Robert Moore Rath Rathor on behalf of Laura Castillo from Bedrock Homes. Are you here? I think I see on the list, I, I do see a Rohit Rath. Rathor, are, are you, can you hear us? Yes, I am, I'm here. Perfect, thank you, you're here. And uh, in person it shows uh, Taryn Beer Singh. Yes, I'm here. Oh, perfect, you're virtual, awesome, that's great. Uh, thank you, so that's everyone on that item, or we can go to the next item. Thank you, is there anyone to speak to item 3.9, Charter Bylaw 20193, to rezone an existing commercial site along a major commercial corridor, Calgary Trail North. Uh, thank you, yes. I have in favor, Heather Crisson to answer questions only from DNA Planning Group. Yes, I'm here, good afternoon. Good afternoon, and uh, Victoria Afka for, to answer questions only from Blah Blah Real Estate. <laughs> yes, I am here also, thanks. Thank you, and I don't have anyone in opposition. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.10, Charter Bylaw 20166, to allow for small scale infill development, Kenilworth? Thank you. Yes, I have in favor uh, Rotimi uh, Adekanabi to answer questions only from Divine and David Incorporated. Yes, I'm here. Perfect. And can you, uh, can you uh, make sure I have the correct, correct pronunciation of the last name? Uh, it's Adekambi. Adekambi, thank you. And thank your you. to answer questions. And I believe there was a late addition of Justin Higgs uh, in favor as well. Yes, and they are here in chamber. And to confirm uh, for Justin Higgs, are you to speak or do you, uh, are you here to answer questions only as I don't believe we have anyone in opposition? To speak, Councillor, in case you did not hear. Thank you, I didn't, but I appreciate that. That's, that's great, so we'll make a note of that. Uh, and then I think we can move on to the next item. Thank you, items 3.11 and 3.12 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.11, Winterburn Industrial Municipal Reserve Removal, and item 3.12, apologies, I missed the bylaw on that one. Give me one moment. That was bylaw. Disregard, it is not a bylaw. And bylaw item 3.12, which is bylaw 19957 to amend the Winterburn Industrial Area Structure Plan. Uh, yes, I have Neil uh, Osaduke uh, from the City of Edmonton uh, to answer questions only. 
Uh, Neil's just in another meeting, but he will be available to answer questions if the item is selected. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I have no one in opposition. We can go to the next item. Thank you. Items 3.13 and 3.14 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.13, which is bylaw 20103 to amend the Jasper Place Area Redevelopment Plan and item 3.14, Charter Bylaw 20104 to allow for low-rise multi-unit housing Glenwood? Yes, I have in favor, uh, Urfrey uh, Tamon uh, from Tamon Architecture. I'm, yes, I'm, I'm here. Uh, uh, good afternoon, guys. Thank you very much. And in opposition, I have Jamie Post from the Glenwood Community League, who I believe is virtual. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And Gary, uh, Gary, I actually don't know how to pronounce your last name. I've known you for so long. Uh, Rasich? R R You'll have to help me. You're in, are you in person? Are you? He is here in person. Thank you. Okay. Gary, you can correct me on the last name when we get to... Uh, when we get to the item there. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the next item. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.15, Charter Bylaw 20162, to allow for low intensity commercial office and service uses Idlewide? Uh, yes, I have uh, Harman Deep Singh to answer questions only. Harman Deep, are you, are you here? Not seen. Uh, I, I do see a Gobinder Jeet Singh in the meeting invite. Yes, or... yes oh. I am. Hi, um, this is Gobinder Jeet Singh. Perfect. Okay, and you're here to speak to 3.15, correct? Uh, just yes. to answer questions only? Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, I don't have anyone else in, in favor or in opposition, so I, that's it for that item. We can move on to the next one. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.16, Charter Bylaw 20161, to allow for small scale infill development, Dover Court? Yes, we had a late, or uh, just a more current registration uh, in favor. Uh, Naraj Nath is remote uh, in favor, correct? I think I see, see Naraj there. Can you unmute and just confirm you are here with us? Morning, Council. Yeah, I'm here. Fantastic. Thank you. And then in opposition, I have Mark Fuhr, who I think I also saw on the virtual list. Yes, I am here. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Uh, then we can go to the next items. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Items 3.17 and 3.18 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.17 bylaw 20170 to amend the central McDougal Queen Mary Park Area Redevelopment Plan and item 3.18, Charter Bylaw 20171 to allow for small-scale infill development, Central McDougal. Yes, I have uh, Songlin Pan to answer questions only and they are remote, I believe. Songlin Pan, are you here? Not seeing the name on the list. We can always check in a bit later. Um, I don't have anyone else in opposition on that item, so we can move on to the next one. Thank you. Items 3.19 and 3.20 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.19, bylaw 20168, amendment to the Capital City Downtown Plan? and item 3.20, Charter Bylaw 20169, to allow for a mid-rise residential building downtown. Yes, so Belinda Morales-Smith from Dialogue Design or, uh, in remote, I believe. Yes, I'm here, thank you. And Belinda, just wanted to check, uh, are you questions only or are you here to register to speak? I can be either if council so wishes a presentation, I'm happy to give one. If they do not require one, then just to answer questions only. Sure, so if selected, we can do a presentation, but otherwise to answer questions, I appreciate that. Thank you. George Thank you. Schlussel, uh, Schlussel uh, to answer questions only from Pro Procura. George, are you here? 
he may be joining later if he's not on the call right now. Sure, uh, that's okay. We can keep going. And uh, next up was Tyler Dixon to answer questions only also from Dialog. Good afternoon. I'm here as well. Thank you. Good afternoon. And I have no one in opposition on that item. And we can go to the next one. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.21, Charter Bylaw 20183, to rezone land for low to high density residential, commercial, park, and stormwater management facility uses, Malmo Plains? Uh, yes, I have uh, Ralph Young from Melcor in person, and so I'll confirm that Ralph is there in person. Yeah. And I will trust. I yes, saw not again. And uh, Ralph, I just want to check, are you to speak or to, uh, to answer questions only? Questions only, Councillor Knack. Questions only, thank you. Uh, next is Greg Dooling uh, from the University of Alberta Property Trust, also should be in person. Yes, they are here. And same question to you, Mr. Dooling. Uh, do you have a presentation or is it to register for questions only? Questions only, Councillor Knack. Thank you. I have Nancy McDonald to answer questions only from Stantec. Yeah, oh, I, I can see her on the one. I have one camera that shows her. I see her at least. Uh, there it is. Uh, and Yolanda Liu to answer questions only. I can also see you on my camera. So there, I can see a few people. Um, it's not incredibly impossible to do it virtually. Uh, thank you. And I have no one in opposition. This is, this thank is, you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Thank you. Go ahead. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.22, Charter Bylaw 19831, to allow for low rise multi unit housing, North Glenora? Uh, yes, I have Raj Duna from Regency Developments to, uh, according to this, is remote. Raj, are you here? Not seeing Raj's name on the list yet. That's probably okay. We've got other items to get to before we get to that. Uh, and then I have an opposition, Alicia Tennant, uh, who is remote as well. I believe I saw Alicia's name. Yeah, I'm here. Hello, thank you for joining today. And that, I believe, is everyone. I will put a final call up. Is there anyone who uh, wishes to speak to any of the items who I did not call in that list? Uh, if you're virtually speak up, if you're in person, Wave your hand a lot to the clerk and then they can notify me. Not seeing Not any in chamber, Councillor Knack, just have one update. We've had a withdrawal on item 3.3 of the speaker registered uh, as opposed. Oh, okay, thank you. So we have no one in opposition now to item 3.3. Thank you for that uh, information. So next up will be selection of items for debate. So I'll, uh, I think the board is open, so please click on and we'll follow the order. We'll start with Councillor Rutherford. Hi, I'd like to select 3.16, please. 3.16, yes, thank you. Uh, I happen to jump on. I'll, I guess I'll do my, my uh, selections here quickly. I'll have uh, the selecting items 3.13, 3.14. Those are dealt with to be dealt with together. And I will also be selecting uh, the last item, or the sorry, second last item, which is the uh, 3.22. I'll go to Councillor Tan. Uh, thank you, Councillor Nag. I'll select 3.3. And uh, 3.7 and 3.8. 3.3, 3.7, and 3.8. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Thank you. I'll select 3.2, please. 3.2. Thank you. And Councillor Rice. 3.5. Sorry, just to confirm, is it, was that 3.15? Yes. Perfect. 3.15 is being selected. So there, are there any other selections today? And if not, uh, actually, sorry, I have one more. My apologies. I do have a quick question on item uh, 3.11 and 3.12. Uh, Councillor Knack, I think you have a speaker registered on 3.1, just a friendly reminder. 
Yeah, uh, and I now see another counselor on the board, so uh, we can get to them. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see if Councillor Salvador will select that where we have a speaker, or maybe the ward counselor. I think might. Yes, I was going to go for three point one. Three point one, which is also uh, tied to three point two three. Okay. Are there any other items to be selected? I'm not Apologies, seeing any point of order, oh. uh, Councillor Knack. I, I misspoke. Uh, I said 3.1, I meant 3.1010. Sorry, you wanted to select item 3.10. Thank you. I will we'll make that note. Um, sorry, therefore, we. Sorry? Apologies, Councillor Knack. Um, I'm getting some suggestion that there's a speaker in opposition on 3.1. I'm not, I didn't, I didn't hear that. Not in opposition, but somebody had a presentation. They weren't for questions only. They had indicated that they had a presentation. Um, yes, Dustin Cliss, Cliss from Sir Fort yes. Mill had uh, registered to speak, not for Sorry, questions only. So did you want to select that as the war? I think sure. you're the war counselor. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Neck. I'll select uh, 3.1. 3.1 and, and that's tied to 3.23 uh, as well. So, correct. Yeah. Okay, great. And I don't see anyone else on the board. So, Councillor Cartmel, I can actually go to you again uh, for the remaining bylaws that have not been selected for debate. Thank you, Councillor Nack, and apologies for the confusion. Uh, I'll move closure of the public hearing on items 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, 3.9. Three point seventeen, three point eighteen, three point nineteen, three point twenty, and three point twenty one. Second. Thank you, and that's seconded by Councillor Wright. Not seeing any questions, so please vote for closure of the public hearing on those items. We're just missing one vote. Councillor Paquette. Uh, Councillor Paquette's camera looks like he's either managed to hold perfectly still or, or his camera. Man. Oh, is he back? Councillor Paquette? Again, a frozen camera. We'll do one last call, Councilor Paquette, are you there? Sir, freezing. I'm gonna log out and log back in, sorry. Are you this. yes? Oh, did we hear his vote? I didn't hear his vote. I did not get a vote from Council. Oh, he, uh, did, he did manage to mark in. We have all the votes. Okay, all right, and uh, then please display the vote if we've got all the votes. That is carried, Councilor Carmel. Uh, thank you, Councillor Knack. I'll move first reading of item uh, items 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, 3.9, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 
And that is carried. Councillor Cartmill. Thank you. I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 20131, bylaw 20095, charter bylaw 20124, charter bylaw 20193, bylaw 20170, bylaw, pardon me, charter bylaw 20171, bylaw 20168, charter bylaw 20169, and charter bylaw 20183. Second. Thank you, and that's seconded by Councillor Rice. Please vote for third and final reading of those bylaws. We have all the votes. Thank you, please display the vote. And that is carried. Wonderful, even virtually we can accomplish this. It's not a complete disaster, working on it slowly but surely. Uh, I'm just talking about myself being the disaster. Don't worry, everyone else is doing an excellent job. Uh, just trying to manage as best we can. So next up is the, uh, we'll start with item 3.1. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Sherstone will provide a brief presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. This application proposes to close a portion of 184th Street Southwest in the Keswick neighborhood. Next slide, please. The road closure area is designated for low density residential uses within the Keswick neighborhood structure plan, as well as the Windermere area structure plan. 184th Street is a remnant of the agricultural land use pattern of the area. It is being closed in stages as the development of Keswick progresses. Next slide, please. The closure area will be consolidated with the abutting lands to the east and west to accommodate future residential development. Two sales agreements have been executed with purchasers for both halves of the road closure area, which correspond to the two bylaws being dealt with together today, items 3.1 and items 3 and item 3.23. As part of public engagement for this application, a web page was posted and 11 notices were sent to surrounding landowners and the Greater Windermere Community League. One response was received with concerns about maintaining access to their property, and in response to this concern, administration met with area developers to ensure the provision of access, which has now been addressed. Next slide, please. Administration recommends approval of this application as it will allow for the continued development of the Keswick neighborhood to continue in alignment with both the neighborhood structure plan and the area structure plan. Thank you. Thank you. I saw Mayor Stogie walking behind. You, you go ahead. You, you carry oh. on. I've just got to log in. Sure. As you get settled in, we'll go to our speakers in favor, um, starting with uh, Dustin Kliss, who had registered to speak in support. And you'll have five minutes. Perfect. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, just wanted to say that, yes, I am indeed in support of this closure uh, in the interest of safety of our kids in this neighborhood. Uh, I do currently reside in this cul-de-sac. Um, and right now it's an estimated nine children who will continue to play out front in this cul-de-sac for years to come. Uh, so currently without this closure in place, this road is being treated as a raceway and a and a convenient shortcut and really serves no purpose as a primary road as it offers no services at all. Um, so at this point in time, again, just want to express that I'm more than in favor of this in the interest of our safety. Uh, the extra one minute to go over to 186, 182nd Street is no match for what could be the outcome of the injury of a children out front. So just want to say thank you to everyone today for this and that I'm in full support of this closure. Thank you very much. The other three speakers were to answer questions only. And so I will check to see, we can go now to questions of our panelists and I'll, we'll open up the speakers list. Councillor Cartmel. Thank you, Councillor Knack, and, and honestly, really no questions, just really appreciate Mr. Kliss uh, being here today and reinforcing uh, the need to close this road and, and to augment traffic safety in the neighbourhood. So thank you, Mr. Kliss, for being here. Appreciate your comments. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, seeing no one else on the board for questions, we can move to questions of administration, and I'll go to Councillor Cartmel first to see if you have any questions. Mr. Ward Councillor? Uh, none for me. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Thank you. We'll see if anyone else is on the board, which I am not seeing. Uh, therefore, we'll do a call to see if any members of council have any questions specifically related to new information of our speakers. Not seeing anyone on the board. Uh, Councillor Carmel, can I go to you to close the public hearing? 
Thank you, Councillor Knack. I'll move closure of the public hearing on item 3.1 and 3.23. Second. Second. That's seconded by Councillor Rice. Please vote on closure of the public hearing. Um, yes, ma'am, just having difficulty signing in, but yes. Thank you, Mayor. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. That is carried. Councillor Carmel. Thank you. I'll move uh, first reading of item 3.1 and 3.23. Second. And that's seconded by Councillor Rice. Please vote on first reading of those two bylaws. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. That is carried. Councillor Carmel. Councillor Knack, I'll move second reading of item 3.1 and 3.23. Second. Thank you. And that's seconded by Councillor Rice. Please vote. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. That is carried. Councillor Carmel. Councillor Knack, I'll move consideration of third reading of item 3.1 and 3.23. Second. Thank you. That's seconded by Councillor Rose. Please vote on consideration of third reading. We are just waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. That is carried. And Councillor Cartmill. Councillor Knack, I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 20133 and bylaw 20218. Second. Thank you. And that's seconded by Councillor Rice. Please vote for third and final reading. We have all the votes. Thank you. And please display the votes. And that is carried unanimously. Uh, Mayor Sonny, are you ready to take over? Yeah, I will, uh, even though I'm having difficulty signing up, but uh, I'll figure that out while we are going through the process. Uh, so our next items are 3.2 and bylaw 20165 to close a portion of uh, Meridian Street, Northwest, North of 34 Avenue, Northwest Maple. Thank you. Is the presentation? Yeah, please yes. go ahead. We have the presentation ready? Yeah. Good afternoon. This application is to close a portion of Meridian Street to vehicular traffic and maintain it as city road right of way. This is to fulfill the direction provided in the Maple Neighbourhood Structure Plan, stating that Maple Road be extended and constructed to provide a permanent connection from the south and that the temporary Meridian Street be closed. Next slide, please. Meridian Street currently serves as a temporary measure to provide secondary access to the neighbourhood with development in Maple now reaching far enough south, this secondary access will be provided by a permanent Maple Road connection to 34th Avenue. This new access will be built to an arterial roadway standard and provide better access overall. Meridian Street will remain open until the Maple Road connection is constructed. Next slide, please. An advance notice was sent out to the entire neighborhood rather than the uh, typical 60 meters of property owners that is uh, usually done. This broader notification was used due to the community's ongoing concerns with emergency access. As expected, the community remains concerned and the city was able to confirm that emerg emergency access would still be provided by the higher quality Maple Road. This application is only to provide access to 34th Avenue and that the ongoing conversations regarding safety concerns in crossing the railway lines on the east boundary of Maple are separate from this conversation. Next slide, please. Administration supports this road closure and recommends the council consider its approval as it continues to improve access to the Maple neighborhood. It's compliant with the Maple neighborhood structure plan and it facilitates the continued development of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, there are two people in favor, but both are to answer questions only, Elise. Shillington, you're there, Alish? Yes, I'm here. And John Tan? 
to answer questions only as well? Yes, I'm here. Okay, got it. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I, I guess first maybe to the, um, uh, to the speakers, uh, Mr. Chan, can you maybe outline uh, what, uh, what steps that you've taken to um, communicate with residents on the, um, the construction and the, and the access in the area? Um, as outlined in the presentation, there was the, the public hearing notification, um, and as well, uh, we are putting together a letter that will be sent out to all the residents in Maple. Uh, we're currently getting that letter proofread and approved through uh, the city as well. Um, I think the letter is actually in its final drafts, and it should be sent out here fairly shortly. Okay, and that'll clearly outline for residents different access points that they can move in and out of the area, right? And, that and, is correct. And, and you've also done some signage in the area as well, I believe. Yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess now to administration, I just uh, want to... Just hold on. Oh. Are you done with the members of the public? Yes. Sir. Okay, good. So uh, anyone else? Uh, questions to, uh, to a member of the public? I see Ing none. Okay, now we're ready to go to questions to admin. Madam Clerk, right? Yes, that is right. That's yeah, good. Councillor Wright, go ahead. Thank you. Sorry. Um, okay, so the intent was never to have Meridian Street as a, a permanent road. Is that right? That is correct. I will defer the question to my transportation colleague, Faisal Said. Okay. That's correct, Councillor Wright. Okay, and I think that's, is that because it's part of um, provincial right-of-way in that, in dealing with the Hende, or...? Um, so Meridian Street, the portion that is being closed is uh, uh, currently owned by the city. Uh, the only reason it had to remain open was to uh, continue to provide secondary access. And now that we have uh, Maple Road uh, construction imminent, uh, that is triggering a need to close this temporary road. Okay. And will residents still be able to access the 34th Avenue flyover over the Henday? That is correct. Maple Road will extend all the way south to 34 Avenue and that access will be uh, available. Okay. And then once you get over on the east side of the flyover, um, the public would have to go through um, the range roads in Strathcona County, but emergency vehicles, do they have a better access point? That's correct. So there are two access points um, uh, for emergency as well. Uh, one is through the Range Road. If if not, then uh, uh, Meridian Street south of 34 Avenue is still open and maintained by the city uh, for emergency access. Okay. And emergency services are aware of that access? That's correct. Awesome. Um, I've just had some concerns from, from residents and I do appreciate uh, clarification on these points and also appreciate um, Mr. Chan in, in um, preparing and distributing the communication so that residents do have a better understanding because I think that has created some some confusion in the past so um, I don't think I have any other questions thank you very much um, and I just told okay so that concludes the questions to administration. Now I'll go to uh, council members if they have any questions to uh, public or to administration for the information arising out of the previous questions. Uh, I see none. Madam Clerk, we're ready to close the uh, bylaw. Right. Okay, Councillor Wright. Okay, I move to close uh, bylaw 20165. Second. Second by Councillor Rutherford. Rutherford, please vote for uh, closing the public hearing on bylaw. We're just waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Wright. Um, move first reading on bylaw 20165. 
Second. Second by Councillor Rutherford. Uh, anyone to speak? Seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And move second reading on bylaw 20165. Second. Second by Councillor Rutherford. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And consideration, move consideration for third reading of bylaw 20165. Second. Second by Councillor Rutherford. Please vote for the consideration. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And move third reading of bylaw 20165. Second by Councillor Rutherford. Second. Okay, please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, our next item is 3.3 .3 bylaw 20017 to close a portion of 30th Avenue Southwest east of Plum Link Southwest, the orchards at Ellerslie, exempted by Councillor Joanne Wright. Uh, is it you? No, I, I have her. Okay. Uh, Councillor. Ken Tang. Okay, is there a presentation, please? Uh, there is, if warranted. Uh, the speaker against withdrew. Uh, so just looking for direction if you'd like a further presentation. I would prefer a presentation. Yeah, go ahead, please. Good afternoon. This application proposes to close portions of the 30th Avenue Southwest Road right of way, located east of Plum Lake Southwest, Plum Link Southwest in the Orchards at Ellerslie neighborhood. There is no physical road constructed on this right of way and the closure areas will be consolidated with the abutting lands to accommodate future public utility and residential development. Next slide, please. The application conforms to the orchards at Ellerslie neighborhood structure plan as well as the concept plans for these roadways. Next slide, please. In closing, administration recommends approval of this application as it will allow the orchards at Ellerslie to continue to develop as per the approved plan. Thank you. Thank you so much for the brief presentation. We have uh, Elise Shillington to answer questions only. Elise, you're there? Yes, thank you. And Peter uh, uh, Toluscus to answer questions only as well. Peter, you're there? Oh, you're in, in okay. Uh, all right, Councillor Tang, you exempted these questions to public. Uh, yes, that would be great. I recognize that we have one speaker withdraw, but we've also got an overwhelming amount of uh, messages in writing on this particular item. So I do want to select it and ask some clarifying questions. Um, if Peter, if you don't mind coming down, I do have some questions for you too. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if you can just shed some light on, on the purpose of this road to begin with. Um, was there, you know, what is the purpose? Was it ever meant to open? Because I think we've, we've gotten a lot of response about concerns around access to 66th Street. Was there supposed to be an access to 66th Street? If you can clarify some of the intent. Oh yeah, turn on your mic. Uh, thank you, Councillor Chang. Um, the purpose, yeah, the, the purpose of the of the closure is um, to take what is a, an existing undeveloped government road allowance, being 30th Avenue, um, and close that, but provide a actual physical roadway just south of it um, through Orchards Boulevard, which will provide the connection to 66th Street, completing the link through the community, out to the nearest arterial, and provide access into and out of the community. So there's not really meant to be that direct access. The access is from the Orchards Boulevard. I, I guess I'm just curious why so many folks living out there and future residents, uh, we've heard a lot from future residents as well, 
who are under the impression that um, that 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 they have that access. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or contact with uh, the community. Uh, Councillor Tang, uh, I'm going to assume that the the location of the area to be closed um, is parallel to what is going to be Orchards Boulevard, just about 100 meters south, and it may just be a misinterpretation of the maps that are available to customers in our uh, sales center and residents in the community. And in your sales center, when you kind of talk about the area, is there a road on, on any of the graphics or anything like that? Uh, no, Councillor Tang, there's no road in that location that's shown. Right. Uh, the only road showing would be um, what is going to be Orchards Boulevard to 66th Street. Okay, great, thank you. I just wanted to get some clarifying information and I do have some questions for administration. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Any uh, uh, council members, questions to uh, uh, members of the public? Seeing none, Councillor Tang, you can ask your questions to admin. Great, thank you. Um, in my time where we set, I'm assuming. Um, we've gotten a lot of concerns around just congestion uh, and you know, there's, a, there's gonna be different avenue that's gonna bring in more traffic to the area, including a future dog park. And I was wondering if administration can comment on sort of Orchard as a, you know, at the stage of development, uh, you know, and uh, where we are in terms of um, per, you know, percent of land developed, uh, anticipation of future growth. Um, I, let, let's just start there. Um, so thank you, Councillor. Um, the road closure in question wouldn't impact any of the incoming traffic or outbound traffic because it doesn't exist currently. Um, with regards to the um, development of the land, this is really just continuing on that orderly development. If you want, you can take a look um, if it, um, the clerks could put up slide five. We can also just show quickly the, the proposed roadway that is being adhered to. Uh, no, slide five, sorry. Yes, that one there. Um, sorry, just to speak to the, the uh, potential misunderstanding in terms of what road was being proposed and might be thought about being um, removed. Um, so this might be where some of the confusion comes in because they are parallel and quite close to each other. In terms of the overall development of the neighborhood, it is progressing. However, it is still predominantly undeveloped. Um, and uh, I don't know if there's something that can be added by um, our professional, uh, transportation professional, Faisal yeah, Said. Please. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, and I think I part in particular to transportation, I was, uh, I was wondering sort of the traffic, uh, the pattern of traffic flow, um, whether or not this closure is gonna have an impact on that. Uh, I think I know the answer, but I would like you to kind of talk about that a little bit um, and in the context of Orchards Boulevard that's parallel to this closure. Sure, Councillor Tang. Uh, so as you can see in terms of, uh, so first and foremost, the answer to your question is no. There, there won't be any uh, impact due to the road closure because that uh, road right of way was never uh, planned for roadway. And uh, as mentioned uh, by my colleague, uh, that uh, uh, Orchards Boulevard extension that is shown in light brown color uh, on the screen, that's uh, that's the permanent collector roadway connection to 66th Street and then 66th Street to 25th Avenue. Um, the roadways, uh, like overall accessibility to the neighborhood, it's uh, fairly decent uh, given, given the amount of development in the area because currently it has uh, three direct accesses to an arterial, which is 25th Avenue to the north. So the general pattern of uh, the traffic is uh, going to and from north uh, through those three uh, connections. Uh, there will be very soon fourth connection to the east. Uh, uh, there is already commitment in place and uh, uh, I believe the roadway is uh, slated to open uh, uh, late uh, uh, this year or uh, next year. Um, and that will be uh, the upgraded 66th Street uh, connecting 25th Avenue and then the remaining Archers Boulevard connection uh, that is parallel to the road closure area to the south. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, so 
Oh, and and suppose suppose there were that road place? there uh, to connect yeah. to from 66th Street into a residential uh, neighborhood like that, there could be potentially unintended consequences regardless. Um, and I think that's. Uh, I guess I'm also wondering just with this confusion uh, and, and sort of the number of uh, emails that we have received, has uh, your team been able to kind of respond and clarify this with the residents? Yes, Councilor, we have been responding to each of the requests. That's good, and, and any kind of feedback back? Just the follow-up questions with any additional questions they might have. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, and I think you know, I'll, I'll just speak to it when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank Councillor Wright. Thank you. I'm just wondering if I'm misreading the report. Um, it says that the advance notices were sent to the Community League and property owners in July 2018. I can double check that number for you. I, I, Sometimes the road closures take a significant amount of time to do the review, so I'll find out for you. Because I'm wondering probably couldn't have gotten responses because there were no residents in the area in 2018. <laughs> that date is accurate. It's an older file. It is? Okay. And so you wouldn't do anything, um, any other notice more currently? There's the notice of public hearing that also would have been sent out, Councillor. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then um, just as far as, as access goes, um, Councillor Tang and I were talking about this bylaw last week, and so I went and took a drive, drive around. Um, and around and around and around the area. <laughs> um, so I do appreciate that the um, Orchards Boulevard is gonna be an access point out to 66th Street and they're just... Yes, just through a different um, parallel road. Okay, and they're just working on 66th Street right now. Um, I'll have to defer to Mr. Faisal Seed on this. Yes, that's correct, Councilor. Okay, and then I the other so then the other point that connects in with 66th Street is 25th Avenue, um, and right now that's just single lane each way, right? Yes, that's correct. Expectation of when that's going to widen. So the first stage will be to urbanize lanes uh, as we do in all uh, uh, in staging the arterials. Uh, so. What you will see uh, significantly different there will be uh, urbanized road with pedestrian accommodation, sidewalks, uh, rather shared use path, and uh, upgraded intersection at 25th and 66th. Um, with future development in orchards and in general, uh, uh, general uh, vicinity of this area, uh, uh, down the road there will be opportunity to make it four lanes, but uh, the first stage will be two. Okay, so there's no plans for any anything coming up in the in the most more recent future. Like I said, the first two lanes are already under construction, uh, scheduled to open late this year, um, and then subsequent uh, upgrades will be subject to uh, the traffic volumes. On on twenty fifth Ave or sixty six. Sixty six is okay. Street. I okay, believe that's you were asking about fifty six Street. Okay, Council. that's where I was seeing the construction. I'm just wondering about the con congestion out to sixty six Street. If twenty fifth would be widened soon. Uh, that uh, will again be uh, monitored and uh, um, and could be widened uh, uh, subject to the traffic volumes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's all the questions I had. Thank you, Councillor Wright. So that concludes the questions to administration. At this time, I'll go to council members if they have any questions to public or to administration for the information arising out of the previous questions. Any new information arising? Seeing none, Councillor Tang, are you ready to move the uh, closing of the bylaw? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'll move the closing of the bylaw, 20017. Seconded by Councillor Wright. You want to second, second that? Councillor Wright, okay. All right, so please vote for the closing of the bylaw. Of all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. 
Mr. Mayor, I will move the first reading of bylaw 20017. Second. Second by Councillor Wright. So anyone to speak? Councillor Tang? Um, yeah, I just, you know, I, I recently, uh, well, Orchard was recently voted by CBC as the best suburb in Edmonton, and I had an opportunity to to celebrate the event. And through that, I I actually learned that the community is has still far more um, land to develop, over fifty percent. Um, and you know, I think a lot of people, you know, choose to move out to neighborhoods like Orchard. Um, you know, the, you know, there's lots of family, lots of children in the area, uh, particularly on this segment, uh, on this part, in in this part of the neighborhood that we're talking about today. You know, it's adjacent to two schools, um, and just recognizing, you know, how much growth there is in the future. I know there's a lot of residents who are very concerned about, you know, congestion and easy way to, you know, get on a main collector row like 66th Street. Um, and all of that is still very much in motion. Um, and, you know, I know that people are concerned about the congestion that will become with, you know, the future dog parks from the schools, but there's actually so much more growth. And, you know, city is working actively with the development community to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place to continue to promote access, to promote family-oriented, uh, you know, suburban communities. Um, I guess one of the things I, I've been kind of concerned throughout this is just, um, I guess, the, I suppose that the confusion that comes from this road closure and how, how widespread it got to so many local residents and, and um, people who haven't even moved in yet. Um, and so I'm not, you know, I, I, I think that's something I think for our, for our planning team, for, um, you know, the developer and, and the real estate to, to consider just in terms of um, making sure residents do have the accurate information. Um, and I guess anticipate that, you know, as we continue to grow in the city, um, everyday Edmontonians will be part of these these conversations around road closures, around zoning changes. Uh, and I think about the implication as we engage in a much broader conversation with zoning bylaw renewal um, and really continue to help build the capacity for Edmontonians to fully, I think, grasp, uh, you know, what it is that people are actually opposing and, you know, what is actually being changed uh, in the neighborhood and any real versus perceived impact that it will have. Um, so this is important for future growth, future development, um, and um, you know I, I I am supportive of this, and I am glad to hear that you know we're actively working to um, correct any mi misunderstanding that there may be, and you know people are not losing access, um, and you know future access to 66th Street is absolutely taken care of. So want to thank everyone who did write in, and thank you for your engagement with city issues like this. And that's it. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Please vote for the first reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the second reading of the bylaw 20017. Second. Second by Councillor Wright. Please vote for the second reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the consideration of bylaw 20017. Second. Second by Councillor Wright. Please vote for the consideration. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the final reading of bylaw 20017. Second. Second by Councillor Wright. Please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, the next items are 
3.7, 3.8, which will be dealt together by Law 20140, Amendments to Charles Worth Neighborhood Structure Plan, and Charter by Law 20141 to allow for a wider variety of commercial uses in Charles Worth. Uh, is there a presentation from the administration? Good afternoon. Thank you. This application proposes to rezone a 0 0.67 hectare site in the Charlesworth neighborhood from the CNC neighborhood commercial, sorry, neighborhood convenience commercial zone to the CB1 low intensity business zone. This includes an associated amendment to the Charlesworth neighborhood structure plan to facilitate the proposed rezoning. Next slide, please. The subject site is on the eastern boundary of the Charlesworth neighborhood adjacent to 34th Street and fronts onto Charlesworth Drive. Another CNC site is located directly to the north, and the surrounding area primarily consists of single and semi-detached homes, with established single detached homes located directly behind the property to the south. Across 34th Street, the Dakota North NSP plans for low-density residential uses in a storm pond. A development permit for the site was approved on January 29, 2021, to allow for the construction of three commercial buildings under the CNC zone. Next slide, please. The Charlesworth Charles Worth NSP designates the site as neighborhood commercial and the proposed amendment to the NSP would allow for the CB1 zone to be used in this designation. Both the CNC and CB1 zoning are appropriate for the neighborhood commercial site which abuts low density residential uses and is commonly found within other developing neighborhoods in the city. The CB1 allows for broader ranges of uses than allowed within the CNC zone and aligns with the direction of the city plan which supports the development of 15 minute communities. Next slide please. In addition to an expanded list of permitted and discretionary uses, the CB1 zone allows for the development of larger buildings compared to the CNC zone, including smaller setbacks adjacent to roadways, increased height, and increased floor area ratio. The massing model shown on this slide shows a comparison between the height of the buildings currently constructed in green, the maximum height under the CNC zone in blue, which is the current zoning, and the maximum height under the proposed CB1 zone in pink. While there is notably increase between the currently constructed buildings and the proposed CB1, the difference between height between the current CNC zone and the proposed CB1 zone is two meters. The site's location on a corner lot on an arterial and collector roadway supports the proposed CB1 on the site, and the regulations of the zone ensure that appropriate transition between the site and the single detached homes will be established should that site be redeveloped. Next slide, please. As part of public engagement for this application, a site sign and web page were posted and 29 notices were sent to the surrounding landowners in the Meadows Community League. One response was received which outlined concerns related to privacy and shadow impacts to the adjacent properties and concerns regarding impacts to property values and that the existing list of commercial uses was sufficient for this site. This letter included 25 signatures representing 16 property owners in Charlesworth and following the receipt of this letter, an online petition was later provided which included 76 signatures. Following receipt of this letter, the applicant requested to host a virtual meeting to engage directly with these citizens, and that meeting was held on May 26th, where eight residents attended and reiterated their concerns. Next slide, please. Administration recommends approval of this application as it supports development at a scale that is appropriate for a corner lot along an arterial roadway and will diversify the land use composition in the Charlesworth neighborhood, which is also supported by the city plan and the southeast area structure plan. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. We have Marcelo uh, Figuera uh, in favor. Marcelo, you want to make a presentation, right? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Um, okay, whenever you're ready, okay. Um, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. I have a short presentation focused on how the CB1 zone addresses the interface with single detached houses. But just want to start with a couple of slides to show why this area needs more business options. Next slide, please. Development within the Chatsworth started in 2005 with the adoption of the Chatsworth Neighborhood Structure Plan. The site is located across the Dakota North neighborhood. The area hasn't stopped growing, and as the Dakota North starts to develop, it, there will be more demand for services and amenities with a reasonable distance from residential areas. Next slide, please. Uh, Charlesworth Drive and 34th Street provide connectivity and interface between Charlesworth and the Deco North neighborhood. The intersection of, the, of these roadways is planned for a commercial node that will serve both neighborhoods. This commercial node will also be supported by an R7 site planned on the northeast corner of the area. Future residents of this medium density site will also be able to enjoy the additional service and amenities provided by the CB1 zone if approved. 
Next slide, please. Moving over to our to the subject site, uh, the development is currently under construction. Uh, the owner has already secured a few uh, key tenants, such as a daycare, a convenience, a convenience store, and a food store with a drive-through. Uh, the setback regulations for the CSC and the Seaborn zone are the same, as pointed out by administration, so it's three meters, so nothing will change. The difference in the maximum allowable height between the CNC and CV1 is only two meters, as shown in the conceptual cross section. And but those brand new buildings will not be demolished to increase the height at this point. Next slide, please. So to understand what this development will look like after completion, we look for precedents in other neighborhoods, and we found this development in Allard, another new neighborhood on the south side of Edmonton. As you can see, the zoning bylaw addresses the interface between abundant commercial and single attached houses by applying three key features. Number one is the, is the three meter setback, then a landscape buffer and a private fence. This is not a new situation in our neighborhoods. There are other developers in Edmonton following the same regulations. My remaining slides show a comparison of the proposed development and this precedent in Allard. Next slide, please. This is a view from the neighborhood collective road in, uh, in the interior of the neighborhood. The picture on the left is the proposed development in Charlesworth under construction, and the one on the right is the CB1 precedent in Allard. Next slide, please. This is a view from the Archeria Road, would be uh, 34th Street uh, for Charlesworth. Again, the picture on the left is the proposed development, and the one on the right is the CB1 precedent. The example from Allard shows that as the trees mature and with regular maintenance of the landscape, the interface with single detached houses become more seamless. Next slide, please. Uh, lastly, I just want to show you a bit of the feeling of this Allard development on a weekday afternoon. The parking lot is full. The manager of the daycare tells us that uh, they have a waiting list and the Tim Hortons is hiring more staff. This is to demonstrate the importance of the commercial nodes as community hubs for suburban neighborhoods. Next slide, please. In summary, I just want to highlight that the CB1 zone could potentially accommodate additional community services, restaurant, and so on, and could provide opportunities to create local employment and more investment. Locating commercial development adjacent to single detached houses, it's not an unusual situation in Edmonton. Uh, we found more than 10 other examples uh, just like in, in that quick survey. During construction, things might look a little unclear, but with time, the things required by the zoning regulations will do the work. So I hope we can support this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Figueroa, for your presentation, and I'll see if council members have any questions. Uh, Can you sign up? Here you go, Councillor Tang. Questions, please? Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Mr. Figuera. Um, uh, I, so I was wondering, when did your construction start? Uh, it, it was like uh, last year. Okay. Um, yeah. so, so you weren't necessarily waiting for this rezoning to, to begin construction because you're able to accomplish what you need with a physical build under the existing zoning. Is that right? No, um, the owners, uh, when they uh, uh, retained uh, our firm to do the rezoning, they were a little bit concerned about um, um, retaining more uh, tenants for this area. So they, they asked us what would be the uh, some more odd, odd options uh, to have more business I opportunities. See. Okay, so, so through this rezoning, you're looking at kind of increased use so that you have opportunities for, for greater diversity of tenants. That's correct. Great. Um, and I saw that in there, this is multi-story. So this will going up to three stories current build. Is that right? No, the, the, the building is only right now is only one story. Right. Um, the height is uh, it's uh, just over seven meters uh, below the maximum that is uh, 10. And the CB1 could go up to 12. OK, but you're only going up to, to seven meters single story. Yeah, 7.3 meters okay. single story. Okay. For some reason, I thought it was multi-story, but thank, 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 thank you for that clarification. Um, and then in the comparison with the Allard, you are planning to do, in addition to the setback, you're also going to be planting some trees along, like in between. 
um, with the neighbor's property. Is that right? Yeah, that's part of the uh, development permit uh, conditions that issued for the CNC. So that landscape buffer will be uh, uh, provided once it's close to completion. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, I will. Hmm. Okay, great. Um, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you. I was just sort of looking on the the clarity on the um, whether it was going to be extra stories as well, and maybe it's because of the color coding on the presentation with the pink and blue and green. Um, but this does give you the opportunity um, to include some uh, housing on an on an extra level. Is that right? Yeah, that's correctly. The CB one allows uh, for uh, multi uh, multi unit housing uh, if the ground uh, remains commercial. Okay, but and but that's the same as for the current zoning. So yes, but uh, because the has uh, uh, the FAR is uh, two point zero in the CB one, there would be a different development okay. than the CBC with the multi unit housing. Okay. Well, I like that opportunity. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the clarification I needed. Thank, thank you, Councillor Wright. So that concludes questions to you, Mr. Uh, Figueroa. Thank you so much for your presentation. Next, we will go to uh, uh, members of the public who are in opposition, and I'll ask uh, Rohit Moore Rator. Uh, are you there, Rohit Moore? Mr. Rator? I think he got busy. Uh, he just, texted me if I can no, speak this in Taranbir Just Singh. hold on. So Mr. Rator is not there. And Taranbir Singh, that's you, right? That's right. Okay, so you have five minutes to make your presentation. Go ahead. So I'm going to speak on the Laura and Dave Castillo on behalf of them. So dear Mr. Mayor and Councillor and City Councillors, we apologize. We cannot be there to speak for ourselves. However, our trip was booked prior to the hearing. Therefore, we have asked our neighbor to read this on our behalf. We are writing to you today to voice our concern as homeowners who are directly and actively affected by the new proposed rezoning. Our house is the corner lot directly, exactly nine feet behind the current one story commercial complex located at above at address. I will outline a list of concerns of why we are opposed to the instruction of our personal space and future well-being. We oppose the change of the rezoning to 103 Charlesworth Drive Southwest from CNC to CB1 due to the following concerns. Number first, a negative impact on families, pets, and personal well-being. For example, the building is already so close, nine feet to seven property lines, including ours. It already negatively impacted the feeling of openness and flow to our yards. Furthermore, we have had to clean our yard several times due to garbage, styrofoam, screws, and plastic that had been dropped or thrown into our yard. Number second is privacy. A two or three story building will directly over overlook backyards and have clear sight lines into first and second floor windows. This is breach of privacy and our personal space as trees which would have to be very tall, only provide limited coverage. It is a safety concern for our, for, for our families. If people can look into our homes, it is unreasonable to expect homeowners to have their blinds closed at all times due to main living areas, including main bedroom and <clears throat> bathroom being at a rear of residences by increasing floors, they will require rear windows and or exit points. Sun exposure is the third point. Uh, the current CNC building has al already decreased the amount of sunlight entering the rear of our homes by allowing it to develop higher. This would pre uh, prevent further light and 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 roach on and encroach on mental well-being. Number fourth is noise. The building is so close to many residences by allowing further stories, it will only compound this issue. Already during construction, music can be heard within homes with all windows secure and blinds down. Fifth concern is traffic concerns. Uh, there is only one entry and exit point into the areas, which is 36th Street. Parking and street congestion along the route is very, 
is already an issue. Number six is home value due to decreased sun, privacy issues, noise problems, and personal space. It would decrease the value of adjacent properties. This has been confirmed after speaking with a real estate agent. A, would you like to live behind two or three story building that completely overlooks your property and it is only nine feet of your property line? Number seven is a lifestyle. The backyard space should not be enjoyable as an increase of height and of the building with possible overlookers would make it uncomfortable to relax on our own property. We are opposed to this change. It's not just houses that will be affected, it's people, health care, workers, city of Edmonton employees, families, mothers, fathers, children, and pets. The developers speak of benefits, however, the only benefit is to the developer's bank account. There are currently several commercial properties on our intermediate and close areas, for example, A, Alersley and Charlesworth Way, which is in our neighborhood, Alersley and 50th Harvest Complex, 2.7 kilometers, three minutes drive, 23rd and 20th Street, which is six minutes, 50th and 23rd Avenue Canadian Tire Complex, which is eight minutes. In addition to those larger complex, there are CNC zones to be built at the following, 50th and Alersley Road, three minutes, North Corners, Charlesworth Drive, zero kilometer across the street, one we speak of, 34th Street of Charlesford Drive, across the 34th Street. There are three commercial properties on three or four corners of intersection, not including all the other commercial nearby. This is overkill and we do not want to need further commercial. Profit is the main concern for developer who is obviously not considering the individuals who are building their lives in a quiet family-oriented community. It is a difficult in today's time to buy a home and many sacrifices have been made to achieve it. Imagining buying a dream home with in information that this will be a small one-story commercial space then all of a sudden it's possibly so, changing into... Mr. Singh, I'm going to stop you here. Five minutes are over. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you. Yeah, no no, thank, thank you for uh, speaking on behalf of uh, Laura Castillo. I'll see if there are questions from council members to... Uh, do you, you might be able to answer. Uh, Councillor Tang, you exempted this, right? So I'll go to you first. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, uh, Mr. Singh, for, for, for coming out today speaking and speaking on, on, on behalf of your neighbors. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Castillo did indicate that if she has internet, she'll try to we'll just even watch this conversation. Um, so I saw so towards the end there, you have mentioned or in the letter, the Castillos mentioned that they were concerned about the potential design for multi-story, uh, but we also just heard from the applicant that it's a single story up to seven meter well below what is currently allowed with the current zoning. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, uh, do you have any thoughts ab about that uh, or any reassurance that this is not gonna be a multi-story uh, as originally, um, I guess, thought of by the neighbors? Hi. Oh. Hi, Ms. Councilwoman. Um, oh, uh, this is Laura. Are. Actually, no, I was hold, able to get internet and just get in. Could I answer that no, question? No, just hold on, please. Just hold on. Just hold on. You, because someone else has spoken on your behalf, I need to get direction from City Council, oh, sorry, Clerk's Office, whether you're able to answer questions. Just clarity, we don't have uh, Mr. Singh as registered to speak on behalf of Laura Castillo. We had brought more Rathor registered to speak on behalf of Laura Castillo, and so... We would need to either ha we would need to have uh, the registered speaker speak on behalf of Laura Castillo. Yes. Yeah, so Mr. Singh mentioned in his remo opening remarks that he was speaking on behalf of uh, uh, Laura Castillo. But in order for La Laura Castillo to answer questions, she would have to register. We right? would have had to have registration before the item started. That's correct. Before the item was uh, started, yeah. started. Sorry, I'm so sorry, Ms. Castillo. You cannot answer questions because... Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, one more. We'll have legal... Just hold on. I will ask legal opinion. So I don't know that it's fatal that you didn't have registration prior to the item starting. So if it is your pleasure, Mr. Mayor, you are able to allow these questions oh, okay. to be answered. Um, I think it's a little bit outside of process, but in terms of... Um, risk, I think you're better off to allow um, these folks to have their opportunity. Okay, then I'm going to, I, I will use my discretion to allow Ms. Castello to uh, answer questions, but please uh, register as well, right? So, uh, Sorry, just, do we need to move? 
Uh, we, do we have to need to add her to the list of speakers? Not, not for a, a public hearing. Okay, got just it. For, just for committee. Got it. Okay, get it. Okay, so uh, Ms. Gallo, Ms. Castello, go ahead. You can uh, answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of the council. Uh, we actually, as a, a whole neighborhood, had a meeting uh, with Mr. Marcello um, probably a month ago. They requested a meeting with us, and they explained that currently under the CNC, the building is one story, which was seven point something meters. However, if the rezoning was approved in the future, they would be building higher up to three stories. They just said currently it was one story, but they will be moving forward if approved to go higher up to three stories. So you're quite concerned about sort of the future development of this? Yes, absolutely. Um, the people in the community, uh, including ourselves, um, we, you know, purchased houses there for the foreseeable future. This wasn't like um, to build and then sell to make profit. We want to build our homes there. And of course, the information we were given was that it was going to be a one-story commercial, which is what it, it currently is. However, then when the rezoning happened uh, and we opposed it, I, I believe I sent a letter to yourself as well as the city yes. planner. Um, and then the developer reached out, which was Mr. Marcello, and had a meeting with us, which I have all of the notes and all of the recordings for yeah. that meeting. I, and they did say that if approved, they will be going further or moving uh forward and building higher. Okay, great. Um, by the way, just a point of order, I think I lost a minute and a half there. With no, doing, in that, in I'm that cracking your time. Okay, so go great. Ahead. No Thank worries. you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, Marcelo, I do see your hands up, but it, it, will, come, it will be your time afterwards. Yeah, he can't answer um, at this time, no. And, and um, Mr. Singh or, or, or Ms. Castillo, do, so in terms of the current CNC, um, it's not a matter of how many floors, but it goes up to 10 meters. Um, and which, you know, is a question I'll ask administration as well. But I'm just wondering if, if, if you are aware of that, that height difference between the two. Um, between the two. Yes, they, he explained it in our previous meeting that it wasn't that much higher, but with multi-stories, they will have to have an egress, egress point on anybody that's up on the, either the second or third story, which means windows and or balconies. And with the property only being nine feet from our property line, any of balcony or window will directly overlook and also look into our back living space and all of the residents backing onto this property, um, like our living space, so like our you know, the, the main bedroom, the main bathroom, your living room, your kitchen are all at the rear of the residence because we're, we have front garages on, on the front. So, I mean, we would all have to have our windows closed. Like right now we have to have our blinds and everything closed because the construction workers came and look right into my bathroom. Okay. Um, and then just to one of the comment in your letter as well, in terms of, um, the neighborhood has enough commercial development sites. Um, I guess just thinking beyond Charles Worth, there's um, quite, like, aren't there quite a bit of land that's still undeveloped right now? Yes, yes, there currently is. There's a development going on the east side of 34th Street, um, just a, kind of across 34th Street from us. And south of us is not developed. It's still for sale. It's not purchased. Um, just, I mean, obviously, I we know, we understand that there's going to be further development in that area. But just with the areas that I've listed um, listed out, with the, the three that's going in that immediate area, along with the one that's already in the hills, um, and then we have four properties literally with like six kilometers away and those are larger commercial properties right i guess um i guess my point is more just around uh, so you, so you anticipate that you know in the future uh, there will be more develop residential developments um and commercial spaces like these you know contribute to amenities um not only for the current residents but also for future residents um, yeah, there there is more commercial rezoned with the information we were given by the right. city to to go up in our area as well as in other areas. Which I mean, for us is like, well, if there's going to be so many other developments going up, why the need to make this one higher? Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. And yeah, I'm almost out of time. Much. And thank you for joining on vacation. <laughs> no, absolutely. We were trying to get in earlier, but it was the internet is not great here. Yeah. Thank you so much. There are more questions, so don't leave yet. Uh, Councillor Sal yeah, Salvador. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll be brief. 
Um, you know, you talked a, a little bit about the impact to families and similar to Councillor Tang's line of questioning, um, just trying to think, you know, 10, 20, even 30 years out here, because that's what we have to do when we're thinking about these decisions. We're trying to get to a place where we have those 15 minute neighborhoods, walkable, amenity rich. Um, do you feel that, that this change could, I guess, add some, some new opportunities for amenities, uh, things like childcare, different forms of retail? Um, well, I, I understand where where you're coming from. The area that is being built right now with the, the one level that they have, there is child care going in there. There's also, um, um, I believe, a gas station as well as a restaurant and a law office. Um, on the entrance of Charlesworth Way in Ellerslie, we also have a complex there as well. Um, I understand that obviously homes have to be... Um, catered to, but with the fact that we already have a place, a development in Charlesworth, or in the hills of Charlesworth, sorry, we have the one that we're speaking of right now that is um, close to being complete, it seems, and then another one going just north across the street, and then another one going just um, east across the street, across 34th Street, I would imagine with the with the development going up in newer areas, either on the south of Ellerslie Drive, once that's developed, I would imagine CNC properties or C1B properties would be going in there. They're not just going to be residential. So I don't expect that our specific commercial area would be catering to everybody. Okay, um, and maybe I'll just ask some further questions about um, you know this specific commercial area. We Absolutely. Heard, we heard that things like landscape buffer, um, fencing, as well as a three meter setback will be in place uh, between the interface of the um, commercial development and residential. And we also saw some precedent um, examples and images from other neighborhoods where, like, like Allard, I think was the example that was provided, uh, where, you know, there's kind of a full screen of, of trees that buffer the properties. and. Uh, I guess I'm wondering what do you feel is different about this particular case, uh, given that we've seen it in other neighborhoods? Um, well, when we were speaking to uh, Mr. Marcello, I actually asked specifically for addresses to go um, so we can look. And this property is it's it's just under three meters, so it, it's nine feet from our property line. Um, they have exit doors on the back. For the exit doors on the back, they're going to have to have an area to open those doors. They're going to be fire escape doors, fire routes. So those doors are going to have to open outwards. So for nine feet to have a full tree screened area along with that, I think I, when I sent um, the city clerk my letter, I also sent photos. Um, I, I don't see how they're going to make it possible. Plus, when I was speaking to the developer myself, because um, he was out back um, when I was cleaning up the garbage that was being thrown in my yard, um, he said that he was also planning on putting a concrete barrier. Um, this is only nine feet. This is three feet taller than an average male. Like, I, I don't understand. I Again, I don't have, you know, an architectural background or anything, but I don't see how they're going to fit all of this in here, especially if they're going up multiple stories. They do need to have an egress point um, for people out the back. Okay, well, thank you for joining us today. I am out of time. No, you have another minute and a half because you only had... That, I was minutes. that five minutes went really quickly. Yeah. Um, okay, then I will ask just one, one final one. Um, yeah, I, I heard mention of uh, garbage and some of the construction practices. I, I will just say uh, that as it pertains to the decision today, um, that's not something that I would factor in and that we can really factor into my understanding. So I just wanted to flag that, um, that that would be a conversation for, um, I, I would assume, our compliance side. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, but thank you for being with us today. That's all my questions. Thank you so much. Uh, so that concludes the questions to uh, both Mr. Singh and uh, uh, Ms. Castillo. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And next, I will ask uh, council members if they have any questions to administration or members of the public for the information, new information arising out of questions. So Councillor Tang, go ahead. Sorry, so is it too public or too administration? Uh, to, uh, to anyone. That's my understanding at this time, yeah. Okay, so yeah. I guess t question to, to Mr. Figuera. Um, can you talk about sort of these concerns that was raised and what are some of those mitigation 
um, strategies, uh, particularly kind of privacy issues, um, sun exposure, and I'll ask the administration about the traffic concern afterwards. Please, you're on mute. Okay. Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you for the question, Councilor Thank. Um, first, I, I just like to uh, start by saying that um, we um, we uh, held this meeting after all the comments were received uh, from the, the technical circulation because we wanted to understand like if this if the administration had any concerns that we need to address immediately and, and if those concerns were the same raised by uh, the, the residents. Um, in, in addition to having a meeting, we set up a website to provide all the information uh, to the residents. We also offered to meet with the president of the LOC Community League, but she couldn't arrange a time to meet with us. Um, and at this meeting, and we were the one uh, uh, setting up the meeting and I have the record. Uh, what I explained was, um, the CNC zone allows for three stories because you can accommodate three stories within uh, 10 meters. You can also accommodate three stories uh, under 12 meters, but the developer has no plans to demolish this building that is brand new, uh, reinforce foundation, and then just go higher because the zone is allowed. Like this, this building has like a, a capital cost and we will remain there for the next 15 years or, or, or more. Uh, once the lifespan of the building uh, is gone, then there'll be opportunities for redevelopment like in any, any other site. So that's the first thing that I like to clarify. Um, in, in terms of um, the, the setbacks and the mitigations, I think the, the example that I showed uh, kind of uh, speaks for itself because uh, with time, the, the landscape will kind of mature and will grow and will provide that uh, privacy, uh, address that privacy concern between uh, the backyards of the single attached houses and, and the building. Um, the the walkway is is kind of a, something that is a standard required for um, this type of development, as well as the the, the back door for fire safety. So I think uh, th those are uh, standard features that are required at the development uh, permit stage, and um, this, this thing will happen in in a way that. Um, it will create that interface that uh, it is uh, found in other uh, developments and is accepted for in, in other neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, so, if I if so, if just to just to repeat a little bit of, of what you mentioned, so there's currently no intention to add additional floors, um, uh, not in any time soon. And I guess also, like, if you wanted to 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 do the current um, build. Um, you could have just done it without the without the rezoning. Oh, if you don't mind, if you're not speaking, if you're not speaking, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Um, so if you could have done it under the CNC, but really right now we're talking about additional use uh, for the commercial space. That is correct. Yeah. Right. So th this whole zoning doesn't have to happen for that bill to happen. I'm just, I, I'm just, I, I just want to emphasize this point. Um, but the current bill allows for additional use. Um, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I think just to Councillor Salvador's last point, just around some of that construction nuisance, you know, it's not a factor in decision making, but I think you heard the residents loud and clear, um, I guess just good neighbor practice that perhaps you can convey back to the, to the, to the developer or owner. Yes, and we actually, uh, at that meeting, we, we heard all those concerns and we took notes of uh, those problems and we communicated it to the owners. So I think uh, since then, he has taken some actions to rectify those uh, problems Great. during thank construction. You. Thank you. But I cannot work with him again. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I'll just yield at this point. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to clarify the, the current building you mentioned has reinforced foundation, so, and you've got an extra, what, three meters? You could actually put another story on there right now, correct? No, what I, what I said was that the current building was designed for uh, uh, accommodate one story. And uh, if we were to uh, take this opportunity to build higher, that would foundation would probably have to be redesigned and reinforced. Oh, I thought you just mentioned it was reinforced. Okay. Um, and then...
Okay. Um, okay, that's just, I just wanted to clarify that whether in order to put the second story on, you could do that right now or um, would have to have the rezoning. But if you did reinforce the foundation, you could put that extra story on in the, under uh, the well, current zoning. Uh, so under the existing zone, the, the building could accommodate three stories as well as under the proposed uh, CB1 zone. Okay. Either way, it has to be structurally uh, designed to accommodate three stories. And at this point, it hasn't been structurally designed that way? No. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Can you move to second round, please? So moved. Second. Second by Councillor Salvador. Please vote for second round of questions. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, Councillor Tang. Yeah, thank you. Um, I saw Mr. Singh uh, raise yeah, his hand for his hand. Yes, so I am wondering for folks, um, the residents, uh, in, in, in light of the new information presented to this chamber, uh, do you have, I guess, does that off answer some of the concerns um, that, that, that you have raised? M M Mr. Singh, first, please. Yes, so as a, a, we have a houses, those are zero lot lines. We don't have any windows on the side of the houses, on the both side of the houses. So windows are only at the back and the front of the houses. And from the back, there is already like 7.3 meters building, but uh, they cannot, I think, build in a 2.5 meter or 2.7 meter for a second story. If they, if, if they get extra two meters uh, for in 12 meters, they can build another story there. But uh, that that will really there will really be no sun sunlight or no light up in our houses. It's already dark. We have to. I'm sitting in my house and we have to uh, turn on the lights to see anything. If I turn off the lights and the, all the blinds are open, I can show you that. And there and, is a dark. And so you also heard just now that uh, the design right now is structurally not not super fit for additional stories. That is correct. Which I understand is your is your concern. So yes. so I guess that's my my question is, if the design is not structurally there for multi story, shouldn't do, does 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 that alleviate some of your concern about you know sun sun exposure in the back, et cetera? Yes, but if if they demolish this building and they build it again for a two or three stories, that's gonna be all over again for all the noises we heard for a year and a half until now. If they do that again, that's gonna be a lot of lot many problems in this one. Right. Yeah. Right. And you also just in this new round of information, um, I think they have mentioned that the intention isn't, you know, like it's not gonna be demolished tomorrow for a whole new build because the current plan is structurally is there for the current design for the next, I think the number was 15 years. The, uh, I, we are not sure about that, if they're gonna do it and after 15 years or yeah, they might course, start yeah. it here. There is a lot of uncertainty that comes with any kind of, I think, you know, zoning and development. Um, so I appreciate your point, thank you. And to Ms. Castillo, do you have any response in light of the new information that was shared with this council chamber? Thank you, Ms. Councilwoman. Um, I, I do have concern, like I, I understand what Mr. Marcello was saying. However, with the information and the meeting that we had, he explained that it wouldn't probably be happening this year. However, the uncertainty with the future, this is already um, a construction area and a zone that we've went through already. And I understand that things change, um, but just the ability for them to do it. And if there were no intentions, why put the rezoning application in right now? And I think- Because in the- Yeah, and so, I, so I think I heard in his latest round of response is that it also adds additional use to increase the diversity of commercial tenants. Um, it's, the information when we had the meeting with 
Mr. Marcello, he he explained that there was no intentions right now. However, moving forward, they do want to go up higher levels because it gives them more leasing opportunities and more diverse opportunities with regards to what can be allowed in the zoning, um, which I understand, obviously, and which was to my point, that benefits the builder, benefits the developer because it's more leasing property, which means it's more money going into their pocket. However, it affects us so negatively living right behind this building. It, it completely masks and puts a wall behind our property. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask the administration some questions um, at this point as thank well. You. Um, can you speak to a little bit about sort of that uncertainty piece? Um, you know, I think generally people are pretty worried about what's going to happen, you know, years down the road. But isn't that kind of uncertainty that comes with any development, including residential? Can you just speak to that a little bit? Uh, I think that's a fair assessment. There is always uncertainty when it comes to development, especially through standard zones um, in the zoning bylaw. Um, this is this is not abnormal to what we see in most neighborhoods. Um, and the CB1 is specifically intended to be utilized in these circumstances where we have corner sites with arterial road access that have um, some form of flanking condition that abuts residential. Um, so we review all of our rezoning applications based on the highest and best use, which in this case would be a full 12 meter building, um, and are confident that the regulations we have in the zone and the zoning bylaw itself um, would ensure that we would have an appropriate transition um, to those single detached houses. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. So that concludes the questions on the new information, and we are ready to close the public hearing on this bylaw. Okay. Someone would like to move to close the public hearing on this bylaw? Uh, sure, yeah, I can close, move to close the public hearing. Second. Second by Councillor Salvador. Please vote to close the public hearing on these two bylaws. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Um, and at this time, I'm going to put the first reading of bylaw 20140 and 20141. Second. Second by Councillor Salvador. So we have first reading on the floor. Anyone to speak? Are oh, you there? Councillor Tang, please go ahead. Um, yeah, well, first, uh, I want to thank, uh, you know, the residents, um, and in particular, uh, you know, the, the leadership and and the persistence of the Castillos for, for rallying um, and being very engaged on this particular issue with such an impact on their immediate neighborhood. Um, you, know, I, you know, again, similar to the last uh, rezoning, this part of the city will continue to grow um, for quite some time. Um, I don't know the, the specific percentage, but this this area and the neighboring Dakota and further south to that, uh, there's still lots of future residents that will move in and to accommodate uh, and to also achieve, you know, the vision laid out in the city plan in terms of the 15 minute neighborhood that uh, Councillor Salvador has, has mentioned. Um, commercial spaces uh, and proximity uh, within the neighborhoods uh, do contribute to that. Now, you know, this, just in terms of the current design, I want to just speak a little bit to that. You know, this zoning doesn't have to happen for the current design to be built. Um, and if, if, if the owner wanted to build a three meter, they could do it within the existing zoning. It doesn't have to come to this, cha to this bylaw change. Um, however, you know, really what's here is to allow for greater diversity of commercial tenants to move into that future commercial site. And I, I, and I think that's a very important distinction between um, the build itself and allowing for greater variety of use, which I think is kind of at the, which is also you know, very much part of this conversation. Um, and I think we do want a greater diversity of, of uses too, because that's part of those 15 minute, you know, easy access to, to a variety of amenities. Um, so, so that's, that's one thing. And, and I, I, I understand there's a lot of, I guess, fear and concern about what's gonna happen um, 
maybe next year and the year after, depending on market condition, depend depending on, um, you know, the the desire of the developer to add additional story and what that might uh, impact. Um, and that that kind of uncertainty comes with, I think, all kinds of development. Um, and in order for that to happen, there has to be a, quite a quite a bit of reworking of the foundation. There's a lot of things that needs to be in place um, for that complete, you know, re envisioning to happen. Um, and at this point, you know, just considering the, I think, the factors on the table. Um, I will be supporting this um, because I think at the heart of this is about increasing the, di increasing the diversity of use. If we're really concerned about future um, height or the future design of the build, this rezoning isn't going to change that. It's not going to, you know, even within the existing zoning, it's not going to prevent this build from going up to the 10 meter that it is allowed. Um, so I think, you know, I know that there has been a lot of engagements with the residents. Uh, I think there has been quite a, a thorough um, conversation. And I know that it's not the answer ultimately that we are, um, that the residents might wanna, wanna hear. Um, but I do want to emphasize that, you know, the. The areas that continue to be developed, and I think in order to achieve the, that um, vision of t tighter knit neighborhoods with you know plenty of amenities, um, this this type of um, I think rezoning is is important. And again, we're talking about increasing um, the number of uses on the site. So thank you all for for your for your voice and for you know sharing your perspective. Um, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Councillor Tang. So, um, Madam Clerk, I have a process question. Councillor Tang, what moved the first reading as a mover? I should have gone to her at the end to close, right? Yes. Or is it okay for me to go, go to Councillor Salvador to speak as well? Um, I don't think that there's anything prohibiting. I think you could use your discretion here if you wanted to, um, Good. to allow okay. Councillor Salvador. Good. Councillor Salvador, go ahead. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I'll be very brief because Councillor Tang um, really outlined uh, the reasons why I'll, I'll be supporting this as well. Um, I think that really we're talking about a, a very modest uh, and moderate increase in um, developability here. I think that actually CNC is, is quite low and, and potentially too low of a zone. And uh, I think CB1 is, is only a slight change to that. Uh, I think about the um, measures that are in place to ensure that there is a sensitive transition between CB1 and uh, adjacent residential. And I think that things like the landscaping buffer, private fence, as well as the existing setback uh, do provide for, for adequate transition. Um, and for all the reasons that Councillor Tang spoke about allowing greater diversity of uses within our neighborhoods to support 15 minute communities, uh, I think that's really what this all comes back to. Uh, so again, I will be supporting this. Uh, thank you to everyone who did come out to speak today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Councilor Reis. Uh, I will not support this by law. So the reason for that, I, I heard the conversation here very carefully. I also I appreciate the conversation. Yes, our city has a vision and we have the goal to achieve. However, the vision and the goal is to better serve our residents better serve our Edmontonians. And then without our, Edmonton, our Edmontonian support and understanding our goal cannot achieve. It. And then right now, look at this bylaw. We have so many our laborers come out and say, this is a huge impact for their personal life. And it's specific for the privacy. But I heard the answer is, oh, we can build some like landscape to incre increase that production for privacy, but this is not the right answer for that. And then the key point here is, do we make sure we have all the people come with us together to achieve the common goal? I didn't see that piece here. 
I cannot support this. And even though we have the goal, we have the vision we want to achieve, but only everybody on the same page work together and we can achieve it. We, we cannot keep build that impression until our Edmontonians say our voice are not heard at, cha at the city chamber, at the city council. We cannot keep allow that happen. We need to think about, look back, how we can send the different message to our citizens say, yes, your voice matters. That is the point. I'm not going to support this one. Thank you, Councillor Rice. But I don't think it's fair to say that uh, other council members don't listen to their constituents. We all do. But we make judgment based on the values and uh, and others as well. So uh, I want I want to clarify. I'm not make a judgment to say yeah. other council members yeah. not to listen. Yeah. I just to say the principally yeah. and how we can ensure our citizens' voice really matters to us to be yeah. heard. I think so it, in my speak, I don't have any yeah. judgment. I would disagree. What's mayor? No, Ms. Mayor, fine. you said to me. No, that's fine. That's fine, Councillor Rice. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is a public hearing, and that means the public comes out to be heard, and we are listening. It's very clear, um, and uh, I would not challenge the chair on his ruling on that. I think it was fair. So, Mr. Mayor, uh, I will support this. Um, I will support it because, uh, as was mentioned, this is uh, fitting with the with uh, commercial uses. It's fitting with the city plan, and um, I have great empathy and compassion for people who do not want to see the change and who are fearing the change. We hear that at every public hearing um in one form or another but generally speaking uh those fears never actually materialize um the development uh tends to be a little bit more gentle than than people are concerned with and we've seen that play out over and over again the other reason i'm, I'm supporting this is because uh the more barriers we put in the way to development, the less we are going to get the kind of development that we are hoping for that increases density, that it increases opportunity, that allows people to live within a 15 minute uh, district and uh, allows us to right size our taxes. If we don't do things like this, we can continue with business as usual and the tax rate will continue to climb and climb and climb in order to service a more uh, or actually a less dense area um, where people where we have to build more roads, more uh, uh, fire, more police stations, uh, provide more services on an increasingly spread out area. That is not prudent. This gentle form of commercial and residential density that we are embarked on makes fiscal sense. To not go in this direction does not make fiscal sense. And that is the basic bottom line right there. If we want to continue business as usual, we will pay more money. And I am not comfortable with that. Are you finished, Constable Paget? Mr. Mayor, I, I'm pausing for a moment because I'm collecting my thoughts. We have heard from the developer that they plan on, on developing in a way that is responsible. If we do not take their word on this, we are in essence saying that we do not trust them. And one of the things that we have found is that when developers change what they say they are going to do, they generally are held accountable the next time they come before council for anything. We have seen this happen in the past. And developers have actually, some 
who uh, I won't name any names or one uh, that I can think of right off the top of my head, got quite frustrated with council on that um, quite publicly. And that's fine, Mr. Mayor. That is 100% within their purview, but there is an accountability factor here. So I am not that worried uh, on that on that regard. So we will watch this development. We will see what happens. And I, I am firmly convinced that, that we are going to see a development that it will not adversely affect the neighborhood. In fact, only allow folks to live as they as they say they want to live in their neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You want to say something? No, good, good. Okay, thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, Councillor Wright? Very briefly, because I know we are going to break here right away, but I, I will be voting in support of, of um, this bylaw. I, I think it is everything that, that we need to see as far as creating these walkable communities. Um, I'm just looking at the, um, the admins presentation where we've got the multi-use uh, trails, we've got access to on-demand service. Um, wouldn't it be nice if um, a, you know, a single mom could drop her child off at the daycare in the community, um, then pick them up afterwards and make use of, uh, of all these different uh, amenities in the area? Um, I think we're also going to be getting more use of it with the developments coming over uh, east of 34th Street as well. And uh, I do think that it is something that our, our community wants and not everybody pers not everyone is going to want the same thing. Um, but I do think we have to look out um, into the future as well as to, to what's best for our community. Um, so I will be supporting this. Thank you, Councillor Wright. I'll go to Councillor Principe, then we'll take I'll conclude this, then we'll take a break. Councillor Principe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I will support it simply because um, from my understanding, in either zone, you will still have the ability to accommodate a three-story building, which I don't think would impact the privacy either way, whether it be uh, the change in the zone or the current zoning. So either way, there is the, um, the chance that it could be, a, or the ability to accommodate a three-story building. So the privacy uh, would not be impacted. So that's my reasoning. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Tang. I move the second reading of bylaws 20140 and 20141. Second. Second by Councillor Salvador. Please vote for the second reading. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Mayor, I move the consideration of the readings for bylaw 20140 and 20141. Second. Second by Councillor Salvador. Please vote for the consideration of third reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Mayor, I move the final reading of bylaws 20140 and 20141. Second. Second by Council Salvador. Please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, we'll be back at a uh, little after 3.45.
Good afternoon. We are live from City Hall Chamber. All right. I would like to call this meeting back to order, and I will do a quick roll call. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince-Bay. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Hi there. Councillor Paquette. I see Councillor Paquette, but maybe joining us later. Uh, Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Here. And Councillor Jans. We'll wait for Councillor Jans to join and Councillor Paquette to join. Okay, we are on item 3.10, Charter Bylaw 20166 to allow for small scale infill development, Kenilworth. Is there a presentation? Go ahead, please. Thank you. This application is to rezone a site in the Kenilworth neighborhood from the RF4 semi detached residential zone to the RF3 small scale infill development zone. The purpose of the RF3 zone is to provide for a mix of small-scale housing for infill situations, which, if applied to this site, could result in up to five units of multi-unit housing in the form of row housing. Next slide, please. The site is a corner lot located in the neighborhood interior. On-demand transit service is available, with the nearest access being at the 86th Avenue and 71st Street. The surrounding properties are a mix of small-scale housing with some commercial and industrial zones found one block to the south. Both educational and recreational amenities can be accessed a short walk to the north and east. Next slide, please. Administration mailed advance notices to surrounding residents and the applicant has posted the required site signage. Responses were received from one recipient who felt that the development would help rejuvenate the community. Next slide, please. When comparing the current RF4 zone with the proposed RF3 zone, the differences are minor. In some of the most critical ways, the RF3 zone will require a more sensitive transition to the property on the west by providing a three meter interior setback. The mature neighborhood overlay will continue to apply to the site and will ensure that infill development remains sensitive to the surrounding context. This will limit the maximum height to 8.9 meters and require vehicular access be from the rear lane. This combination will result in a building that remains sensitive in scale to the surrounding small-scale residential buildings. Next slide, please. The proposed rezoning aligns with the goals and policies of the city plan, which encourages increased density at a variety of scales, intensities, and designs to have up to 50% of new units added through infill citywide. The 2016 federal census identified that single detached housing made up 77% of the available housing, in, uh, housing product in Kenilworth while not having any row housing. By allowing the RF3 zone in this location, we enable a modest increase in density that will remain both sensitive in scale to the surrounding single family homes and provide greater housing choice within this community. Next slide, please. Administration supports this application as the proposed zone allows for the opportunity to develop row housing in a contextually sensitive manner. The application is further supported by the city plan and it provides additional housing diversity within the neighborhood. It's administration's opinion that the site is suitable for the proposed zone, and we recommend that council consider approving the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We have two members of public in favor. Uh, Rotemi Adikanbi, uh, online or uh, remotely, and Justin Higgs in person. Justin, are you here? Can you please, uh, are you making a presentation or questions only? Uh, just a few words. So please come up to the, uh, the podium here. And uh, because uh, Ruthemi Ede can be, is to answer questions only. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Higgs. Um, I just want to, I'm, my house is actually on almost all those slides. Uh, I live right across the alley from this house. I've been in the property for about 11 years. I believe the letter that was sent out is at least the third or fourth one that I've received uh, since I've been in this house. 
I I'm here today because I want that house pushed over. Uh, it's been a problem house in the 10 or 11 years I've been in the property. Um, so I've always been in support of this. This is the first time I've decided to come down and, and give my two cents because it's it actually hasn't been nearly as bad in the last year as it has in the past. I've had I've called the police on the property at least three times in the past 10 years. Uh, I've seen stuff that I would rather not have had to see to a, at a neighboring property. I have two young kids. I've talked to other neighbors in the area and they've all said that they wish the house would be gone and I think most of us would uh, look forward to, even though it might be a year of construction, uh, it's just been a uh, problem property in our neighborhood. Uh, the, and on some of those slides, the house, or I guess the properties on the west of it, it was an old property and it got rezoned as well, maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, and it's been great. It was, like I said, it was a year maybe of headaches with construction, but we all accept that. And uh, I just look forward to hopefully this actually happens because as I talk to neighbors, this has been going on for years and years and years before I even lived in the property that there was talk of rezoning or, or new construction. So I just hope this time that it, uh, something does actually happen. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. Uh, let's see if there are questions to you from members of council. Oh, sorry, Consul Salvador, go ahead. I'll just be very brief. Uh, thank you, Mr. Higgs, for coming out to speak today uh, in support of this. I really appreciate that. And it's good to hear from, from community members who want to see that type of rejuvenation um, and revitalization in our neighborhoods. Um, I just, just wanted to say, uh, while it's not related to the decision before us today, um, please know that this council is taking problem properties very seriously. Um, so that's, that's actually all I wanted to say, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Salvador. So that concludes the questions to you. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, there's no one in opposition, so now we will go to uh, questions to administration. Councillor Salvador? Can we start Council no Salvador's questions. time from start? No questions? No. Okay. Anyone else? Sign up, please, for questions to administration. Seeing none, and uh, any questions to administration or the public for new information arising out of previous discussion? Seeing none. None. Okay, Councillor Salvador, yes, you want to move? I'll move closure of public hearing. Second. Second by Councillor Tank. Please vote to close the public hearing on this bylaw. Can we just confirm, Councillor Jans, are you still in the meeting? Uh, yes, I am. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We're just waiting for your vote. Oh. I think it's sent. Oh, here we go. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move first reading of Charter Bylaw. Let me just quickly get it in front of me. Thank you, 20166. Second. Second by Councillor Tang. We have first reading on the floor. Anyone to speak? So, anyone else to speak before I go to Councillor Salvador to close? Seeing none, please, Councillor Salvador, for you to close. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, I'll be brief. I just strongly encourage all of my colleagues to support this. Uh, I think one thing that really stuck out uh, that we just heard is that there is no row housing in Kenilworth, um, which is is quite, uh, well, it's quite counter to the types of, of diverse neighborhoods that we're trying to build. So I think that 
Um, by, by allowing this, we're gonna see greater housing choice for new families to be able to move into this neighborhood, maybe folks who've lived there for a long time, opportunities to age in place. Um, so I think it's close to transit, close to amenities, and as we heard from our speaker, it's really important to see that type of revitalization and turnover and renewal of our existing neighborhood. So I will absolutely be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I will move a uh, second reading of Charter Bylaw 20166. Second. Second by Councillor Tank. Please vote for the second reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'll move consideration of third reading on Charter Bylaw 20166. Second. Second by Councillor Tank for consideration. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'll move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 20166. Second. Second by Councillor Tang. Please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So that deals with 310. Next one are 311 and 312, Winterburn Industrial Municipal Reserve. And Mayor Sohi, yeah, I don't need a presentation on that. So and bylaw one nine and okay, just hold on. There's no anyone else needs a presentation? Seeing none, so please Councillor Knack, just hold on. Give me one second. Uh, and we have one person, Neil Osadiak, to answer questions only from the city. So you have questions to uh, uh, the, uh, the applicant? Uh, no, not to the applicant, but to administration. Thank okay, you. Okay, so we skip that part. We go to administration. Go ahead, Councillor Knapp. Thank you. Uh, so the, the, the one question I did have um, that I didn't see addressed in the report is just uh, how, how breathe comes into play in our industrial areas. Uh, well, it's, it's been a little while since we approved it, and, and this plan was approved, I think, before uh, that originally came to be. And I, I just wasn't sure how we treat park spaces in industrial areas. Uh, I know there is a parcel of land uh, to the west that was originally identified when the plan was approved, but I'm not sure if that's uh, what should, what we would deem appropriate in an industrial space, uh, whether there should be more, whether this parcel should be held off on. So any insights that you can share, particularly in relation to Bree? We do circulate it to Parks and Rec to determine whether or not the parcel would be required for additional um, park space, and it wasn't deemed as uh, necessary. I can defer to Mr. Pollock for additional information. Uh, Councilor Neck, it's Tim Ford here. When we do these plans, we, we tend to look at larger, more consolidated sites in industrial areas. Um, they tend to have more of a regional uh, impact. Um, Things that come to mind are larger soccer centers, complexes, uh, maybe cricket pitches and things like that. Uh, these smaller sites, are, they, as you can imagine, are, they're difficult to uh, maintain and um, in industrial areas, they're, they're not used quite as much. We do try and if we do have uh, more natural sites, retain them in industrial areas. Um, this was one that was inherited, I think, by at the time of annexation. Yeah. Um, so it came to us that way. Uh, but generally speaking, if it's not a natural area or not a larger site that we can use for more broader purposes, um, that we, we tend to um, surplus them when, when we can. Yeah, and it, and, and it may make sense. I guess my, my question, and knowing that we circulate the park with one thing, I do think that, that for things like this going forward, specifically now that we do have breathe, you know, the question I'm trying to, that I want to just make sure I've, we've thought about is, you know, do 
should we have pocket parks in industrial areas for employees on a lunch break to go and be able to access green space? Is that something we should be thinking about, particularly with our new plan in place? I'm not sure this is the right one to do it on, but it, this gave me a chance to ask about that because I, I haven't seen anything that, that talks about that in the reports. And I, and I can't really recall how, how it was written in Breathe originally. So I, that's my question is that do we, do we think about that? Do we think about you know, private park or public park space for people to enjoy on breaks and things like that? Yes, absolutely we do. Um, particularly if we were to plan a new industrial area today, we would, we would definitely incorporate uses like that. Um, I think given the long-standing uh, nature of, um, of this plan, uh, the more fragmented land uses, uh, it is a very, um, let's say, kind of heavy industrial outdoor storage kind of uses in here as well. So we'd probably look at it in the context. If it was more of a business employment area, then certainly we would be looking for uh, pocket parks for industrial, for office workers and industrial workers at lunch and things like that. Um, just the context here, it's, um, it, it's, it's made it more surplus to our needs, I suppose. Okay. That's helpful. I just, yeah, I think that's something we should be thinking about. And, and even in spots that are, but I mean, this is all medium industrial. And so, um, so it should be possible for, for employees who work in this space to have uh, the ability to go outside and, and not feel like they'll be um, in a, in a, tough environment to enjoy so but I, I can see why we might not do it this space the the other question I have to ask um because I think we need I need to ask it every time anything close to Winterburn Road comes up and so this is probably to Mr. Saeed um Winterburn Road continues to be well over capacity at this point now we have some pretty substantial traffic backups that happen uh every rush hour probably starting at about this time um I uh, wanted to just get a sense of, of what the requirements are. We're, we're looking to change this to allow for medium industrial, but what do, what's the plan right now for, for Winterburn Road? So for Winterburn Road, the most recent uh, um, development would be to improvise uh, the interchange. Uh, both the uh, interchange uh, uh, ramp intersections uh, would be signalized with some reconfiguration of the bridge deck. And that, uh, that is a recommendation coming out of uh, uh, the transportation analysis done to accommodate uh, development happening in Big Lake and the current development in Winterburn Industrial as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, while there's signals now on the Stony Plain Road side, uh, we haven't yet had signals installed on the Yellowhead side and currently traffic actually backs up onto the Yellowhead uh, throughout most of the day. And so do we have a timeline as to when we can expect that to be addressed? Because I, I imagine we don't want traffic backing up on a major highway uh, for very long. Uh, that's correct. Um, I believe all the um, approvals from uh, Alberta Transportation are in place and we are actively moving forward. I, uh, I won't be able to give you uh, the exact timelines, but we can follow up offline if, if you would like to. What I'm hearing is though we, you know, we're it's in the hands of the province right now to to help uh, to make sure we can get this through to completion. What about the uh, the the actual road itself, Winterburn Road? Uh, again, right now is single lane in each direction. Um, uh, both intersections still do back up. Even Stony Plain Road backs up still um, because of of traffic trying to get uh, into different directions. Um, what's the requirement right now for upgrades to Winterburn Road, particularly in between Stony Plain Road and, and Yellowhead, which is the part we're, we'd be talking about today? So the ultimate uh, cross-section for uh, Winterburn between Highway 16 and Stony Plain would be four-laning. And uh, yeah, so so there were some upgrades done as part of uh, the uh, industrial development happening in the northwest corner of, uh, uh, or, or rather southeast corner of uh, Highway 16 and uh, Winterburn. So there were some upgrades done, but then the next phase will come with future redevelopment in that area. Good. So that is your five minutes, Councillor Nack. You have more questions or uh, that's it? No, I'm okay right now. Good. Thank you, Mayor. Thank so. you, Councillor Nack. Anyone else have any questions? Seeing none at this time, I will ask if any council members have any questions to uh, 
the proponent or to administration on inf new information arising from questions? Uh, Councillor Rice, go ahead on new information. Just try to click. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Rice. Yeah. Um, not just ask new information, just ask a question to administration. So once this um, reserve move, removed, so this line will for the use for the specific purpose or we don't have the purpose for how we use this land yet. Sorry, the land actually was annexed as industrial land, yes. uh, and it was never taken out to be used for any other purpose. Does that answer your um, question? So in the report, they said, and so after this uh, designation reserve removed, and this will become um, the open spaces for public, recruitment and the school authority purpose. So on the page two, and unless I missed something, I just want to understand what, what is the purpose for the land use, even though we removed this. Um, I think what you're speaking to is the, that it's going to be changed to be allowed to be consolidated with road parcels. Councillor Rice, the, yeah. um, Ms. Petron here, the land is zoned medium industrial, yeah. so it could be yeah. used for those type okay. of uses. Could be used for When the stuff. municipal reserve designation is removed. Yes. Is it removed, that's his only purpose, or we have different purpose and for to, so I just want to make sure we get the more open spaces and the public recreation and the school authority uh, mind, and is not for the, uh, residential development or any other commercial development? So, Councillor, once the, uh, the MR de designation yeah. is removed, uh, the real estate section of the city will seek to sell it, um, and it will be then developed as an IM parcel, which is the current zoning. Um, it may be beneficial to ask a question of the applicant, who is the real estate branch of the city, to see where those funds will be directed to. Um, they'll most likely be directed to the municipal, re municipal reserve fund, uh, which will be used to purchase other open space across the city, but not necessarily in this neighborhood. Okay, that, that's his, that's his difference. Uh, from, my, from my question here. Uh, also, the second question, so I'm reading the reports and then try to understand because there are two cents in the one page one and page two. Um, second question about the procedure, do we need a vote? The first one is just the, uh, the fin uh, from like financial uh, services reports. So we need to approve that report first, then we move to the bylaw or we just vote one time. Sorry, you're asking for sequ sequencing yeah. on the votes. So it will be to close the public hearing on the item, and then it will be on the recommendation in the report, and then it will be on the bylaw. That's oh. the recommended sequencing. Okay, so close and then recommendation and then bylaw. Right. Okay. Okay, thank you. That's my question. Thank you, Councillor Rice. So that concludes the questions. Uh, and I will actually ask again, because Councillor Rice had questions to administration, anyone has any questions to, public, uh, to the applicant and to administration on the new information arising out of the previous questions? Councillor Wright? Not sure if it's new information, but let me just try. Okay. <laughs> um, the, um, Designation of municipal reserve has nothing to do with it being like natural wetlands or anything like that, preservation areas. It's just strictly, it was going to be city land to use for parks. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Okay, so that concludes the questions. And will Councillor Naki want to? Yes, Mayor move? Savi, I'll move closure of the public hearing on items 3.11 and 3.12. Thank you. Second. Second by Councillor Salvador. Please vote to close the public hearing on these two bylaws.
We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move the recommendation in item 3.11. Second. Second by second by Councillor Salvador. We have a recommendation on the floor. Anyone to speak? Seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, Mayor Sohi, I'll move first reading, or, uh, first reading of um, bylaw 19957. Second. Second by Councillor Salvador. We have a first reading on the floor. Anyone to speak? Seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sovi, I'll move second reading of bylaw 19957. Second. Second by Councillor Salvador, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor so we'll move consideration of third reading on bylaw 19957. Second. Second by Council Salvador. First consideration, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor so we'll move third and final reading of bylaw 19957. Second. Second by Council Salvador. Please vote for the final reading. We're just waiting on one vote. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. So that concludes 311, 312. Next one is 313, bylaw 20103 to amend the Jasper Place area redevelopment plan. We do have some members in opposition, so I think we'll go to administration for a presentation. Thank you. This application is to rezone a site in the Glenwood neighborhood from the UCRH Urban Character Row House Zone to the RA7 Low Rise Apartment Zone and to amend the Jasper Place Area Redevelopment Plan. The proposed RA7 zone would allow for a 16 meter high building, which is approximately four stories, and is intended for residential uses as well as limited commercial opportunities at ground level. Next slide, please. The subject site, oh no, sorry. The subject site is located on the northwest corner of the block abutting two local roads within the Glenwood neighborhood. Vehicular access is through the rear lane to the east of the site and transit is available on 95th Avenue, 100th Avenue and 163rd Street. Transit service was recently removed from 156th Street to accommodate the construction of the Valley Line West LRT line. The two future LRT stops, Glenwood Sherwood and Jasper Place, are both within a short walk. The surrounding area is developed with single detached homes with low rise apartments to the east and Metal Art Christian School less than a block to the north. Next slide, please. The site is located within the Glenwood neighborhood of the Jasper Place Area Redevelopment Plan and is currently designated as transit-oriented housing, which is to allow for a range of ground-oriented housing options in proximity to services and transit. The application proposes to amend the RP to multifamily housing in order to facilitate the proposed RA7 zone. The objectives of this designation are to provide opportunity for a range of housing options in proximity to services and transit. Within the city plan, 156th Street Northwest is designated as a secondary corridor, which is intended to be between one to three blocks wide, with a typical massing of low and medium uh, and mid-rise buildings. The RA7 zone meets the objectives of the city plan by facilitating mixed-use development near frequent transit. Next slide, please. 
The scale of the proposed RA7 zone is compatible with lower intensity residential forms, such as single detached houses, the RF1 zone. The proposed RA7 zone also introduces a potential for some limited non-residential uses to the site, such as childcare services, health, uh, health services, and specialty food services. Next slide, please. Administration sought feedback through a variety of feedback types, and minimal feedback was initially received based on the advance notice that was sent in early February. Additional comments were received several months later that expressed concern about the scale, parking availability, and safety aspects of the proposal. Next slide, please. Overall, this proposal aligns with the objectives outlined in the City Plan, and administration is in support of this application because it provides the opportunity for housing diversity in the Glenwood neighborhood, proposes appropriately scaled development near future LRT that is still sensitive to the built form, and it aligns with the direction for future development within the 156th Street Secondary Corridor as directed by City Plan. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'll go to members of the public at this time in favor. Uh, Erfrey Taman, are you joining us remotely? Erfrey, are you, we see you there. Do you have a presentation to make? You are muted. Uh, can you unmute yourself, please? Oh, we lost Mr. Tamon. He may have been having technical difficulties. And can we give him a minute to sign, sign back? Yes, for sure. We are having the office of the city clerk reach out to the speaker as well.
Mr. Chair, the, sorry, Mr. Mayor, the speaker is going to try and log on again. Is he okay? Yeah, so we should expect him, expect them shortly. Okay. And he is going to try via phone, so we will see a phone number. Yeah, okay. He's okay. So any luck, Madam Clerk? So I think, Mr. Mayor, um, if you'd like, I think there's a couple of options while we wait for this uh, fellow to get online. I think you can, at your discretion, move to the speakers in opposition first, hear from them, and then flip back to those in favor. Or alternately, we could put a pin in this one, move to the next item, and come back to this, giving a little bit more time. So I think those are some of the options to move this along. Well, why don't we go to the... Uh, uh, but I think, I think the um, people who are opposed may want to hear what uh, the proponent has to say, right? So why don't we park this item and then go to the next item? Sorry. Uh, yeah, we, we'll get back to you. Don't worry. We, may, uh, we just got to uh, find out. So are you okay without uh, going ahead, without hearing the presentation from the... Oh, we do have the speaker on, I believe. We got it? Okay, good. Okay. Mr. Tamar, are you there? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we uh, can. So, so my apologies, guys. For some reason, my computer has this problem. But anyway, uh, I was just presenting, and I, uh, my apology, I, I couldn't see yeah, what's, what's on the screen. But if you can just put it in, the, the first slide... Uh, it shows the uh, the existing context. The next slide. Uh, okay, let me see. The next slide is the, the uh, uh, for my uh, memory. It's the UCRH. That's what's current uh, zoning regulation. Uh, next slide. Uh, the proposed one is RA seven. And take note of the red uh, arrows. Uh, those are the entrance points uh, coming into the community. Uh, uh, next slide. Okay, the, uh, the next sli uh, slide should be uh, the uh, the sun shadow study of of the area uh, with the current uh, uh, location uh, right now. Uh, uh, the concern is the security coming into the uh, to the uh, neighborhood. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, on 2020, I lost my car parked in the uh, driveway in the middle of the day. Uh, next slide uh, should be the sun shadow studies, and uh, it will show that there will be uh, less impact on the adjacent uh, 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 adjacent lot as the uh, site is favorably uh, located on the south side of the property. This ends my uh, presentation, and uh, thanks for uh, having me. Thank you so much for your presentation. Any questions from council members to uh, Mr. Tomon? I see no questions to you, uh, Mr. Tomon. Thank you so much for your presentation.
And next. Okay. Thank you. Next, we will go to uh, uh, community members in opposition. First one is Jamie Post joining us remotely, and the second person is uh, Gary Rasich. Did I say it right? So please, could you please come up to the uh, uh, to by the chairs there in the front row? Uh, each of you will have five minutes to make your presentation, and after that, council members may have uh, questions to you. And sorry for, uh, you know, I know, I know you, oops, I know you've been waiting since uh, one thirty, and we have a number of items that we got to go through with the schedule. So it's sorry about that. Uh, we'll go to uh, Mr. Post first. Jamie Post, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes, we Thanks. can. All right, so I am here today as the president of the Glenwood Community League. This is a rare appearance by our league at a council meeting. Uh, while we do carefully scrutinize every rezoning in the community, most applications that come forward in recent years have been reasonable additions to the neighborhood. Uh, some of these uh, include three non-market multi-unit projects by JP Health and Wellness, multiple corner lot RF3s for four unit developments, often with four additional secondary suites, and several lots rezoned for low-rise apartments along 100th Ave. So when we come to you in opposition to a proposal, we trust you'll appreciate how particular we are in attaching the weight of the community league to that position. Now this application represents several things which frustrate uh, residents and community advocates to no end. It's another spot amendment to a recent ARP that's beginning to look more like the polka dot ARP then the Jasper Place area redevelopment plan as it becomes dotted with one-off amendments. Uh, in this case, with, with what we consider questionable support by city administration, uh, it's in an area where you know, we all want to attract residents and families, yet it sits between two elementary schools that were closed in recent years by the public school board without public comment from the city, leaving the largest school-aged population in this area of the West End to commute outside of the mature neighborhoods of Glenwood and West Jasper. The proposed rezoning is along a local residential street, not 156th Street. And the vision for 156th Street that uh, the development officer references in his report is one we feel the city should feel compelled to consult with the community on if a high density vision for an arterial road and transit corridor is being imported to the interior of the neighborhood. Uh, the development is not within 400 meters of a transit terminal as referenced by the development officer. At best, it's a 500 to 500 meter walk to the only transit stops that will be left along 156 following completion of the Valley Line. The DO lists alternative transit routes on 163, 95th Avenue and 100th Avenue. Uh, the development is at least an 870 meter walk to the nearest bus stop on 163. 560 meters to 95th Avenue and over a kilometer to the nearest remaining bus stop along 100th Avenue and about 630 meters to the JP Transit Terminal. The point being transit access in a mature neighborhood is sometimes not as accessible as you might think or is stated in a council report. The DO states that RA7 and RF1 are compatible land uses to seat next to each other without providing any examples. At one time when the MNO was you know, still a fairly new thing, the city considered 8.9 to 10 meters to be compatible heights for the interior of mature neighborhoods, not the 14.5 to 60 meters allowed under RA7. The city certainly considered this when it opposed an RA7 proposal on a nearby lot on the other side of Metal Art Christian School about a decade ago. The current urban character row housing zone on these lots allows for a significant development with the height capped at 12 meters and should be considered an acceptable compromise, not the inch that allows the developer to go and ask for an extra mile. As the zoning bylaw states, uh, urban character row housing is, quote, intended as a transition zone between low and higher density housing, end quote. It's the zone meant to buffer RF zones from higher density developments and as council, you can leave it in place here without sacrificing an increase in residential density or development potential. 
Uh, in closing, as we consider an amendment to the JP ARP, the ARP was a commitment the city made to the community as part of the Jasper Place Revitalization Strategy to provide some certainty and ordered development to our neighborhood and the surrounding neighborhoods. However, if it's going to be amended repeatedly on the whim of every developer and proposal that comes forward, quite honestly, we feel at this point it should be repealed and the cost to the city and the time of the community that went into it simply written off. Uh, thank you for your time and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Post. And next we will go to uh, Mr. Gary Rasic. Good afternoon, Mayor Sohi, so City Council. My family and I have lived in Glenwood since, it, my family was in the Glenwood since it was the town of Jasper Place. I moved there in 1981 and raised my family there. I was the president of the community league for 27 years before Jamie took over and continued to be involved with the league. I've seen the community go through many changes over the years, some good, some not so good. Many of us made Glenwood our home because it was a single family area with large lots, schools, and access to many amenities. Over the years, things have changed a lot. The schools have shut down, we saw our neighbor's homes get torn down and two skinny homes put in its place. We saw corner lots get three plexes, four plexes, and now eight plex units built on them. Garages being built three feet from the alley so no one can access them even if it was big enough to put a car into. All of these, all of these things have changed our community. Everyone knows the city's trying to promote density. The area redevelopment plan was even established for the neighborhood and the ARP was supposed to show us what to expect our community to look like in the future. We've accepted the increased density within our community, and with the infill alone, it pretty much doubles the density that now exists. This proposed redevelopment we're here to discuss was originally two RF1 lots. They were purchased and rezoned to urban character row housing, which would create even more density and fall within the ARP guidelines taken into account the vision for transit-oriented housing. This rezoning was applied for and approved without opposition. The community accepted the increased density and was prepared for row housing, which would follow. Timon Architect Architecture even has a photo on its website showing the 157th Street row housing with eight units on it. Now the increase to an RF7 is overdoing the allowable infill. Having a four-story building being built inside the community when there are only three-story apartments on 156th Street, which is the artillery road, is just a matter of greed by the developer to profit as much as possible with no regard to the neighborhood or its residents. A building like this does not fit or improve the neighborhood in any way. It just creates more revenue for a builder who is not invested in the community. I feel council should reject the application and leave what was originally proposed and accepted by the ARP, the community league, and the neighborhood. The residents of Glenwood are the ones that ha are living here and shouldn't be forced to move because of overbuilding in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I'll see if there are questions from uh, uh, council members. Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mayor Sohi, and, and thanks uh, to both of you for coming out. And um, Mr. Post, uh, I want to start with you because I, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that this is the first application um, that the Glenwood Community League has opposed since the approval of the ARP. I can't recall of another one since then. Can you? Uh, I cannot. I would say, yeah, in the seven years since it's passed, this is the uh, first one we've uh, had to take up an issue with. Okay. And so I want to ask a little bit more about that. I think you started touching on it a bit in your presentation, um, but but I wouldn't mind giving you a bit more time. You know, what what makes this one the one that you had to say, you know what, this is a, a bit too much for us because there have been other ones, and I think you touched on it, there have been other RA7s that have amended the ARP in the last seven years that you haven't opposed. But this was the, this is the first amendment that you are opposing. So what what makes this the one for you? Yeah, so I mean, I, I mentioned uh, another RA7 that came before you that amended the ARP, and that was along 100th Avenue, which is, you know, wide, major corridor. I mean, 
more or less a perfectly acceptable place for that type of development. Here you're taking a 156th Street development and putting it inside of the neighborhood. You're putting a six, potentially 16 meter building next to eight meter single family home next to it. Uh, you know, if this was one block to the east, I, we wouldn't be talking about this, but we are trying to shoehorn now a very large project into the interior of the neighborhood when the lot's already been rezoned for, you know, mm -hmm. a, a large development that would be stepped down to be, you know, far more compatible with the surrounding RF zone. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's just to me and to the community just an obvious attempt to overbuild on two interior lots in the community. Another question I, I have, and, and you, I, I know you more than, more than most follow pretty much everything civic related, uh, as you, I think, serve as the civics director as well as the president. Um, this, th we're doing district planning right now, uh, as after the approval of the city plan. Um, the city plan does look to go potentially even a bit further in certain places than, than the ARP went. Um, and, and I guess that's in part why you've accepted some of the, the pieces there. But I, I do want to ask this question uh, around, do you, have you been involved with some of those district planning conversations? And subsequently, do you see that there may need to be an opportunity, uh, a revisiting of, of the plan at some point to better align with some of the broader citywide plans that we have? Mm -hmm. You know, Glenwood is kind of in itself a very nice district just on its own. And if you didn't have to leave it for work, you could potentially live just entirely within West Jasper. And there's more than enough opportunity along Terra Losa and 100th Ave, 100th they have, Stony Plain Road, 156, the corners of 95th Ave to even bring in, you know, additional amenities, which will certainly happen. So. I mean, we've watched the district plan with interest, but it's one we kind of feel the community already meets and the new amenities that come in in appropriate locations are only going to make it better versus, I mean, trying to shoehorn some commercial uses into the interior of the neighborhood. Uh, you really, you're, you're, you're just creating far more issues than are worth it when there's so much potential surrounding the community. Yeah. Do you... Are, you know, and I guess the question is, is that, you know, appreciating your point, is there, is there a point at which we should have that conversation? And I'll, and I'll explain why I ask, because not too far away in my home neighborhood of Jasper Park, as you know, um, we did approve uh, a development just like this, same type of location, edge of a block, one block in. Um, now, we didn't, we don't have an ARP in my neighborhood, to be fair, and that's, and so we went to the city plan. And so, um, you know, the question is, if we are going to start looking at that in other neighborhoods, including my own, um, is that something we need to be able to engage? And, and I guess the question is, you know, I, I, you're here today saying, OK, no for this. But is there is there an openness and a willingness from the community to to think about that differently as we go forward? I would say definitely. The community has taken a very open mind of uh... A lot of projects, you know, for example, the JP Wellness projects, they're doing three in Glenwood. Uh, we know what happened when they tried to do one in Terwilliger Town, whereas Glenwood has been very progressive about accepting these things and, you know, would certainly be open to, you know, a conversation of what, you know, the future is going to look like. Right. I'm going to be out of time, uh, but uh, thank you. I really appreciate that. So, Mayor Sophie, thank you. Thank you, Constantine. Next, Constantine Stevenson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor, and uh, good to see you, Mr. Post. I know, uh, you know, we had the chance to to get to know each other during the the drafting of the Jasper Place Area Redevelopment Plan. So, so great to have the chance to reconnect. Um, you know, as someone who also spent a lot of time on this plan, I, I hear you know some of your frustrations with the the spot amendments, and I I think that's something I'll I'll be following up with um, with administration on. But I I do uh, I. I went back to the plan and, you know, we do have a section at the end of the ARP around amendments and monitoring. Um, and, you know, it talks about it's this document sending out a general direction and aspiration for the area, but it will be important to ensure that it, the ARP can evolve dynamically in the coming years. Um, and it even speaks to, you know, amendments being triggered by changes or updates maybe by policies, including the municipal development plan. So again, just recognizing that, that at the time this was written, we didn't have city plan in place. 
just wondering your thoughts on, on again, just yeah. ensuring the journey that that city-wide thing that can see with our new municipal development plan. Well, when the plan was written, the previous uh, MDP was already in place, was already pretty aspirational as far as what it wanted for infill and density. Uh, the LRT was certainly well. Constant Stevenson, well can you mute yourself? At that point. Jamie, just hold him for a minute. Constant, Constant Stevenson, can you mute yourself? Because there's a feedback coming here. Okay, good. Go ahead. Sorry. Go, go ahead, Jamie. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so when we when we went through the ARP development, I think we were all pretty cognizant of what the future was more or less going to look like, that uh, there was going to be an expectation for significant increases in density, that uh, these major corridors around the neighborhood were going to change quite substantially. Uh, you know, when it comes to the one-offs, I think nothing drives people battier more than thinking there's there's a plan in place and then well somebody wants to do something different and so we're just going to put a little dot on it because that's the spot where somebody wants to redevelop you know when we're looking at the you know 15 30 year sustainability of this plan i think we need to look at it in blocks of uh, you know if this if you know say an entire stretch along 156 if we aren't happy with the current designation if we're going to approve one-off amendments in there, then I think we need to be honest with the community and have a discussion of, do we change that entire stretch in the ARP? And is that necessary to meet the growth objectives of the city? I mean, I think we need to have a very honest discussion with the community about that. And I think we avoid that by just doing a one-off and calling it a day. Yeah, and I, I certainly agree with you there. Um, and, you know, again, the ARP was really only intended for, you know, the medium term, uh, you know, 15 to 20 years. Uh, and again, recognizing that there has been that significant shift. Also just wondering as well, I mean, I think something else that has changed since the ARP was written was our some changes to the RA7 zone itself that, that require that ground oriented units on the, on the ground floor. Uh, which again, I think I I think is sort of consistent with with that overall desire for that build form in terms of having the street level interaction. Just any thoughts on that as well? I I honestly don't think community would make much uh, would see much of a difference between you know whether ground unit is you know basement suite or whether it's it's you know directly at ground level. I typically don't think people pay that kind of attention to the development. I think people mostly look at the more obvious impacts, the size of it, the scope of it, what additional uses are attached to it, uh, how it compares to in, in size and height to the property next to it. Uh, and in this case, I think the property next to it, I believe is a group home uh, and that's a bungalow. So, the, you know, they're, they're probably going to be there for a considerable amount of time. And I think too, we need to be, uh, cognizant of how uh, you know that that community that exists on that site is going to feel uh, next to whatever we allow to be developed here. Yeah, well, thanks for that. And I think I'll, I'll you know, I'll be asking administration just for a bit of clarity around, again, sort of the the difference in, in scale between RA7 and UCRA, but, but really appreciate you uh, sharing today and, you know, really do make your points around uh, the spot amendments and, and the need for some uh, greater clarity potentially. So thanks, thanks, thanks again. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. So that concludes the questions to uh, members of the public. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us and sharing your views. Uh, next, we will go to uh, our administration for uh, questions. Uh, please sign up, and I see Councillor Knack on the list. Councilor Nack, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Sohi, and, and thanks for the presentation on this. And, and um, you know, I, I'm, I'm conflicted on this one not, uh, because of some of what we've heard today. And, and, and so I guess I want to start with the la late last term, we went through and did a, a number of repeals. I think we repealed 80 plus plans um, that were clearly misaligned, I think would be a fair descriptor with our new plan with the city plan um that, that's right we it was about 80 or so that we got that we removed 
Um, it, they were repealed last June, but they were um, assessed based on their completion, their level of completion, not on their fit with city plan. Okay, okay. So that was maybe a, a I, I thought we'd also talked about that element to it. So, well, then uh, that is going to be my question. I, I am curious that, you know, this, this plan is one that I think has some alignment with city plan. And at the same time, clearly city plan does strive for, um, more than I think this plan has originally set out. Um, and what I'm curious about is as we move into this district planning, how do we take into account plans like this? We don't have many fairly modern plans, but this is one. And so how do we factor that in when we're comparing applications, when we're thinking about how it's gonna fit with our, our broader body of work and, and the engagement with the community? Councillor, uh this is uh, not a, a unique situation in terms of uh, our planning landscape. Uh, it may be unique in the fact that the, the plan is relatively recent, uh, but there are multiple areas across the city that have conflicting plans or plans that don't go as far as city plan. Uh, so in this case, uh, we look to that uh, hierarchy of statutory plans, uh, which is sort of planning speak as to which, which plan pulls the most weight. Uh, and right now that is uh, the city plan, which identifies this area as a secondary corridor, which uh, also identifies it as a low to medium rise or appropriate for low to medium rise. And when you look at the various secondary corridors across uh, the city that's been identified, uh, this is probably one of the ones that are our, our higher order secondary corridor and the fact that it has mm -hmm. a one and a half billion dollar LRT that's going to be running down it shortly. Uh, so oh. the the notion of what what plan would look uh, that we would use the most weight on and it is city plan, we would obviously look at the underlying ARP as well. Uh, but if there's con conflicts, uh, then the, the city plan does uh, take precedent. Fair enough. At first, I think you gave us a discount on the LRT, Mr. Pollock, which is wonderful. Uh, if you're building it, thank you. Uh, for That's that the stage, stage one. Oh, okay, very good, very good. Um, so do we know, I'm trying, I, I was trying to go back in my mind. Uh, I think there have been at least three or four applications um, since the ARP was approved and probably in, even in the last three or four years uh, two RA7s, which have amended the ARP. Do we have a sense of how many times we've amended the ART, ARP, particularly within Glenwood? Uh, just running off memory, I think uh, yours is pretty close, around three to four, and uh, the majority have occurred around that Jasper Place LR, uh, transit station, um, yeah. around whether it was a, a CB1 to CB2 or an RA7 uh, around there. Yeah, some we've done, and we might have even done one RA8, if I recall correctly, um, uh, in the area, which which wasn't originally planned within the ARP. Um, so, and, I, and point your point's well taken, and actually, I was always surprised when I saw the city plan that 156th Street wasn't outlined as a primary corridor. Uh, the fact that it's a secondary corridor still, still is very confusing to me. Uh, considering the the BLRT and 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 so f a few questions. One, you know, is what what was sort of the thinking behind making that corridor a secondary corridor versus a primary corridor? I can take uh, an educated guess at that one. I don't think uh, any of the the city plan team is here, uh, but generally. Uh, when we're looking at primary corridors, those ones are connecting uh, those major nodes. Uh, so they're your, your high streets uh, that are connecting, uh, say, Bonnie Dune and University of Alberta, that is White Avenue. Um, so this one is, uh, although it's an LRT, uh, it isn't necessarily connecting some of those major nodes out there. And it's not currently uh, um, a, a very dense corridor in itself. Um, it does hold a lot of density around 156, uh, but beyond uh, those directly adjacent parcels, it, it hasn't expanded uh, to date, uh, which that secondary corridor would provide some direction to do that. Sorry, I'm Councillor out. Nack, you're out of time. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thanks very much. Just 
Yeah, I think picking up on on the comments around, you know, the challenges of spot spot amendments for these plans. And I suppose it's just a bit of a tricky situation right now as we, you know, anticipate district planning coming through and sort of another round of, of potentially re retiring plans that have been in effect and are maybe no longer consistent with city plan rather than, you know, doing that exercise of a, of a whole scale update to align the plan with city plan. Is that... Is that sort of the current state? That's correct, Councillor. So the current state is that we have uh, our draft district plans that are working its way through, uh, which will essentially uh, add the up-to-date or the, the layer that will be in alignment with the city plan. Uh, and any of the plans that are not in alignment uh, will likely be retired or relevant policy brought forward into the district plan and then that plan subsequently, subsequently retired as well. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I think just, just, you know, the order of magnitude of trying to, to update all of those plans, I think could be, could be quite considerable. Is that, is that right? Correct. Okay. Uh, and then just also, sorry, I think I'm echoing again, just on, um, on the built form of, of RA7 versus UCRH, and UCRH is already a fairly, you know, it's it's a 12 meter zone. Uh, that's, you know, typically a three, three story building. Um, it has ground oriented units. RA7 also will require that sort of ground oriented uh, row house feel with with residential, if there's residential on the, on the main floor. And again, just sort of like, one one story more is that is that correct in my understanding just in terms of the magnitude of change between those two zones that's correct and it actually states a little bit more contextually sensitive because it does have an increase in the setback as well oh like from the property to the south correct okay okay well that's that's a great flag um i appreciate those clarifications and uh have no further questions thank you Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. So that concludes the questions to administration. At this time, I will ask council members if they have any questions to uh, members of the public or to administration on new information arising from questions or what you heard. Questions on a new information. I see none. We are ready to close the pub, uh, the bylaw. Sure, Mr. Merrill. I uh, will close the public hearing here. Councillor Stevenson, um, and second by Councillor Salvador. Right. Yep. All right. So please vote to close the public hearing. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. And Mr. Merrill, Mr. Merrill, please read out item item three point twenty three. You have a bad connection, Councillor Stevenson, for a reason. I don't know what is going on there on your end. Can you try again? You're muted now. There I'll go. go. But, but first reading. First reading. Okay, Councillor Stevenson moved first reading. Second. Second by Councillor. Uh, Salvador, we have a first reading on the floor. People to speak, because, sorry, council members to speak. Uh, Councillor Knack. Thanks, Mayor Sohi. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't bring myself to move this because um, I'll go for a few reasons, you know, the Glenwood Community League, in my time on council, has never opposed any redevelopment application or rezoning application. And uh, in fact, this is the only community league of the four that actually supported the ARP with a clear letter of support. I remember chatting with Mr. Post at, at a uh, community league day event uh, the month before or one of these points and, and chatting about why they support this redevelopment plan for the area and the certainty uh, it would provide. And since approving the plan, as mentioned, there have been a number of applications that have come forward before this council that have amended the ARP in this community, and they have not uh, opposed it uh, and because I think it was the right thing to do, even though it was spot 
rezoning amendments. So I take it very seriously when, uh, in fact, Mr. Post comes uh, because he, he doesn't do that lightly and the community league specifically doesn't do that lightly. And uh, for them, they, they have concerns with this particular change at this particular time. And, and when we first approved the ARP, um, I will say I never felt that it had to be a, a document that never changed because I think that was that would have set up unrealistic expectations. And in fact, I think I said that when we approved it in 2015, that this would not just remain stagnant, that it needed to evolve. And I'm glad to see there have been changes over time. And I think that's the right thing to do. Where I struggle is that I, from a city plan perspective, it probably does make sense to make this change. And uh, we have made changes like this in a number of communities, including my own community, uh, that I have supported and uh, will likely con to continue to support, generally speaking, going forward. Where I am holding, where I'm struggling right now is that um, for a community that has been so willing to work together on development in their neighborhood. They have seen the reasons why we've needed to do this. Um, I would tend to actually prefer to wait until we have finished the district planning work for a community that has been reasonable and that has a fairly modern plan, not a, not a perfectly modern plan, but a fairly modern plan that I think um, is worth keeping intact until we've finished that body of work. And I realize this is a little out of ordinary because, I mean, I think uh, in the long term, this is likely a change that would make sense because we're making that type of change in other locations. But I do see value in making sure we are working with the community on what that future looks like. Um, I'll offer one other piece is that, you know, there was a very contentious public hearing in this neighborhood uh, about a year, uh, two years ago. Uh, not too far away from here that uh, about 200 residents signed a, a petition and, and uh, they don't love me very much anymore along that two block stretch uh, because we rezoned to a fourplex, uh, which was within the plan. And the community league didn't oppose that, even though there was, a, there was a large collection of residents that were there. And I supported that change because, again, it aligned with the plan. I think overall, this community, like almost every mature neighborhood in this area, needs to continue to go through an evolution. I don't think we should be relegating apartment buildings to the edges of communities uh, exclusively. I think folks who live in apartments uh, <laughs> like myself uh, do want the opportunity over time to also live interior to a community. Um, and, and I generally think that this is a community that, that would be willing to, to work together on what that looks like through that next phase of work. And so I, I in this case, will side with the request of the community um, and not support this. I think it would be preferable to wait to complete the district planning work for this neighborhood uh, and, and make sure that we have brought folks along the way for this particular piece where we had a plan that was really well designed. And I, I'll give a lot of credit to Councillor Stevenson at the time for designing something that I thought was really forward thinking and pushed a lot of communities outside of their comfort zone uh, into a very positive way going forward. So I think over time, we might need to do approve things like this. I would prefer to wait uh, for the next year to finish that work and work with the community on what a modernized version looked like, uh, particularly on a corridor like this. And I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Neck. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Ms. Schreier. And, and thank you, Councillor Neck, for your thoughtful uh, words. Um, I'm going to disagree a little bit, uh, but uh, um, what you said makes a lot of sense to me. I guess the way I'm looking at it is that even after that thoughtful look, um, it's going to be developments like this that uh, are going to end up being approved and, and being the uh, uh, the way that uh, this community develops. I, I've said it before. Uh, many times I'll say it again, I live in a neighborhood that is very much mixed residential. We've got uh, all sorts of different kinds of uh, uh, builds. We've got zero lot lines. We've got big family homes. We've got cul-de-sacs. We've got apartment buildings. We've got four plexes all together and it works. It works. Uh, so 
when I hear about these concerns, you know, I just look out my front door and I'm like, well, I, I don't see it. I, I understand where people are coming from, but I don't see it when it's when you see it in reality how it plays out. It actually functions. So, I, I, well, I do take the point, uh, and it is a well-made point that uh, we should be developing something, get sort of a more perfect plan. Um, I think that that can happen anyway. But in the meantime, we should not let perfect get in the way of good. And uh, because I do believe that this is the way things would develop anyway, and especially in a neighborhood that could use a little more density, um, I will be uh, voting yes. So thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Jans. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I also will be speaking and voting in favor. I think it's important to remember that every single decision we make is a climate decision. And when I look at the proposal here and the opportunity to have a couple more humans li living a couple more meters away from a future LRT, transit accessible opportunities, uh, this is, I think we're gonna see more and more of this. There's a school that uh, is close by. When we hear over and over that we want to grow up, not out, that we wanna stop urban sprawl, that we wanna see transit oriented development. I mean, are these talking points or are these things that we, we are truly going to believe and live out? I look around out my window at Garneau and um, previous city council put a uh, seven story, six story, seven story um, in the middle of a block. There's also a 22 story going in across the street in addition to another 22 story and 24 story. Like it, it's just unfair to keep putting density into certain neighborhoods and then to privilege others without it. So I think it's it's important to, to look here at, you know, we have a housing affordability problem. We have a climate change problem. We have a climate emergency. And um, yes, uh, this this may provide an opportunity for a builder to make a little more money, but I'd be a hypocrite if I said I built my apartment myself. I'm living in an apartment that was built by a builder. And I think many of us on this call uh, may also live in properties built by builders. And at the end of the day, I think unless we're going to be advocating for the wholesale overthrow of private property in the capitalist system, which I'm not, um, I think we uh, I think we need to, to sit back and look at this and what are our city plan objectives here? What are we trying to accomplish? And um, the opportunity that I could maybe buy a unit in this complex and make a place to call home and see other future homes come up along this line. You know, we spent as taxpayers billions of dollars on the LRT system, and this is a this is a golden opportunity. So, yeah, change is scary. Change is difficult. This is this is a, a not a not ideal growing pain for us, but. Um, as a city, I think about, I was looking at that map and think about what this neighborhood's going to look like 50 years from now. So my five-year-old, if in 15 years, um, he wants to rent somewhere. He wants to live somewhere. What are the housing opportunities going to be in the West Jasper Place area? What do we think that neighborhood's going to look like? What do we think the summers are going to be like in the climate emergency? What are we going to be doing for transit? These are the questions we have to be looking at. And I'd be a hypocrite if I if I didn't support this. So um, thank you for, for hearing me out. And I, I appreciate the awkward position the ward councillor's in, um, but I would encourage my colleagues to support this. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Uh, anyone else to speak? If not, Councillor Knack, can you take the chair, please, before I go to Councillor Stevenson? I've got the chair, thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I want to take a moment to uh, thank the community for really embracing change and uh, and working to encourage more infill and uh, you know, listening to Councilor Knack about the community not opposing uh, any of the uh, up zonings in the, uh, in the neighborhood really speaks to uh, their willingness to, uh, to change as, as our our city changes. I think really want to appreciate that. I think we all need to appreciate that kind of a willingness to uh, to embrace that change, right? But change will continue, and uh, as we as we move forward, and uh, you know, good point on the LRT and uh, and encouraging more density in those 
those corridors around those corridors is something that uh, is evolution of the change that community has embraced. So I hope that they won't see this as a, as a negation of, uh, of their commitment uh, if, uh, if council approves this uh, application. And uh, I hope they will see that uh, we got a more to do on that, uh, on, the, on, on the change that is required on many fronts for many reasons from uh, you know, encouraging more affordability and encouraging better use of the land with an existing neighborhoods, encouraging the use of the existing infrastructure so we don't have to continue to invest more in the, uh, in the infrastructure and more uptake in property taxes because of that infill happening and the utilization of the LRT and the investment that we are making. So, uh, so this is a continuation of change and, uh, and, and, I, and I hope that uh, uh, community will see, see this in, in, in that way and, uh, and continue to work with uh, with ward councilor, with city administration, with council, uh, uh, as we as we build a better city for all of us. So please do know that we deeply appreciate you uh, and all the work and how you have worked with the uh, with city on that. And uh, but I will I'm going to support this because this is continuous change that we need to continue to embrace. Uh, and I'll go to councilor Stevenson to close. I'll return the chair. Yeah. Yes. Thanks very much. I hope. My sound is improved on a new device. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you so much to to everyone who spoke today and, and for the reflections from my my colleagues. Uh, it's interesting having you know been part of this planning process, and it it really highlights the tension that we we create when we develop plans for our community. Um, you know, often those plans are seen as uh, you know what will happen, um, you know, a certainty in what, what the future holds. When really, I think the most important thing our planning process needs to do is to, to get people comfortable with change and a recognition that our communities are dynamic, our, the conditions of our uh, world are dynamic, that we need to be responsive um, and be comfortable with that, that change as we move forward, which doesn't mean that we're not making decisions with intention and with foresight, um, but that it also needs to be to be dynamic. So I appreciate, you know, concerns around process in terms of this spot amendment uh, for this plan preceding some of the work happening through district planning. Uh, but for me, what's really important is that, again, the district planning process won't be relitigating city plan and city plan clearly talks about having this type of development, uh, I think one to, to two or three blocks into the neighborhoods, but certainly within one block uh, from, from the secondary corridor. Uh, you know, as was mentioned earlier, this is, you know, a secondary corridor plus given, given the access to the new LRT system. Uh, so for those reasons, I, I do think it's important to, to support this. I'm committed to city plan, committed to that future um, and committed to the urgency of, of achieving that vision, as was mentioned, in terms of our climate sustainability, our housing affordability, and supporting the public investment that we're making through LRT. Um, it's, it's not ideal. These changes are hard. Um, and I'm hopeful that, you know, as we continue going through the, the district planning process, that it's a great opportunity to do that storytelling as a community, to talk about what change looks like in our community so that we can continue to have uh, people prepared for that. And again, I think that process and that conversation, that's certainly what I found going through the Jasper Place Area Redevelopment Plan was it was the process of connecting, um, learning why change is important, having those tough conversations as a community that, that are the true value of a planning process rather than the end product. So really looking forward to that happening through district planning and, uh, and as we move forward. So I encourage my colleagues to support this and thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Please vote. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Stevenson. Sorry, I'll move second reading of uh, 
bylaw 20103 and charter bylaw 20104. Uh, second reading. Second. Second by Councillor Salvador. Please vote. We have all the votes. Uh, display the vote, please. That is carried. Mr. Merrill, read, uh, moves consideration of third reading. Second. Second by Council Salvador. Please vote for the consideration of third reading. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 20103 and charter bylaw 20104. Second. Second by Councillor Hamilton. Please vote for the final readings. Sorry, solve that, Councillor. What did I say? Oh, call. We have all the votes. <laughs> Okay, thank you, please. Uh, here you go. Uh, that is carried. Thank you, everyone. Okay. So that deals with 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.89, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.89, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99, 3.99,
Should we move to extend orders then to finish yeah, the agenda? Yeah, please do. Can you do that, Councillor Nack? I'm happy to move move that, that we finish the agenda. Second. Second by Councillor uh, Cartmel. Please vote. We're just waiting on one vote. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, have, display the votes, please. We have all the votes. That is carried. I didn't vote against it. I voted. Oh, Councillor Dang voted against it. Okay. <laughs> okay, 3.15 then. Uh, is there a presentation? Go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, who, just hold on. Who exempted? This is exempted by. Councillor Rice. Councillor Rice, you need uh, a presentation? I can go to question directly. Questions, okay. So let me see. There is a, a member of public in favor, Harman Deep Singh. Harman Deep, are you there? Do you have uh, any questions to Harman Deep Singh, Councillor Rice? Uh, yes. Okay. okay. Um, Mr. Singh, are you there? Harmandeep? Is it? No. The email address that we see on Google is Gobinderjeet Singh. Uh, the name, 315. Oh, yes. I see him there. There. Yes. Is it, is it uh, Harmandeep Singh or is it uh, Gobinderjeet Singh? This is Govinder Ji Singh. Okay, Govinder Ji Singh. Okay. Uh, did you register to speak? Answer question. Answer question. Um, I did. Okay. My, my uh, property was 3.17, not 3.15. I'm sorry, which, which, which one is it? 3.17 or 3.18. Okay, those were already approved. Okay, then uh, thank you so much, sir. Okay, all right, thank you so Sorry to make you wait, sorry. No, no worries, sir, thank you. Uh, good, okay. And so there's no one from the public. Okay, I ask Yeah, please go to administration, Councillor Rice, go ahead. Uh, just a very quick uh, few questions. Uh, the first question, and this change from CNC to CB1, I understand is additional uh, commercial use for the, for the building. What is specific significant change or the purpose for this rezoning? To allow for a larger range of uses in this location. Uh, is there any specific... Uh, um, like target to add specific stores? Uh, I'm not aware of it, any specific okay. target. And and because uh, from the reporting and, and then the concern come is about the cannabis store. And so is that indicated very clear and for that use or? We, in the report, we list the potential for cannabis, yes. So, okay. uh, Councillor Rice, there are a few different uses that yeah. are prohibited in CNC but are permitted in CB1. So, this includes business support services, cannabis retail sales, uh, equipment rentals, household repair services, and supportive housing. Yeah, I have that information in front of me. I just want to, uh, to get a clear understanding is there specific intention for the cannabis store to be added. This, when we see a CNC to CB1, it is often the applicant's intention to introduce a cannabis use. Okay, thank you for that. <clears throat> Second question. Um, so from, <clears throat> from surrounding area, and in this specific this site, the east side and the west side already have the commercial building. Um, is any con uh, cannabis store or right in these two commercial buildings? There is no cannabis retail sales at this point in time that would be within the separation distance that's required as part of the zoning bylaw. Um, I, <clears throat> I know there's 
uh, separation distance applied in place, but I, my question is, do, are there any other existing cannabis store in this east and west side and commercial building? From what I can tell in the, at the file, where we've done a separation distance, there appears to be cannabis retail sales in the Bonnie Dune Mall. Okay, so also that- the, uh, the rest of the strip mall uh, yeah. is still zone CNC, which would not allow cannabis retail. And so there isn't any cannabis retail in the ex existing east and west portions of the commercial retail. Uh, so east and west portion, and then we, we don't have any existing cannabis store. Correct. Okay, so this will be only one in that area. Sorry, I didn't realize you were talking about the strip mall yeah. itself. Yes. Uh, is there any daycare uh, and in the in those uh, commercial building east and west side, and also this building as well? Councillor Rice, um, we don't look to see if there is daycare. It's not um, something that we regulate in terms of the separation distance. Uh, okay, uh, so we don't have that information. We don't know if there are daycare and in those commercial buildings. We don't know. Okay, so that is my question. At all my questions, but if Mr. Mayor, you are allow me, and then I can speak. Yes, yes. We we'll just let me uh, go. Just go through the process. I'll come back to. Okay. Yeah, I'll just come back to you, Councillor. Because right? I saw I still have over two. Minutes. Yeah, you want to. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so anyone else has any questions to uh, admin? And any questions out of new? Uh, any information arising out of questions? New information. Seeing uh, none, uh, can someone move to I'll close? Move closure the of the public hearing, Mr. Mayor. Call Councillor Salvador, move to close second. Second. Councillor sec sec Councillor Wright seconded it. Okay, so please vote uh, to close the public hearing. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Salvador. Um, I'll move first reading of uh, Charter Bylaw 20162. Second. Second by Councillor Wright. We have our first reading on the floor. Anyone to speak? Uh, Councillor Rice to speak? Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I do support and also believe uh, the commercial development is very important for our cities. And then specific to support our cities, 15 minutes community uh, vision, and also to uh, support uh, other type of business and economy development. But my struggling and uh, is here, and is based on what I heard since campaign and for council. Um, how those cannabis store in our community. And then because of recognition right now, and it is allowed uh, cannabis store and in our community and without uh, the separate distance from daycares. Uh, yes, we do have the separate uh, distance and from schools and from pre grants but no regulation in place right now for our city to separate those type of stores with daycares. And then the another factor here is the community in the community in the neighborhood, we get more and more these type of stores. And I do heard lots of concern from our residents and in terms of their, from parents. And then I, I still, I, I said this, before and right now today, I repeat this one more time. I still remember I talked to the mother, the mother cry. I cannot forget her eye and how the impact to her daughter. And then plus this separation distance is not set and then between the daycare and then cannabis store. And for this type of reasons, it's very difficult for me to support this type of bylaw. Uh, so I hope and my colleague understand my decision. But like I said earlier, I understand this is 
under support and from administration. I appreciate administration's work, and also I appreciate and <clears throat> this opportunity to allow and this type of store and development in place. Uh, but I need to stand the value I believe. I also I need to stand up for what I heard for our Edmontonians. So I will not support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, Councillor Nack. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Sohi. And, and I wanted to speak, and I and, and I really appreciate you know the comments of our of, of my colleague. And I guess the, the one thing I would share and and for consideration is that um, you know if if there are actual impacts of being too close. I think we need to have that data, right? Because I haven't been presented anything that has ever suggested since cannabis stores have been come into existence that there's actually a negative impact on communities. I think there's a perception from, from individuals that, and that's why if, if, when we first approved this, we still maintained a separation distance, honestly, because there was a lot of uncertainty. There were a lot of community members saying, what does this mean for my neighborhood? You know, can we can we ease ourselves into a change? And um, you know, we're now a number of years in, and, and you know, I have a cannabis store that's just like a block away from where I live, uh, and I think we've heard from a number of people who who actually now have this use beside them, and we actually haven't seen the negative consequences that I think we all potentially feared, or and maybe many people feared, um, and so. I think it's always worth talking about that, but I think if we're going to um, make changes, we need to make it based off good evidence that shows here is the clear impact of these decisions. Because uh, you know, going back onto the liquor store separation distance, which was put in well before my time, I think in hindsight, you know, again, it hasn't actually solved the problems that existed in those communities, and so I think a separation distance is rarely a useful tool to actually addressing whether it's what, what might be perceived as safety concerns or health concerns. There are other ways to deal with that that aren't actually through the zoning bylaws. So that's why I've been supporting these for so long. And while I appreciate there's the, the, the other perspective, I think um, what, what I would ask for is if there's some evidence that says this is in fact uh, creating a negative circumstance, I'd really like to see that because until I see that, uh, and nothing's been presented today. I think we 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 should continue to follow our zoning bylaw on this, and continue to support applications that aren't um, that don't actually Im negatively impact neighborhoods. So, just wanted to offer that as a as a, another perspective on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nat. Councillor Tang. Yeah, um, very much agree with what Councillor Nat had already mentioned. Um, I mean, we can say similar things when it comes to liquor stores or convenience stores, 7-Elevens, uh, gas stations. Um, and I don't think the evidence has really a, a, amounted to much. Um, but I guess, um, I mean, I think the issue of cannabis comes up a lot. Uh, and, I, and this actually triggers something for me. I've, I've actually listened to the whole series of Making Spaces. Uh, which is a podcast that the city of Edmonton has produced just to educate Edmontonians around planning. Um, and one of the last episodes I thought was particularly um, left a really important uh, mark for me that, you know, historically we use zoning for all kinds of uh, redlining and segregation based on whether it's race or socioeconomic status. Um, and in that particular episode, I think it was about laundromats. And... Uh, you know, operated largely by Chinese immigrants at the time. Um, and it was the values of the day that dictated how much, um, how we operate, zone, we use zoning to really segregate certain people and certain types of businesses out of neighborhoods. And I think we have to be really careful when we start to, um, I guess, make decisions uh, that don't necessarily have the evidence backing. Uh, certain causations to crime and 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 and, and whatnot, and now that that is a caution I will I, I I will put here because I don't want us to go back to the trend where we're using zoning to to segregate, and instead I think zoning should be used as a tool to facilitate. Um, 
And that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Jans. Yeah, I wanted to echo kind of what Councillor Tang was saying. And um, I'm struggling with it feels racist and it feels classist when we stigmatize certain drugs, substances, organizations, people. And I'm wondering if that is contrary to the scope of a public hearing. And I'm wondering if this, if these policies may even hold up legally if they are, and I imagine this will be dealt with soon anyway by changes to uh, the five-year review on cannabis and others, but I think we can't forget that there's still lives and families that are ruined because of some folks who have criminal records because of cannabis that have yet to be expunged and yet to be dealt with. So um, I don't like the, some of the, 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 the direction that these debates could be going. And I think we need to have a separate conversation offline or about how we, how we address, how we address these things, not in particular to the public hearing, but if there's a broader issue at hand, because I don't see anything germane to this issue in this public debate right now with this item. Um, it, it's, it, it meets acceptable use. And I, so I support the recommendation of admin and so I, yeah, I'm, I'm just, it's, it is, it is not the, the first time that it's come up and I'm not sure the enormous cost to, uh, staff, business, the community and other, and, and in, in this, in this process. So I see administration has turned on their camera though. So I'm not sure if they want to jump in and comment. Can't we are in the speaking part of the body. Okay. Well, what I want to say is I support the recommendation and, um, yeah, we, we will review accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Jans, uh, Council Salvador to close. No. Okay. No. Okay. Good. All right. So please vote. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move second reading of uh, Charter Bylaw 20162. Second. Second by Councillor Wright. Please vote for the second reading. waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move consideration of third, third reading on Charter Bylaw 20162. Second. Please vote for the consideration of third reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'll move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 20162. Second. Second by Councillor Wright. Please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, so I am going to leave now. So, Councillor. Nack, over to you to chair. Thank you very much. Next up is item 3.16, the Dover Court item. We have a speaker in opposition, so we'll get the presentation. Good afternoon. This application is to rezone a site in the Dover Court neighborhood from the RF1 single detached residential zone to the RF3 small scale infill development zone. The purpose of the RS 
3 zone is to provide for a mix of small-scale housing for infill situations, which, if applied to this site, could result in up to four units of multi-unit housing in the form of row housing. Next slide, please. The site is located interior to the Dovercourt neighborhood at the corner of 141st Street and 124th A Avenue with roadways on three sides. The surrounding land use consists of one story um, single detached housing. The location is well suited for an increase in density. It has immediate access to a local park and is walking distance to three schools and transit to the south near the intersection of 142nd Street and 123rd Avenue. Next slide, please. Administration sought feedback from the public by mailing advance notices to surrounding residents, publishing information on the city's website, and posting on-site signage. We received 15 responses, with most in opposition to the application. We heard concerns that the RF3 zone allows for too much density, that it will increase traffic congestion, that row housing is out of character with the neighborhood and will attract renters. Administration recognizes that this rezoning application represents a change, and we understand that this has impacts on the ground and within the community. The potential, this potential change is the trade-off for achieving the city plan goals for welcoming more people into the developed areas of the city. Next slide, please. The proposed rezoning aligns with the goals and policies of the city plan, which encourages increased density at a variety of scales, intensities, and designs, and to have 50% of new units added through infill citywide. 83% of the available housing stock in Dover Court is in the form of single detached housing. By allowing RF3 zone in this location, we enable a model, modest increase in density that will provide greater housing choice within the community. Next slide, please. When comparing the current RF1 zone with the proposed RF3 zone, the key difference is an increase in density and there's a slight increase to the site coverage. To mitigate the impacts to neighboring properties, the RF3 zone requires a three meter interior side setback. RF3 has the same maximum height as the RF1 zone, and when combined with the increased uh, interior side setback, it would result in a building that remains sensitive in scale to the surrounding small scale residential buildings. Next slide, please. Administration supports this application as it allows for a row housing in a contextually sensitive manner. It provides additional housing diversity in the neighborhood and it aligns with the goals and policies of the city plan. Thank you very much. Um, we had had uh, Naraj Nath uh, who had registered in favor and I don't think we had confirmed their attendance at the time. I, I see them on the board here. I uh, just need to confirm, do you have a presentation or are you, are you registered for questions only, Mr. Nath? Hi, Nath, uh, not questions only. Questions only? Okay, great. So I'll, I'll first go to see if there's any members of council who have questions for Mr. Nath. So I'll just wait a moment um, to see if the board uh, highlights. Uh, I can probably just check with the ward councillor, uh, Councillor Rutherford, if she has any questions. No, okay, perfect. Then uh, not seeing anyone else, We'll move on to our speaker uh, in opposition, Mark Fuhrer. Um, please go ahead. You'll have five minutes. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. I hope everybody can hear me fine. Uh, Chairman Nack and esteemed city councillors, we, uh, Dover Court residents, we're all in favor of diversity in our neighborhood and that, but unfortunately, we're a bit concerned with the wording from the RF1 to the RF3 on the cards that were given to us. It says that development of greater residential density, including multi-unit housing containing up to five principal dwellings under certain conditions generally referred to as row housing. Row housing. Speaking with one of the city, uh, what's the fellow's name here? He is a city file planner, Jordan MacArthur. He said that there's a proposal of up to 10, possible 10 units on that site. With that, that's going to bring a lot of people that could be potentially 20 more people if we bring 10 to the site, 10 units to the site, two people per unit. 
that's potentially 20 more vehicles. There's not enough parking around in that neighborhood to begin with now. It's an older neighborhood established in the mid 50s. A lot of the garages in that area are only one stall garages. So most of the people are parking on the street now. We start to have friends, family come over. They're gonna be parking blocks away to try to, um, to come to visit us. With that in mind also for parking, we also have a uh, Canada Post Distribution Center just west of us on 124th Avenue. Quite a few of the employees also park in our neighborhood during the daytime and into the evening while they walk over to the deploying or the distribution center and away they go. Also with this, there's no transit in the area. I don't know where they're thinking that 123rd Avenue has transit. It does, mind you, but that's only peak hours from seven to nine in the morning and again in the afternoon. Other than that, there's no transit. The closest major transit area is St. Albert Trail, which is about six blocks away or 118th Avenue, which is also over six blocks away to get to these. So along with this, is there's, there's really no public transit in the area. Um, we also are, are very concerned about the noise in the area now, especially coming up with the Yellowhead. We've got Yellowhead construction that's going to be going on for two to three years, changing that around. To put in another big residential area in this house is going to give us another six to nine, maybe even 12 months of noise. That This is a quiet, mature neighborhood, and we're just kind of want to protect that and keep it a nice, quiet little neighborhood. I, I don't understand that for some of these developers that come in and want to put up big developments in small areas, when there's Blatchford Field, Blatchford Development is a mile and a half away and under 1% of that property is under or undeveloped right now, why isn't City Council moving to put more development into that area, especially for these infills? Put in the big row housing over there, put in the apartment blocks, things like that. Don't move them into the small communities where we're all jam packed in there anyway. We add more cars to this. We've got people speeding up and down the roads already as they use it as a cut through to go from 142nd Street to St. Albert Trail or vice versa because of the road closure at uh, Saint, uh, Yellowhead and 142nd Street. So I thank you for your time and the opportunity to be able to speak with you today. And I hope that we're able to come to an agreement where uh, you know we're, we're not going to be impacted with uh, a big row housing and potentially you know 20 more cars jammed into our area thank you very much thank you and now uh, we'll go to see if we have questions which we do from councillor rutherford please go ahead hello thank you mr oh. fear thank you for being here today um it was interesting, you're, it's not related to, when we're at the public hearing, it's really about the land use. There's a few things that twig to me that are separate from the land use, so I just wanna say, like, A, let's address those, because I remember talking about the Canada Post parking with the residents in 2019, and my understanding was that there was gonna be some solutions. So is my understanding that there's been no solutions to that as of yet? I still see when I come home from work in, in the afternoon that there's people walking across 142nd Street and heading into the neighborhood to get into their cars. So the so signage if, up there, if it's if it's being used, I, I have no idea. I don't think so, but. So if we were able to work and, and address that issue, that might alleviate some of the parking concerns on this development. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, again, I, I don't get out there and count all the vehicles that park over from, from Canada Post, whether it's three cars, whether it's 30 cars, I don't know, but the potential of having more parking in a tight neighborhood already where people are already parking on the roads because they only have one garage or one stall garage behind their house or they're not using their garages at all, it's just gonna add that much more parking around the neighborhood regardless of Canada Post being where they are or not. Okay, and then just to, to uh, highlight that Street Labs is a program that's actually a group of citizens within Dover Court are working with City of Edmonton on some of those traffic calming measures related to that. So we can follow up. I can give you more information on those. But focusing on the the public hearing, um, uh, the administration in their presentation highlighted that 83% of the dwellings in Dover Court are single detached homes. And so from a density 
perspective, that's pretty that's pretty low. Sure. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that too. So, are you also aware that a, like an RF three is the next step up to an RF one? So that it's like the least impactful density. That's uh, the information that I got from yeah. uh, the city uh, filing planner. Was he? He wasn't giving me a whole lot of information. One of the things we would like to have seen, perhaps, was was what was this development going to be all about prior to us sending out, you know, coming to council and voicing our concerns and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Is it going to be ten units? Is it going to be a duplex? They're going to put on there makes a big difference on on how we're going to come and, and present to the council. Yeah, and the challenge with the public hearings are are kind of very legal in how they're they're run, and we have to consider the maximum site usage. Uh, regardless of the intent of the developer. So I can absolutely ask that question, but we cannot hold weight to that in our decision. Um, from my understanding, I'll just confirm with legal. Um, you're correct, Councillor. Uh, properties can change hands, so you have to consider the full suite of development and uses. Yes, yeah, perfect. Um, I have some questions based on your presentation and, and admin's presentation for administration, but I really want to say how much I appreciate your time and, and please take me up on that offer to talk about these other concerns and see how we can mitigate those outside of the, the public hearing process. Would be happy to connect at any point. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate the time and thank you very much. Thank you. I don't see any other uh, questions for you. So uh, what we're going to do that next is move on to questions of our administration and I'll start with Councillor Rutherford. Um, please take it away. Yeah, I, I, I do want to get clarification on something because in the presentation you mentioned four units, but in the report and, and what uh, was mentioned by our public member here was five units as primary dwellings. Can you clarify that? Because it seems to be a bit of a discrepancy. Yeah, there is. So the report is more technical in nature. And when we're looking strictly at the regulations, we could, the, the dwelling units are based on site area. Um, so we have a certain lot, lot, lot size. We divide that by 150. It means they can have five principal dwelling units. What's realistic is more four. Um, and we know that the applicant's intention here is three. So, so if I'm understanding correctly, the RF3 zone could have up to five, but you also look at the lot itself in terms of the size of how many units are appropriate for that lot size. Is that, and so the four is kind of what's been determined by administration? The four would be realistic on this lot size. So the RF3 zone has regulations in place that are contextual and will respond to based on the uh, lot size. Okay. Uh, the, so the, they could have, let's say they have four primary, they can still have those uh, secondary suites or the, the garden they garage can. suites. And garden or garage. But these things all start, the, the reality of them start to diminish in terms of um, like what is the size of suite that you're offering, right? And what is the market available for that? But one of the things that I did notice as well is that... Um, in the report is even if it's an RF1, there can still be a duplex that could be the same massing as the RF3 and actually the setback would be less. Is that is my understanding correct? Like 1.5 meters as opposed to the the three meters? But the, even yes. The, yeah? Yeah, that's correct. That's why we show those models. Yeah, okay. <coughs> um, and they would be able to put a duplex on without any changes to zoning? Without subdividing, they'd be able to put a semi-detached. Yes, yeah, semi-detached. Yeah. Sorry, I know the duplex is not the... It's Rob okay. would not They're be impressed with me right now. Same difference from the outside. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, that, that, clarifies my, that, that clarifies my question. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do have one quick question just based on that. Uh, Councillor Jans, can you take the chair? So taken, so taken. Oh, oh, thank you, Councillor Jans. Just very quickly on that um, question of, of four or five units, I, I just want to be very clear. Even on a 150-foot deep lot, 
five would only be available uh, with a variance, I would imagine, right? So that you couldn't you couldn't do five without a variance on even 150 feet. Am I right on that? Yeah, that's likely because um, there's all the setbacks, the interior side setbacks, flanking side setbacks. By the time you tried to fit it on, you'd likely be seeking a variance. Yeah, because even at 17 feet wide per unit, uh, with this with the space for the garage, you wouldn't be able to do that. And then if there if that were to happen, that presents a separate opportunity for community members to. So if, if somebody wanted to try to do five. There would be a variance request. There would be notification to residents, and there would be a separate conversation about that, independent of this. Is that correct? That's right, as part of the development permit process. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions, Councillor Jans. I can take the chair back. That's given. Thank you. Uh, I don't see anyone else on the board for questions of administration. So, seeing none, what I'll do is I'll uh, put a call out for new information if there's questions to the speakers on new information. And I see Councillor Rutherford has clicked on the board. So go ahead, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, this question is just for the speaker in support of this motion. Um, can you confirm, are you, are you the applicant? Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, I am the applicant as well. And so, um, as I mentioned, it, you know, we, we don't, we, we have to consider the entire site coverage, but do you kind of have a vision or intent that you would be willing to share with the other uh, community member right now? Yeah, right now we're looking to do a three or four unit uh, primary dwellings, uh, potentially with basement suites. Uh, we wouldn't be approaching a garage suite for this. Okay, and how much? Would you still have detached garages though for those units? Yeah, there would be detached garages, yes. Okay, thank you very much. And so then uh, my question to Mr. Fear, does that, does that help um, in providing a bit more context uh, based on my questions to administration and to the applicant? Yeah, there's a little bit, there's a little bit more clearance in that now to, to hear the developer say three or four, a big difference between three or four onto that lot. But having the detached garages is, is is wonderful news. That's going to make up a little bit of the parking problem and that. But again, they still have guests and relatives and friends coming over and that. So it's still going to fill up our area around there. One other thing that I, I'm sorry, I did forget to mention on that is that the um, the office of the, the cow, whatever it was, I'm, I apologize, uh, from the city had said that there was a public hearing on this. We did get a notification of a public hearing. We went to Dover Court Community Hall for it. It turned out to be a public hearing on 142nd Street and Yellowhead Trail. Had nothing to do with this development whatsoever. We never got any other notifications about a, uh, a public hearing about this development. So we were kind of left in the dark about it from what the city, the city point of view. So I was a bit disappointed in that. Yeah, I, I was at that event. So sorry I didn't catch you in person at that event at Yellow for the Yellowhead Trail Freeway Conversion Program. That's where they uh, talked about the street labs too that I mentioned previously. Um, this is the public hearing for it. So the previous, I think what we're talking about is like previous engagement. This right now is the public hearing for this. So that's the notice that you would have received for this uh, right now, what we're in uh, at this moment. My apologies then, I thought one of the things was that we would meet at the community hall and because they had showed the card and in one of the presentation videos or uh, screens there that it was a, a public hearing about it. And I'm a bit disappointed. I didn't have any other people show up for this. I'm a bit disappointed in that too, but yeah. at least now we have some clarification and thank you very much for your concern. And we'll be in touch later on about, about parking for uh, the, the postal workers. And I absolutely hear the concerns of the residents on the traffic issues, especially with the Yellowhead construction. So do you know that's on my radar? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see anyone else on the board for questions uh, related to new information. And so this would be the appropriate time for a motion to uh, close the public hearing. So moved, oh, Jan. I'll, uh, I'll can go, if it's okay with Councillor Jan, so I can check with the ward counselor. Oh, please do. Excuse me. Withdrawn. Um, I'll move closure of public hearing. Second. Second. And I heard a second of, from Councillor Briquette. Any questions on that? Not seeing any. Please vote on closure of the public hearing.
we have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that is carried. Councillor Rutherford. I'll move first reading of uh, bylaw 20161, charter bylaw, sorry, 20161. Second. And I've heard a second by Councillor Paquette. Thank you. Uh, we'll wait to see if there's anyone wishing to speak to it. And uh, before I go to Councillor Rutherford to uh, provide closing comments, is there anyone else who wishes to speak to it? This is your chance. I'm not seeing anyone else on the board. So Councillor Rutherford, do you close? Yes, I just want to, you know, I think that through the dialogue we, we established a lot. But I do just want to again thank the, the public member for their time in being here today and, and for waiting and, and engaging in this conversation. Change in communities is not easy. This is the softest form of that change in terms of the zoning. Uh, but we do have a vision with city plan to, to densify and, and absolutely Dover Court is likely to see more density as, as we go forward. So I think that this uh, is a good reminder to me of some of the work I have to do with the mature neighborhoods in the ward that haven't necessarily densified yet in, in terms of having these conversations. So that's something I commit to as well. And I uh, absolutely will support this. It, it is in alignment with, with where we're going and I think it will be a great addition to the neighborhood. I know you mentioned in the, for the public speakers mentioned about not close to transit and I have many bones to pick with our transit system in the ward. But the one thing I think is really exciting is the shared use path that's actually gonna be created from 142nd Street all the way to Blatchford. And this unit would be very close to that shared use path. And so I think there is active modes or alternative modes to cars and vehicular traffic that these residents may find appealing as well. So I, I, for those reasons, I'm going to support this. And again, really appreciate everyone's time uh, in being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, please vote. We're waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that is carrying. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I will move second reading of Charter Bylaw 20104. Second. GG120161. Sorry. No problem. And that was seconded by Councillor Paquette. Please the, vote. The second one was seconded, yeah. Please vote. We're waiting on, we have all the votes. Thank you, please display the vote. And that is carried. Councillor Rutherford. I'll move consideration of third reading on Charter Bylaw 20161. Second. Thank you, and that's seconded by Councillor Paquette. Please vote for consideration. We have all the votes. Thank you, please display the vote. And that is carried, Councillor Rutherford. I'll move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 20161. Second. Thank you. Uh, that is seconded by Councillor Pett. Please vote on third and final reading. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that is carried unanimously. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. We still have one more item on the agenda today, if I have been following along correctly. And that would bring us to item 3.22, which is Charter Bylaw 19831, uh, the North Glenora item. And uh, we have speakers, so I would uh, ask for the presentation from administration. Sorry, just one moment, please. Thank you for your patience. This application is to rezone three sites in the North Glenora neighborhood from a DC2 site-specific development control provision to the RA7 low-rise apartment zone. The proposed RA7 zone would allow for a 16-meter high, or approximately four-story, 
residential building on each site with limited commercial opportunities at ground level, such as child care services, general retail stores, and specialty food services. Next slide, please. This application was previously considered by City Council on August 31st, 2021, public hearing where a motion was passed to carry out further engagement with the North Lenora Community and Community League to discuss the community's concerns. Next slide, please. In response to this motion, City Administration created an engaged Edmonton website to share information and receive feedback and also held an online moderated question and answer session where its city administration and the applicant shared information about the application and answered questions to participants. While there was moderate agreement that these sites were due to be redeveloped and some support for the intensity proposed, most participants had concerns related to parking and traffic impacts, the design and scale of the building, and they expressed the lack of trust in the developer's intent. Next slide, please. The three sites shown here in red are located with the interior of the North Glenora community. They are part of a partial ring of existing and planned multi-unit housing development that exists at many locations around the central open space that uh, contains Coronation School and the North Glenora Park. They have good access to transit with several bus stops adjacent to the site as well as Westmount Transit Center which is approximately 600 meters to the north. Next slide please. In 1993, the land was rezoned to the DC2 provision that exists now, and it allows for low-rise apartment buildings, though this zoning was never actioned with new construction. As such, the general intensity of low-rise uh, low apartments at this location is already approved by City Council in 1993, and this is not something that is being introduced by this application. In comparing these two zones, the main differences are the height, the density, and the number of buildings. Essentially, this zoning would allow for one more building on each site instead of two separate ones. Sorry, for one building on each site instead of two separate ones, one extra story of height, and a moderate increase to the number of units. The image on the right shows the drawing of the existing DC2, with the blue shading showing the general scale of the RA7 zone. So you can see the difference there in the height. Other changes include an introduction to the, of the open option parking through um, reverting to standard zoning, a relocation of the vehicle access from the main streets to the rear lanes, as well as adding a requirement for ground level dwellings. The introduction also, er, there's also an introduction of limited commercial opportunities at ground level. Next slide, please. Within the city plan, these sites are near the Westmount District Node with Westmount Mall and Westmount Transit Center nearby to the north. The city plan does not contain specific boundaries for the district nodes, but they're generally considered to be approximately 800 meters to a kilometer across, with the typical building scale anticipated to be mid-rise with some high-rise. This site's location on the interior of the neighborhood and the surrounding context make it more appropriate for a low-rise building. Next slide, please. These sites are already zoned to allow low-rise built form, and while the differences between the current and proposed zones are minimal, the proposed RA7 zone not only better allows the developer to redevelop these sites, but is preferred from an administration's perspective to meet the more contemporary expectations for street interface, parking, and vehicle access. The moderate increase in density is also in line with infill goals of the city plan, and as such, administration recommends approval of this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first, we're going to go to uh, the speaker in support, Mr. Uh, Rashina. Are you are you with us? Okay, oh, Councillor Councillor Nack, yes. Yes, thank you. Please, uh, you'll have five minutes. We'll go ahead. Uh, good after, uh, good evening, now uh, City Council. Uh, my name is Raj Duna, COO of Regency Developments. Uh, this is a these four lots in question is a site we purchased back in about 2016 2017 as a part of a larger parcel. Uh, Regency Developments is known for its in, uh, infill development and redevelopment of uh, old product, just like what you see um, on Glenoria patio townhomes. Uh, it's an H product, um, a lot of issues, and obviously the sooner we can have demolition, the better I think a lot of community members will feel. Uh, the first uh, image at the top there is one of the four lots that was approved from this DC2 to an RE7 in early 2021. Um, we never, uh, there was no opposition that day. Uh, it was unanimously passed. And so that's why we proceeded with the RA7 rezoning on these three lots uh, before you today. Um, 
you proceed with the RA7 option because a kitty corner to these three lots is about three blocks of a site that's also zoned RA7. It was zoned uh, several years ago, as my understanding. Um, so we felt it'd be a good match or fit to what was already set as a precedent. And uh, as administration mentioned in the report, we were really going from three stories to a four story and a modern increase in units and just modernizing the 1992-93 BCQ that was in place. Um, so that came along before us. Uh, this uh, rendering shows a site we're going to be starting to, that RA7 will be starting construction uh, hopefully later this month. We're going to start demolishing the first set of townhomes. And um, we're here trying to figure out the plans for the remaining lots uh, today. Uh, in August, as mentioned, um, a motion was made that uh, a further engagement was required. Uh, could I get the next slide, please? Um, so what we did uh, after August uh, 31st or late August, uh, about October 1st, uh, we sent out notifications to the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, it was a larger radius than city requirements, and uh, we sent it to all residents in the neighborhood and the community week of North Glenora. Uh, just the next slide there, please. Um, from that, the next two pages uh, show our follow-up response to some comments we got back. So about two weeks later, we responded with another letter, again, to a larger radius and North Glenar Community League uh, with additional context and uh, commentary around some of the questions we heard. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just, yeah, we're just trying to mention some of, you know, precedent of what Regency does for its projects and current projects and, and just speaking to affordability of our projects. Uh, next, uh, next one there, please. Um, so this is just a letter uh, that we sent um, on May 1st. Uh, so this was uh, prior to the public engagement, um, just providing a bit more information to the community again of what was coming forward. Uh, next slide. Uh, next one as well. And so yeah, just kind of continues. Uh, next one, please. Uh, so we started uh, engaging with the North Glenora Community League, uh, two members in particular, um, in October. And sort of, uh, just this is just kind of an example of some email threads that were sent back and forth uh, with some questions and answers and commentary. Uh, around November 16 is when um, the Community League wanted to try to arrange a community engagement session on their own. Uh, so things kind of sat quiet for a little while. and. Um, we heard back in about early February that because of COVID and other issues, uh, the community likely wasn't going to be able to get um, a community engagement session together on their end. Uh, so that's when we came back to city administration and a city admin run process for engagement was, uh, was undertaken. Uh, next slide. Uh, next one as well, please. Next one as well. Next one as well, please. And uh, yeah, so uh, one more, sorry. And one more. <laughs> I just want to provide some context to, as to the motion, really. Uh, next one, please. Um, so what I learned uh, really quickly after sending out the notifications was uh, it appeared we were dealing with uh, three, um, three different groups of residents, perhaps. Um, Got to know a really awesome resident in the neighborhood, Crystal Oko. Uh, at the time of the August uh, council hearing, she ended up representing over 50 residents that perhaps weren't related to the community league and the board itself. And then there was a community league itself. And then there was a group of residents that were just emailing us one off as well. Um, so we quickly realized there was possibly three groups. Um, Fortunately, uh, Crystal Oko and the group of residents she represents um, felt that we've done a really good job on the engagement since then. And uh, I believe this would be a, a kind of a support letter speaking to that effect. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next one as well. Um, so this is just an example of some communication we had um, with an existing tenant of ours uh, at the August Council. Uh, there seemed to be a gap in communication where our tenants perhaps weren't communicated as well as we would have liked. Uh, so this is just an example of us communicating with uh, some of our tenants and all yeah. notifications went to our tenants. As Sorry well. to cut you off, Mr. Duna. Uh, the five yeah. minutes has just hit. Sure. So I, you have to um, hold everyone to that. So uh, thank you, though. I appreciate that time. Um, I do have questions. So, Councillor Jans, are you available to take the chair?
Yep, sure am. Uh, thank you. Um, so, th uh, Mr. Tuna, thank, thank you. And I, I want to first start by saying I, I do really appreciate in your work with uh, Crystal in particular. I, I've copied on some of the emails uh, that she provided, and uh, and she she did feel really good about a lot of the engagement that's occurred. And so I, I want to recognize that because that was part of what um, why we sent this back. Um, uh, you were just starting to touch on it, and I know you're out of time, and, and so I, I do want to ask about this because um, I think the other group that, that's feeling still um, challenged are the tenants, uh, and I think we're about to hear from one of the speakers today. Um, I continue to hear from the tenants that feel like they're they they feel like they're being left out right now, and I think there's this this deep fear amongst you know this isn't technically affordable housing, but it's incredibly affordable because I mean some pay as little as nine hundred, some are around a thousand to thousand fifty, and there's nothing like that in this neighborhood. Um, and so where their fear comes in is that if this is approved, what is the ability for them? to have something affordable to move into? What does that transition look like? Because I, I don't think they've heard that answer yet. And I, I wanna give you some time to maybe respond to that. I think you were gonna to touch on that, but if you could take some time to, to hear. Sure, thank you for that, Councilor Neck. Um, <clears throat> uh, our history of infill development has meant we've always gone into a lot of uh, well-established neighborhoods, mature neighborhoods, and demolished a lot of product, just like the North Lenora patio homes. Um, so we've got a process in place where um, we've given, um, we try to relocate existing tenants within our own portfolio. We try to support them in various ways to relocate to other locations that may suit their needs better if we don't have something in our, in our portfolio. And um, just given what we know about the permitting process and, and, and such, we're able to give a long lead time on notifications. We're not talking about 60 days or anything like that. Uh, legally, I think there's a 60 day notification that's required to tell all tenants anyway. Uh, but our practice has been three, four, five, even six months notification, just so tenants have an understanding of what's coming, what to expect. Uh, so in that sense, um, for the actual construction portion, um, yeah, that's what we have. Uh, quickly to speak on the lot that's already been zoned RA7, slated for demolition. Uh, we actually moved tenants out of there about six to seven months ago, um, hoping things would go a lot faster. Unfortunately, COVID and a lot of other things hit. But we actually relocated several of those tenants into other townhomes within uh, Glenora Patio Homes. So a lot of those folks didn't actually end up leaving. That's 14 townhomes that we were able to accommodate residents. So I hope that speaks to what um, future residents might see. This is going to be a phased build out. So it's not like we're going to demolish the next 40 townhomes all in one shot. Uh, there'll be a phased element to it. So I think that will help alleviate some of those concerns. And really the whole purpose of the RA7 was to speak to the affordability. Um, in my presentation there, you would have seen some photos of a project we actually have right in the brewery district. It's a 10 and 11 story concrete building. Uh, we're renting units for as low as $1,000 a month there. And it's brand new hard you know minutes from downtown so uh we can do it we know how to do it and um we've come forward with a zoning that uh you know moderately increases above and beyond what the dc calls for but it's really a modernization of dc2 and largely a modernization of the parking which would have been a great hindrance to affordability um so we are proposing a 50 percent parking ratio probably at the end um but that's that's really what speaks to the affordability You're on mute, I think. Sorry, Councillor. I'm sure I am. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I, I sat through the virtual session that we had a couple months ago, and and I and I know there are some residents who don't want to see any change, but I think a lot understand that, like, the, the, what can be built there versus what's being proposed is a very minimal change. I mean, we're talking about a story on sites that nobody, when I was going through that neighborhood, said that they'd like to see those sites retain per se in the existing form because they know that they're sort of at end of life. Um, so it's not so much a debate about built form or parking. It, it's really the, the biggest piece, and I guess just the last piece, there's that notice perspective that you've talked about. What, what else can tenants of those buildings sort of assume, how, how, what does that actually look like in terms of direct and ongoing communication uh, and and 
a, a deliberate effort to make sure that they're not being kicked out into a space where they either have to move far away or spend way more money. Yeah, I think, um, you know, our property management plays a big role in that. And uh, like I said, given the permitting process, we know roughly from when we submit our drawings, there might be a eight to 12 month process to get the permits in place. That's kind of when we would likely initiate the process a couple of months later, um, as we kind of see how things are going to let the tenants know, uh, communicate with them and let them know what's coming, what to expect. And uh, like I said, we've, we've even gotten as far as providing monetary support for moving, if anything, within our own portfolio or the management's portfolio of other, other landlords they manage doesn't work. Uh, we've gone as far as providing monetary support to help uh, tenants relocate to, to an area that maybe suits their needs a little bit better. Um, but like I said, this is a phased development. So uh, naturally, we expect a lot of tenants will vacate as we start to give notifications to the, the few townhomes. But that provides an opportunity for existing tenants to maybe relocate to another existing townhome as new stuff comes online. And with the first um, development we're planning on starting this month, uh, we expect in about 12 to 14 months from now, that building will be complete. So there'll be 48 odd new units for tenants to relocate. That fits kind of a very similar MO of two bedrooms. We're replacing two bedroom townhomes with two bedroom functional units, ground floor walkouts with landscape yards. Uh, one, of the, one of the slides in my presentation showed kind of the landscaping that we have planned. So. Uh, we expect uh, that will kind of alleviate some of that pressure as well. So existing tenants can relocate there since our, our goal is affordability. Thank you. I'm well out of time, but I'll take back the chair and uh, go back to, or go to Councillor Paquette, who is on the board. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for coming, Mr. Uh, Dunn. I've got a quick question. I think uh, I, I, as far as the uh, the timeline of... of uh, of, of the build, you know, I'm just wondering if you have a plan for when you anticipate building or if this is just sort of, uh, you're not quite sure yet. Yeah, so uh, Councillor Paquette, um, like I said, uh, the first lot we rezoned to an RA7 successfully at Council, I think it was spring of 2021. Um, so we're about to start the demo roughly a year later. Um, that's always taken a lot longer for a lot of various reasons from lenders to supply chain to a lot of different things. Uh, but that's the, that's roughly the timeline we expect on the next lot. Uh, it's three separate lots, so we, we have to kind of phase it out naturally. Um, but there is one lot that's kind of the standalone on the corner. Uh, we anticipate kind of moving moving east and starting that one next. And uh, as, as new units come online, it, it just enhances our ability to finance the rest of the construction. So. I would say within within a year we could start the next lot, and I would say probably within two and a half years we finish off the remainder. Okay. Well, given given market conditions, I won't hold you to that. But uh, the the other question then would be like, so if council determines that this is an appropriate uh, uh, zoning change, do you anticipate coming back with more zoning changes, or would this be it? No, oh, I think. Um, for once, I came with a standard zone ask. <laughs> I think anybody knows that me and Regency uh, knows we've done a lot of DC2s over our careers. Um, but yeah, for once, I came with a standard zone because this is exactly what we need to make it work for, for all reasons and uh, affordability included. So yeah, no, I don't have any to come back to uh, ask for more. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, that I appreciate and it. Definitively, right. so, I, <laughs> I, I won't be coming back asking for more. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I don't see anyone else on the board uh, for questions, Mr. Duna. And so we can go next to Alicia Tennants. Uh, please go ahead. You'll have five minutes. Uh, okay, hi. Um, so first I'd love to say that it's lovely that he's spoken to Crystal, but I still haven't heard anything directly from him. Um, every communication has been through McCor. Um, it's also been just snippets of very snarky replies, uh, very rude replies. I don't appreciate the communication I have received from him at all. Um, in fact, in regards to the communication I have received, I do not, I still, I trust him even less. Um, so I just wanna say I'm not against the change in this community at all. Um, my big concern is Regency. I don't trust them. 
Um, I think that the best course of action for these units would be rather than just a blanket RA7, a different DC2 that holds Regency accountable to things like affordability, um, providing proper accommodations. Like there are other options for mixed housing. Um, for example, the two standalone sites could still have apartments with more stories on them. Um, and then there is a wonderful, I, I'm time limited, so I unfortunately can't touch on this very much, but there is a deep, deep um, LGBTQ history behind these buildings that has not been mentioned or touched on at all. Um, they were designed by two female uh, designers in the 50s. Um, I wish I could go more into it. I don't want to take up too much time, but there is a deep, rich history involved in this, and I know that that will not be preserved. Um, there is one unit for sure that is delegated that could be on the historic registry. And uh, one example, so an example of an alternate use of these sites would be to, yes, absolutely put some apartments in, but um, redevelop these and renew them and include townhouses, take away the parking lots and throw in another unit back there. Um, there are ways to still get the number of units that he's looking for without um, compromising townhouses. Now, the thing that I read, one of the things that I read in the city report is that North Lenora is lacking both apartments and townhouses. So it kind of confuses me as to why they would agree to take away something that's already lacking. There are no other townhouses in North Lenora. So I'm not entirely sure how taking away townhouses um, goes with the city plan. Um, I think renewal of some of the townhouses to preserve the history. Um, there are a number of grants available to the developer that he could utilize to restore them. There's a number of grants that he can utilize in regards to providing affordable housing. There are a number of grants available to him from the city, the provincial government, the federal government to look uh, to actually mitigate his costs. He has told me uh, the one snippet of email that I did get tells me that the, the reason he's not doing it is cost. Now, unfortunately, at some point, large developers need to be held accountable when they own a huge number of buildings. Housing is not a for, it should not be a for-profit thing. This is my home. Somebody is taking my home away. Sure, you can move me to another townhouse and then another townhouse and another townhouse. At the end of the day, you're taking my home. Developers don't care about renters. He's made that clear in his email saying that he loses money. Well, he has so many other buildings that he's making money on. At some point, large developers can stand to take a loss and work with the city to provide attainable, uh, suitable housing. Because yes, two bedroom apartment, cool, awesome. Right now I have a basement. That's not taken into account in the square footage. I have storage. That's a huge thing that apartments do not give. He doesn't care what we think. I want more community engagement. And I think a different DC2 that requires that is something that needs to be considered. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there are going to be questions, at least from me. Uh, so uh, if I can go to Councillor Jans to take the chair. That's taken. Thank you. Um, so Ms. Tennant, the, one of the challenges that we'll come up with, and, and I'll, we'll be talking about this with our administration, is, is uh, we can't take into account who the developer is. It's not a relevant land use consideration for us. Um, so, so I appreciate the point you've raised. I just I want to share that that who it is it wouldn't be relevant because ultimately we're deciding on the land use. With that said, I do want to ask as as so you are a tenant in the patio homes. Um, you've been living there, and and I do think it is fair because you've raised the point around engagement of of what what would that what would meaningful engagement look like to you? Because you know it was sent back to do more engagement. Um, as a tenant in the building, and as someone who probably knows a number of the neighbors there, 
what do you want to see if we were to send this back? What does that look like to you? Um, I would appreciate actual engagement from Mr. Uh, Duna instead of through the management company. Um, I, I still have yet to see any of this neighborhood engagement that he's promised. We received one email from Daniel after the August 31st, um, the last meeting. And the, la the first um, response that I received in regards to any of my questions and any of my things that I said to uh, Daniel to pass on to Mr. Duna, I got the response June 13th, and then I did not get another response until June 28th. So time, at a reasonable time frame, um, actually talking to tenants about what is needed, what is what is something they're looking for, um, telling somebody that they're give, being given the same square footage when that's not exactly the same, um, putting them into apartments when it might not be something that's suitable for the lifestyle. Like there's more engagement, like he's in the business of providing rentals. So I think that he should talk to his customers about what they're looking for and what's going to keep them. We have residents here. There's a gentleman named Paul. He's lived here for 54 years. I've lived here for three years. Crystal's lived here for 12 years. My neighbors have lived here for three years. Before he passed, uh, Len and his wife lived here for over 10 years. Connie next door to him lived here for at least five years. Um, I could go on about the long, long-term tenants he should maybe find out why we've stayed for so long and why we want to stay for so long and why this is such a concern to us and why we care. No, I appreciate that. Um, I, I did want to ask you, uh, because I have a bit of time, uh, to ask about the historic piece uh, that you were referencing a bit. Um, because that that is relevant a bit. I, I mean, I, and I guess we should start by saying I, I think most people would agree, and I'm guessing you would as well. A lot of those buildings are pretty much at a state of disrepair, and, and so likely you're not talking about trying to keep every single aspect of it, but trying to. What would you like to see when it comes to that historic component? Well, I mean. My my question, I mean, I guess my concern in regards to that is if they're in that much of a state of disrepair, why am I still allowed to live here? Because that seems very unsafe to me. There are definitely, like, I can tell you honestly, there is absolutely nothing wrong foundationally with my build, with my unit, with our stretch of units. There are some that are savable, um, which would be lovely. With, like in an ideal world, I would love to see that. Um, but the ladies who designed these, this is one of the first units that they designed and they were designed um, in particular to provide a place for the LGBTQ plus community to have somewhere where they could live as roommates, um, but not be roommates. Um, it was the 1950s, they didn't have a lot of options. So these were designed with that in mind. Um, they were, these lovely ladies, Woodbridge and Emory, they've designed a number of buildings in the city. They've donated a ton of land to the province. They have done a ton for the province and the city. Um, and I just really think, uh, so they, one of their um, students is actually an architect. I would imagine he would have some access to like say designs. These were built by Aldrich Homes, which is located like down the road from us, still in business. Um, it would be really cool to see work done with, in regards to that, like to reach out to Aldrich Homes or somebody um, in relation to the original architect and bring in their designs or bring in something just to bring some sort of honor to them. I don't feel the city. Um, kind of honors the LGBTQ history that we do have. I don't know a lot personally about any. Um, and I think it would be really cool to somehow be able to integrate that in this redevelopment and everything. Thank you. I, I am out of time. I'm, uh, so I'll take the chair back from Councillor Jans. And uh, thank you. And then I can go to Councillor Tang, who has questions as well. 
Thank you, Councillor Knack. Um, thank you so much, Alicia, for waiting to the bitter end to, to speak. I really appreciate your, and also educating this chamber about the Pride history in North Glenora. Uh, I did not know that before, and uh, it, it, was, it was fascinating, so thank you for that. Um, I guess I, I was curious a little bit about, so there, there was a, another RA7 that Mr. Duna had referenced that's just uh, north west to the to I think where where you are I am gathering I guess I'm wondering you know when that rezoning happened um, how did it impact you and, and and what makes this set of RA7 different for you um, I I didn't know that that was being rezoned when it happened um, as far as I know not many people in the community did know which is why it went pretty unopposed um, those, that site in particular is quite far from the, uh, these other units. Um, it is a standalone site. There is a block of, um, single family housing in between. So it is, I mean, I don't know that I would have had an issue with that in particularly anyway, um, because it is a standalone site. There is another building being built right beside it. Um, it, it does make sense for that site in particular. These units have, we have community, um, not only within the community itself, I've met a lot of the, um, I guess the single family home dwellers, um, but I know all my neighbors. Um, I know, I, I know so many people in the units. Um, we sit outside and we talk and we hang out. Um, when there's trouble going on, we all watch out for each other. And I don't know, it's just a really big sense of community. And I feel like that would be lost with the apartments. Um, we wouldn't have the same kind of sense of community. Um, you, it, It's just, it's different. I don't know anybody in the other apartments in the community at all. Um, there's just a, such a disconnect. You can't go, just go into them. Whereas I can walk to my neighbor's door. Um, and I understand there's ground units that are going to be involved in this, but these are all ground units. Yeah. And it's Great. a different community. Yeah, no, I, yeah, thank you for, thank you for clarifying that. Um, th that's all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Thank you. I don't see anyone else on the board for questions of Ms. Tennant. So uh, I think we'll then continue on to questions of administration and uh, I will uh, selfishly click on first uh, and turn the chair over to Councillor Jan so I can ask some questions. So taken. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Ms. Inkpin. I've, I've got a lot of legal questions around this. This is um, it, oftentimes when we have rezoning applications like this, we're talking about an empty lot. We're not talking about lots where, where people are living in these units. And I, I want to understand how much I can or can't be thinking about that when considering an application, because I can't really recall many times where we've had situations like this. So, Councillor, I think when you're um, you coming to your decision with respect to this this particular application or any application throughout the city, we have to remember that what you guys are making a decision about centers around the use of the land and not necessarily the people that are using the land. So that's why we say things like we don't zone for users, we zone for uses, um, or we don't worry about things like tenancy um, per se as a, as a relevant consideration. So, um, you know, I think you have a councillor hat and so you have, um, you, you do wear that at times when you are having these discussions, but when it comes to the land use decision, I think you have to stick to those land use considerations and not necessarily the people who are using the land. It's really, is it the right use of land and not users? What is potentially uh, a little different is we have some people who happen to live in those in those particular units right now who also have an opinion on what the use of the land should be. We've heard that today, a suggestion of a DC2, uh, whereas typically it's just the applicant. Now we have an app, we now we have residents who live in there. So so we can take into account their feelings on what that future land use should be and, and hold it with equal or similar weight to, to the applicant. Is that fair? Yeah, that's correct. I think the as you've pointed out, uh, the folks in opposition have brought forward something that they feel would be a better use of land, and you could consider that as part of your deliberation. 
the other sort of legal question I have is, is uh, of course, normally we, we don't talk about viability financially, um, but this is a direct control zone. And in the past, direct control have uh, referenced things like uh, affordable housing as, um, uh, or, you know, the community benefits I think about. And so I want to get a sense of, of how, if at all, I can think about that because one of the points that's come up from a lot of those residents is there's nothing anywhere close to this price in that neighborhood. And without it, they don't have a home in this community. And so am I allowed to think about that? So, Councillor, I think, um, just so I'm clear on your question, you're, you're sort of suggesting that currently it's a direct control zone and that direct control zone has certain amenity provisions within it that talk about community amenities or affordable housing units or things like that. And you're wondering to what degree can you consider that in your decision? Yeah, because I think we've heard a suggestion of, of maybe going to a direct control zone instead in part because I think there is a desire to capture built form a little bit more affordability a bit, which we couldn't capture in a standard zoning, of course. So can can that, is that a valid consideration when thinking about another DC? Well, I think it's valid to consider another DC in so far, in so far as there can be other community amenity contributions per se. Um, but we have to remember, Councillor, that you know, council doesn't control the affordability per se or the rent that a uh, developer can charge for that. For for any product that they put on the land. And so you have to, in terms of it being a relevant consideration, um, it's very difficult to nail it down because it's not something that we could legally put into zoning and, and say, oh, you now have to rent these units for a particular price or what have you. Um, so we do, you know, we do have the opportunity in direct control because that's a very specific tool. And so if you want to consider it um, in light of maybe a direct control is a better zone for this area, I think that's a fair consideration. But remembering that, you know, we don't set the price or, or you as council, so we don't set the price. Yeah, no, I pre appreciate that guidance. Uh, I think those are my legal questions. I've got a number of other questions to ask. Uh, and actually, I want to start with the the historical piece to that, because uh, it is a piece of new information that hadn't come up uh, in any of the engagement until the last few months. And have we looked into that? Do we have a sense of, of if anything would be on the inventory or, or potentially be identified for future placement on the inventory? Yes, one of the, the units in uh, Site B, the northernmost unit along 109A Street, uh, is on the inventory and the applicant has been made aware of that as well as the financial benefits um, of that uh, in the, in, with respect to rehabilitating the property and it is not something he would like to pursue. Okay, I'm out of time. I'll have to come back. Thank you. Um, I'll take back the chair from Councillor Dan. So given. Thank you, and I'll go to Councillor Salvador for further questions. Uh, thank you, Councillor Knack. Um, so just generally from a planning perspective, my understanding is that even through zoning bylaw renewal, we're trying to move away from seeing too many DCs. Um, and, and I guess I'm just looking for a little bit of comment on that. Um, I guess seeing something go from a DC to a standard zone, um, I guess from my perspective, is actually a signal that our standard zones are, are flexible enough to, to allow people to avoid going the DC route. That's correct, Councillor. I would also suggest that it's preferable in this case. There's nothing, uh, nothing particularly unique about the size or shape of these lots that would require us to work around um, the existing context in any particular way with the DC. It also will bring it into alignment with the other regulations of the zoning bylaw uh, and allow those to be continually updated through time. Right, okay, and <clears throat> I guess just more generally then, uh, we often hear, and, and we've heard today, a desire for kind of some certainty around that built form um, and that end, end product, uh, but how, how do we walk that line between providing a window of certainty but also still providing uh, enough flexibility so that we see the development we want to see as envisioned by the city plan? I mean, that comes down to essentially trusting in those zones that we're developing. Um, really the certainty is in the box that has been built around them um, and the developers are within their rights to play within those lines, if you will. Um, in, in this case, I think there's a lot of additional flexibility that um, they have that will improve the interface with the neighborhood. So things like having the accesses being moved to the rear side, 
Um, I'm just trying to think the ground oriented units are a huge win. Um, and in addition to that, I think it's it's important to recognize that as we move away from DCs, we are going to have less of that certainty um, as we move forward. And, and that we don't necessarily get to decide what is a good looking product or what color things are gonna be or the specific shapes of those. So just Council, a little bit more hands off. Councilor Salvador, if I just might add, one of the reasons to move away from DCs is that they don't create public trust. They create an expectation of something that doesn't happen in the community over time. And the standard zones can give communities more, um, in my opinion, a greater sense of trust in what could happen in that zone as a result of using that standard zone. I think DCs are used as a tool that don't help us get those policy goals in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for those answers. I appreciate it. And I'll move a second round. Thank you very much. Is there a second? second? Is that you, Councillor Rice, as a seconder? Yeah, Rutherford. Rutherford, sorry, thank you. Uh, uh, please vote on a second round. We are waiting on two votes. Now waiting on one. If Council you are Rice. waiting on me, it's not coming through, and I am... A a yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that is carried. Uh, Councillor Jans, can I hand the chair back to you, please? So, so taken. Thank you. This site would, you know, what I've heard, I've heard mixed uh, as, as you did uh, from the community members. I've heard from some community members who don't want to see any change, but but I also think want it to stay at the current height, not recognizing that even the current zoning allows for greater height than what than what's there. Um, I've heard from some community members who are actually in opposition who who feel like there's been some progress made. And, and I've heard from a number of the tenants who feel differently. And, and so I guess the first question I have on a planning side is that um, one of the suggestions I've heard from those who, who are interested in the direct control approach is uh, saying this could actually be much higher density. It happens to be a pretty good placement around uh, this park. Uh, so could we do more, but then address some of those specific concerns? And I guess I wanted to get a sense as to um, would, do we think more could actually work here? I think one of the things to consider is that this is a very appropriate zone for this kind of location. Um, the RA7 zone is compatible with the low rises. I don't know that we need to be in a situation where we're trying to force the applicant to put in more units. Um, I, I, I do think that's, that's the applicant's decision to make. Maybe to expand on that, um, part of, I think, where that thinking comes in is that appreciating that under standard zone, we really don't have any conversation around affordability, and and we've heard the applicants say, if we could do a standard zone, they'll, they'll hopefully be close in price point, which I know isn't something we can necessarily consider, but it was raised by one of the speakers today, so I feel it's fair to ask. So their thinking was, if you allow for a direct control zone to do more, um, you offset maybe the costs that you might incur in the direct control zone by offsetting that of, of additional units and more count. And so, um, so recognizing I can't focus so much on the affordability piece, I do want to ask around from a land use piece, is, is this a site under the city plan that we would look to do more than, than four stories? If in an ideal world, the applicant can apply for whatever they want, but. No. Oh, I think I've lost Sorry. you there. Uh, no, this would be appropriate as a four-story or as a low-rise apartment. Um, again, we're we're off. We're not directly on the corridor, the secondary corridor in the node, and because we're more interior to the neighborhood, um, we typically see up to low-rise apartments in those areas. Um, I wouldn't say that this is somewhere where we would be um, looking to push for more, or anticipating more um, mm -hmm. than what's being offered. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, and I'll, I'm going to go back and forth in my mind quite a bit over the next two minutes here. Uh, if you were, if this were to be uh, suggested for direct control, 
can things like the heritage consideration be, be would that would that be something that could be included as part of that conversation? It certainly could be. Okay, that's 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 valid. Um, again, particular type of uh, price cannot be, but uh, but sort of the broader community benefits, it would be a valid consideration as part of that uh, of a direct control zone. Councillor, uh, just to add and uh, answer the question, like the the idea of a direct control or allowing a, or forcing a direct control here, like there, it's still the applicant's application. Obviously, of there's course. the council on that one. Uh, so the affordability question or the community amenity uh, contribution question, we have to remember that we're starting at a zone that's already a three-story uh, multi-unit apartment. Uh, so there probably isn't a whole lot of uplift there. On the affordability side, we have. Or right now, uh, we don't have an affordability housing policy that we would include in uh, direct controls because that policy was repealed last year. Uh, yep. So it would have to be a custom one. Um, so there, there is availability to, to consider those. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it is the applicant's uh, application to bring back. And, and so if you are considering uh, a referral for a direct control, I would suggest that it is very specific for a very specific reason. Yeah, and I, I'd want to make sure we give an app, the applicant an opportunity to speak to that soon. <sighs> okay, um, I think those are all my questions for administration, so I can take the chair back. I'm just going to assume it is there. To Still given, yep. Thank Do you. I have to do I have to okay. actually give it back, or can you just take it? I don't know, but I, I just feel like it's rude to not be given it back. Uh, all right, well, so, all, all yours, all yours. Thank you. Um, but hang tight, because we are at the point now where we're going to be calling for questions of our uh, speakers, and I actually do have questions uh, uh, for our speakers and as a part of new information. So can I turn the chair back to you, Councillor Jones? Yeah, got it. Yeah, Mr. Dunn, I, I just I do want to ask because I, I feel I, I owe it to the residents who who particularly the tenants who are feeling a little bit different. Um, and you know, I think their their desire would be to have this sent back as a direct control zone uh, with with a desire to allow potentially for even more than what you're doing, but to help provide some of those guarantees that they seek. And um, you know, I'm willing to potentially consider that, but I, I frankly want to, I'm sure the answer, if you don't want to, but what would your thoughts be on something like that? Uh, thanks for the question, Councilor Mack. I think one of the exercises we always run when we purchase a property is what do we think we would ultimately build there that would be affordable? I think in today's economic times, it's very clear that $1,500, $1,600, $1,700, $1,800 a month rent is not feasible. Uh, Regencies have never really done that before, actually. Uh, we've always been below market average rents with our product because we take into consideration what we think the market will absorb. Uh, in this case, it's it's pretty clear for us that a, when you jump to a five or a six story wood frame, for example, the costs go up 30%. So for the extra units, um, the risk I would be taking is not worth that additional risk in any sense or form for us. That's why we didn't decide to do anything more. Uh, we're not asking for anything more. Um, I think this was really just an exercise of modernizing in very old DC2, which clearly didn't work for the developer at the time. Otherwise, one would assume they would have never sold that site and would have built since 1992 to 2016. You, you would assume they would have done something with it. Um, so when we purchased it, that's that's always been the intent of, um, we tried to make it work within the confines of the existing DC2, but there's just too much there from 1993. It just doesn't work. Parking being one of them, the requirement for underground parking, uh, which would add $50,000 per stall to the cost of the project, I, I think. I think city administrations kind of outlaid that in the past. Um, so that's really why we're focused on this specific zoning here is because within the confines of, of the rules, we can build something that's below market average rents that will will be absorbed. Ultimately, the top end of the market, you know, the, the market has to accept 
the high end, you know, sometimes the conversation comes, well, developers can charge whatever rent they want. Well, that's not the case because we're held accountable uh, to our lenders, to our, our, our partners, to, uh, to a large group of stakeholders. We're accountable to ensure we can rent the product or sell the product. Um, so that's really why we're playing in the confines of this box. So the risk we would take to ask for more units is not worth us taking that risk. Hence, we would not do anything with that. Hence, the reason for the RA7. Um, and just really quickly on the uh, uh, on the one inventory piece, uh, I know uh, Alicia had a comment there, but uh, AHS has a lot of different commentary, and they would beg to differ with the condition of some of these units. Um, so that's kind of where the inventory piece, and then earlier mentioned was the applicant said uh, uh, said no. Uh, the reason we said no is because we have a lot of background information from AHS that justifies that, that there's no way to make these units work to their satisfaction as well. Uh, so there's some additional commentary there. And uh, I'd just like to thank Alicia because I wasn't aware of the history of the site either. Uh, the last correspondent we had, we did get that information from her and we passed on to our architects to see how we could include that um, in the, the upcoming buildings. Uh, this current one was already designed, but uh, we're trying to see what we could do in the future for that. So uh, just three pieces of information that came up. Thank you. And you were touching on a couple of things I was going to ask about anyway, so it was good, good to use that. Um, can you just expand a little bit on that last point? You know, what 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 does that look like when you're trying to incorporate or think about the the heritage aspect of this? Because I I think it was a it's a really fair point to raise, and and I just I don't know what that looks like. You know, without an actual designation and trying to keep it, what does that actually look like from your end? Yeah, to be honest, we're not entirely sure because we're waiting for the outcome of, of when we did ultimately come back to council to see what we could do. But um, I, I think, uh, you know, Alicia provided us a lot of background information, a lot of links to kind of go through and a couple of commentary she's made uh, here today uh, that we can kind of reference uh, the one architect in particular she mentioned. Uh, so I think there's some conversations we can definitely have and and something Regency has done in the past on our projects. Uh, you know, like I said, we do infill projects and we we've always ended up building something that the infill communities are proud to have as part of their community. So uh, that's the best I can promise this guy. I just don't have any more information than what we we got a few weeks ago, so. I understand, thank you. I'm out of time, I'll, I'll take the chair back. And officially then go to Councillor. So I'm gonna assume we have the chair. I'll just go to Councillor Salvador right now. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Neck. Um, yeah, so you, you briefly touched on it, but I wanted to ask a little bit further about the open option parking um, and really how that influences affordability uh, compared to the parking requirements that, that would be necessary under the current zoning. Um, and just as a follow up to that, I mean, I you mentioned $50,000 a stall for underground parking. Um, will this project even be feasible if you had to meet those current parking requirements? Uh, thanks for your question, Councillor Salter. Um, uh, past councils will know this, but parking has always been a uh, number one item and top of the hit list for the 10 rezonings we've done over the past decade. So uh, it was, from a personal note, it was, it was absolutely incredible that the city moved forward with op open option parking. I think it's going to be a game changer. I think it's already started to be a game changer. Um, will I be the guy that does zero stalls? Probably not anytime soon. I don't think the city's ready for that quite yet, except maybe on a TOD. But uh, in terms of this, that's that's really the reason we're here with this RA7 request was one part of modernizing this 1993 DC was that underground parking and uh, stipulation for one and a half stalls per unit kind of thing. Uh, there's no way we could have started. We explored it after we, the referral motion was made and uh, there's just no way for us to do it. Um, and we tried, we talked to the community about it as well. And uh, it's, there's just no way to go about it. So uh, no, the project would not start if we could not modernize um, to what we have. And like I said, we're not ready for zero stalls, but we are proposing 50% um, parking ratio here. So, um, but I, I think it's a game changer for, for what comes down in the future. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I agree that open option was a, a pretty transformative change. Thank you for um, explaining how that influences this project. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I am a little bit intrigued, uh, again, by the historical element that Councillor Knack also was asking questions about. 
uh, specifically the property that is on the the list. So the, the challenge is the list isn't a designation, right? And it really is up to the private property owner, you know, what, if anything, they want to do with it. Uh, however, you know, I think this is something that we've heard loud and clear from residents across the city about their concern about the loss of really significant historical um, properties. Um, would you be willing at all to, to, because administration said you were not interested in a historical designation? Uh, yeah, so uh, um, uh, like I mentioned, Councillor Nack, the reason for that is because we have a lot of background uh, information from AHS. Um, there's a lot of uh, community residents and probably rightfully so who, who notify AHS, some current tenants who notify AHS about the condition of these units. So I know Alicia mentioned perhaps her unit from, uh, from face value doesn't have any issues with it, but uh, we do have a long list of AHS items and, and they're, they're aware of who we are as a developer and the ultimate goal here of redevelopment. So um, we've continued to repair and maintain the best we can to ensure AHS's satisfaction, but by no means does that make it um, uh, acceptable, I guess, in my terms as, as a landlord or a, a citizen of Edmonton. Um, the product is clearly uh, past its useful life um, so that's really the reason for the the hard no. There is is the the funds from that designation would nowhere near accommodate to make it a functional living unit when we're actually having to shut units down um, because of when tenants move out. We can't afford to or there's no way to recoup the investment to to renovate or repair or maintain these units. Uh, so that's that's just kind of where the product is at in its life cycle. And uh, like I said, we purchased these in 2016, 2017. So they were they were kind of whatever was done with them long before we came along. And our intent is always to redevelop. So um, that's that's kind of uh, that's kind of where we're at, and the reason for the note. Okay. And can can you help me understand? Because again, I'm just learning this information today. What is the scope and scale of specifically the site that's on the the designation list? Is it is it a, a large site? Is it, you know, kind of one unit? Like, what are we talking about here? I believe um, this honestly came up a long time ago, but I believe from city administration, maybe they can clarify. I think it was one unit. I don't, I don't think it was a building or anything. I think it was one unit inside a building. It's one building. One, one building? building? Yeah. That's about what size for the building? I, I don't have the square footage. That's off, okay. I'm sorry. Would when you, and then when you were mentioning to Councillor Knack, because I, I again I don't know a lot about the historical significance. It sounds like it might be more interior um, from the architectural interest, but I do know that there's a lot of historical preservation that just saves the facade of the building. In the and it is that kind of what you're thinking. Um, we're definitely going to do some more digging on what that meant. I, I don't believe it was the facade because it's just kind of wood planks from 1960. I think it had a lot more to do with internally. And I think there's a way to, um, we are gonna have ground floor uh, seating areas with trellises, with benches, with uh, you know landscaped areas on these lots. Um, so that sense of community doesn't disappear, which is important to us, and that's how we build our projects. But I think there's a lot of other ways to honor the history of the architects who are involved in the site by, by you know, dedicated trellises or, or more history, um, making it known what was here before. Uh, and that's stuff we've done in the past as well. So um, I, 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 I would be surprised if it had anything to do with the facade because they're just wooden blanks that were painted. So <laughs> there's no bricks or anything here that I think we could yeah but so what i'm hearing um and helps ease some of my concerns is there is intention in some capacity to honor the history that you we've learned about today and and just recently yeah uh, um yeah like i said we didn't know about it and um now we do and 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 i'm not going to ignore that okay perfect thank you so much Thank you very much. Uh, those are all the questions as part of new information. And uh, this would be the time if somebody is willing to put forward a motion to close the public hearing. 
I'll move closure of public hearing. Second. And so, so you seconded by Councilor Rutherford. Sorry. Tang. Tang. Sorry, I thought I saw moving. <laughs> I don't have all the screens up. So sorry, I just saw moving lips from one side. Anyways, uh, please vote on closure of the public hearing. We're waiting on one vote. Jan's in favor. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. That is carried. And I'll move first reading of Charter Bylaw 19831. Second. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Um, I'm going to request to speak. And if Councillor Jans is available to take the chair. So taken. Thank you. This is a weird day for me. Um, I didn't represent this area when it was first referred back as part of the ward boundary changes. I, I came to now serve this area. Um, uh, when I supported referral last time, it was because I, I truly did feel that we hadn't done enough engagement with a community that is extremely well known for how much they embrace change. Uh, you know, the the, uh, the homes beside the church, the road housing developments that accepted many newcomer families. Um, this is a community that has been a, a, a yes in my backyard community uh, every step of the way. But particularly why I supported referral previously is because I, I had heard from a lot of the tenants. I had had the opportunity to knock on a lot of those doors before we discussed it as a council uh, in that sort of transition zone between me not representing it, but looking to represent it. And I heard from a lot of the folks there that they didn't feel like they've been heard. Um, and frankly, they're really worried. And unfortunately, that hasn't changed. I do want to give credit, and I want to really do give credit to Mr. Duna today, that that's, uh, one of the strongest uh, people in opposition has supported it now. Uh, and has come around to that. And so I, I think it is worth acknowledging and I wanna thank the work thank the work of Mr. Duna for engaging some of those community members. But I am really struggling with the, the residents who live in these homes because they are truly affordable. And I know, as we've heard, we can't use a particular price as something to consider in a land use hearing um, but I don't think we can ignore entirely the notion that uh, the individuals who live in these patio homes, if this doesn't get delivered the way it says it is, will not have a home in this community. And I really worry about that. And frankly, I think they're really worried because they haven't been engaged the way they need to. And so I debated putting forward a, a referral motion to do a direct control, but I, you know, I, I've heard that Frankly, the you know the applicant wants us to vote one way or another, uh, and not not push it again. And I don't get a sense from council that there's an appetite to to push it again. And so, I'm left in this awkward position of of you know from a city plan perspective, of course, but it makes perfect sense. We're talking about one more story on a site that does need to be redeveloped across from school and park site. So. There's no doubt in my mind that from a land use perspective, we should do we should do what's being proposed, if not potentially even more in certain cases. But I cannot forget what I've heard from the, the neighbors. And I'm not talking to the neighbors of the bill, I'm talking the residents living there. And they don't feel supported. They don't feel like they have a clear path to being able to stay in that neighborhood. And I hope my challenge, if this is to get approved, I, I don't think I can support it because of that very legitimate concern they have. But my challenge to you, Mr. Bruno, if this does get approved, is to take that same level of engagement that you took with someone like Crystal, who was a very strong uh, person in opposition, and, and take that level of engagement with the tenants there. They are, they are terrified that they don't have a home. And I, I think we have to be really thoughtful about that because for them, this has been their place to be. So if it passes, please, please 
take the time to do that engagement with them, help them look at the design of some of these homes to think about, can there be a couple like townhouse style developments on the main floor that give a similar look and feel to what they have? Is there a way to help make sure that they still have their needs met? And I do appreciate through some of the question, the, uh, the conversation around the heritage piece. And, and likewise, my challenge is that this is new information. And so if, if one good thing came from the delay, it gave us a chance to learn this. And I know there's costs and I know there's challenges around that, um, but I would implore you that if this were to pass, to be, treat that very seriously as well and find out a way to work with the folks to do that and, and, and turn their minds around the same way you were able to turn Crystal's mind around, turn the minds around of the tenants there who feel like they don't have a place right now. So I can't support it. Um, I think it will get supported from council, but I just, on behalf of those tenants, I, I feel strongly about it. So that's it for me. I don't see anyone else on the board for speaking to it. So, oh, Councillor, uh, I'll take the chair back first. So given. Thank you, and I'll go to Councillor Kat. Well, Councillor Nack, I was gonna like leave your clothes as it was, if you would prefer. No, please go ahead. I, I'm not closing, so I didn't move it. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I want to thank you for your uh, for your words. They're very moving and very honest and very true. I've been in the position uh, as a young young man. Uh, I was evicted twice for because due to demolition, um, and one of the demolitions just put in a parking lot. So I know the feeling. And uh, one of the other demolitions was in a community where uh, there were a lot of uh, creative people, a lot of uh, folks who just uh, um, were sort of banding together in a neighborhood and creating that sense of community. So I understand it completely. Um, but I don't know what the solution here is. And that's the challenge. Um, that a developer could come in uh, already this developer could already go forward with uh, with redevelopment of the area. So what this zoning is doing is really just changing uh, in small in, in small ways the form of that development. So I don't know the solution, Councillor Nack. Uh, I would say if I was speaking directly to another councillor, uh, but uh, but. I also know that uh, it is, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place here, between a community that exists and uh, a reality that exists for them that right now they are currently able to manage. And no matter what we decide today, that reality is going to change because the area will be redeveloped in one way or another. And that's the frustrating part. And all we can do is rely on folks uh, like Mr. Dunna to uh, to engage with community and uh, to be a part of the community in a way that enhances. And I believe that's that's the goal. I think everyone is on the on like has good intentions. But this is a development that I think council is going to be watching extremely closely because it's such an overlap of so many things that we're trying to do and it's pulling and pushing in a lot of different ways and it's extremely complex. So I think we're gonna have our eyes on this one really closely. We're gonna stay uh, in touch with the residents as well. Um, I am going to support this um, because I don't see what non-support will actually do for the community anyway. Uh, so that's where I'm at. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else wishing to speak before I go to Councillor Salvador to see if she has any closing comments? Nobody's on the board, so I can go to Councillor Salvador for any closing comments. Sure. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Um, yeah, so this is definitely, definitely a tough one for the reasons that Councillor Knack and Councillor Paquette outlined. I think what we're really talking about here is is the evolution of a neighborhood. And, and really, if we're getting more granular, the evolution of what multi-unit housing looks like in a neighborhood. I think 
as Councillor Paquette pointed out, there is currently <clears throat> the ability for, for development to go forward on this site. But I think that based on the current parameters that are in place with the DC, it's either not feasible or we'd actually see a product that has higher costs and higher rents associated with it in order to overcome some of those barriers. And I'll point to, to the parking requirements, just as an example. You know, if, if the current developer was required to go forward with $50,000 per stalls just to meet those, uh, those requirements as outlined by the DC, uh, unfortunately, I think we'd see those costs passed down. So being able to move from a DC to a standard zone, I think reduces some of those additional burdensome costs on the project. I think that moving to a standard zone also has the opportunity to actually enhance the quality of the, the end product that we see. We heard about how this zone actually would um, enhance the public realm, have some more um, sort of interface uh, and, and activation at the main floor, which could result in some more you know, social spaces, places for connecting with neighbors, uh, which I do think is a positive. And then just zooming out a little bit, looking at the location of this site, as Councillor Knack mentioned, from a city plan perspective, absolutely, it, it, it checks a lot of boxes. You know, it's close to a district node, really high degree of walkability, um, close to amenities, close to park space, and really at the center of a neighborhood. So I think that for, for those reasons, I am gonna be supporting this. Um, again, these ones can be really challenging but I think we have to remain focused on uh, what is outlined in the city plan and, and the type of project that we want to see today that's going to stand for decades to come. Um, and, and thinking about, you know, what that transition looks like for existing residents, I, I would go back to what my colleague said around uh, further engagement and further conversation and collaboration with existing tenants uh, to the applicant. I would say that that is definitely, uh, it's sounding like kind of a, strong recommendation from council. Um, and as Councillor Paquette said, we will be watching that closely. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave it there. And uh, like I said, we'll be supporting this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please vote. It's, I'm a yes. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that is carried. And Council Staff. Yep, yeah, I'll move second reading of Charter Bylaw 19831. Second. Second by Councillor Klang. Please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. That is carried. Um, Councillor con Self. Consideration of, <coughs> of third reading for Charter Bylaw 19831. Second. Thank you, Councillor Tang. A second to that. Please vote for consideration. Yes. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. That is carried. Councillor Salvatore. I move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 19831. Second. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Tang. Uh, please vote on third reading. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that is carried. So. If I look at our selection sheet correctly, I think we are at the end of the agenda today, other than uh, putting in a call for notices of motion. Just wait a second to see if anyone has any. Not seeing any, therefore we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>